will need to be. G under the line of sight with a glance on the To push them to not win. The rebuild of our reputation is officially underway and entering its second week. The plans have been laid out, the foundation is taking shape, and in week two, construction of our new identity will begin in earnest. It's March 21st, 2024, and welcome to week two of the North American League season for 2024. I'm Caliber Jacob Anderson, he's Davide Foxe Bucci, and joining us in studio here in Philly, none other than the Golden Voice T2 man himself, Jonah Jays Wills Willinger. It's good to see you, buddy. Great to be here, man. Thank you for the warm welcome. I appreciate it. Obviously, someone's got to keep Laxing's seat warm for him while he's gone. True. I thought we were going to get Jinxie. Uh, that, What's that's going honestly on? on me. I, I'm What's sorry I'm not Jinxie. Oh, sorry. The guy's saving the game. He, he oh. should be here. You're he totally right. should You're be. Right. I mean, hey, we got more space on the couch, and it's even the color of his orc. We could totally just put him right there. Just give him a call. Do you, do you have Jinxie. a number? Just, just hit my line. He does follow the me on Twitter. orange. He actually he followed me on Twitter the before, slide before the he couch. blew up, so I actually I might have a line to him if You're I try. You're in. Yeah. You're already I, in. I might nice be little in. flex. Yeah, we'll have to figure it out. Have you two actually had the chance to meet at any point before this, or, or did you meet for the first time today? No, this was the first time. I mean, I heard him do like a cast before, and I tweeted at him, and I was like, yo, your casting is very good. And uh, oh. I think that, that was the extent of it. That was the extent of it. And then so yeah, today, that's the we only met interaction the first you time. had. Yeah. yeah, that was the only interaction we've ever had. I gave him some props. That was it. I don't even think he liked to tweet either. So, I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I like, like the like, tweet. You know. what the yeah, hell? I think it was, yeah, a couple years ago when I first subbed for the NAL, popped in there. This guy was like, nice work. And I was like, Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. So, good to be here. There you go. Well, good stuff. Now we all have to work together. We're all in the foxhole together at the same time. And speaking of foxhole, Fox, are you ready and excited for week two? How you feeling, dude? I'm pretty excited. I think we got a good set of games. Obviously, we didn't get to see Beast Coast play last week. I'm excited to see how they shape up. And then we got the double header today. I mean, so many great games. Yeah, so we should explain a little bit about what's going on. You may notice that there's a couple logos on this screen that are that were here but are no longer. One of them is Los because we've had a scheduling reshuffle and Los is actually not playing a game today. They will play two games tomorrow. But the other thing is that on Tuesday, it was announced a team is no longer participating in the NAL, which means we had to not only account for those games not being played, but we also needed to make sure that the games from Play Day 1 that we were supposed to play but couldn't happen because of server problems, everything is now all being mixed up. So on your screen, those first four games 
are all the ones that were originally supposed to happen on day three. So those are happening as planned. Those haven't changed. But Beast Coast and Oxygen will be playing one more game at the very end of the day because that is the matchup they were supposed to do on play day one. So everybody else only has the one to worry about, but Beast Coast and Oxygen will be playing two best of ones today. And teams don't really understand how difficult it is to start off the day with a game and then come back after you wind down and play another game at the end of the day. It's a very big thing as a pro player. So to see both these teams that I'm excited to see OHG and Beast Coast ra see how they perform throughout the day. And that, that last game is going to be obviously, in my opinion, the game of the day. Yeah. And I'm really glad we get to see Beast Coast twice, frankly. We didn't get to see them the other day, the only team that we True. haven't seen them play. And this roster that I'm sure we're going to talk a good bit about we get to see him twice. We can actually start to make up our mind about this team a little bit. I'm going to say Luminosity actually had the ability to kick off their season last week, but Beast Coast were not nearly as fortunate. So we'll just jump right into game one. No additional preamble. Let's just give this thing its due diligence because Beast Coast is brand new. None of these guys have played with one another before. Fett is trying to find a way to coax all these four players together into an actual roster, but it looks a lot different from teams of the past because usually Beast Coast, you mentioned it before, the Band of Misfits analogy, I, mm -hmm. I believe is what you said, but they've never had a roster quite like this one. And then Luminosity comes into the picture at the same time. They had a game against Space Station last week. So this game is kind of all over the place. It is all over the place. Both teams, in my opinion, sit in a similar seat where they have to prove themselves. Beast Coast obviously looking like they have the pieces of the puzzle. We're on the flip side of things. LG, they've had a little bit of a season. They only remain two players from the team and they go and opt to get more rookies. And, you know, we didn't see too much of them in their first week. In theory, Beast Coast has the capability to be the better team here. I think their ceiling is extremely high. Yeah. They're unproven. You're combining experience with a rookie who knows what you're going to get? I'm going to say, it's not that the players themselves are unproven, but in this specific yeah, context, correct. they are. So let's dive into Beast Coast, this brand new look BC roster that we are seeing play for the first time. They could not play a game last week because of server problems and the way we rescheduled, but now we see them in the server. Gavini, Gunner, Hot and Cold, and Spirits have all been to their own myriad of lands, but Diffuser is jumping in on this team for the first time, and we really don't know what to expect quite yet. And there's really not that much pressure on Diffuser's shoulders either. Speaking to the players they obviously know he's a good pickup and they want to give him that flexibility and give him that ceiling to grow not only is having a ceiling a comfortable spot to just develop your skills but having the players that he has on his team obviously with the amount of experience the amount of leadership and having great entries to open up the door obviously makes things that much easier the thing with this team is that they have so much experience on an international stage not just a domestic one right true these guys have traveled all over, played all sorts of different regions, but this is what their focus is going to be on. This domestic play, can they get out of this next few weeks and make something happen? Well, let's figure out what the guys had to say about this team forming up for the first time. We had a chance to sit down with Hot and Cold and figure out what the hell this new Beast Coast roster is about to look like. Hello, my name is Matthew Hot and Cold Stevens. I'm a support player for Beast Coast. My older brother, he helped get me into esports in general because we used to watch and play League of Legends. And CS was like my first two games where I like saw what esports could really be. And I feel like uh, my dream of becoming an esports player like grew from that. I honestly think the biggest thing was just finding that right team on Reddit. You know, thankfully I found a team that wanted a grind. I was just like the young, almost 18 year old coming in and they were smarter than me, better than me at the time. So I feel like they really helped me like step up my game. I think our team is kind of like a team of misfits, you know, like we have multiple people that have been dropped off, you know, top rosters. We have uh, someone hasn't played pro league yet, ready to show himself. We all have something to prove. So um, we're all putting in the work, making strats every day. You know, it's not just like one of us is doing it and the rest are kind of chilling. Like we're all putting in the work. Once we get our identity, like just just keep rolling the strats in, you know, getting new looks against teams, like learning how to play other styles. I mean, that'll that'll really help us because the NAL and just uh, all the leagues in general, honestly, they, they all got different teams that play different styles nowadays. There's not just like, you know, one region plays this one style anymore. All, all my teammates, uh, they trust me and I trust them. I think people are gonna be surprised uh, what we have to offer. 
Well, every player on this team has had ample opportunity to get themselves into the server and get ready. Some of them have had a break for the past couple months coming into the stage. But the big thing that we need to note, not a single one of these players on this Beast Coast roster have ever teamed with one another, either in Tier 1 or Tier 2. This seems like a crazy statistical anomaly because among the four experienced players, Gavini, Hot and Cold, Spirits, and Gunner, you would think that at some point they would have crossed paths. I could have sworn, wait a minute, didn't Gunner join Parabellum? That's the Spirits team that he was raised on. Well, it turns out that he was Spirits' replacement on yeah. Parabellum. So they never crossed paths there, just never playing with one another. It's going to hurt your chances. Have you ever heard of the invisible string theory where it's like you pass, you're in passing with people like your soulmate in a way <laughs> until yeah. the right moment where you're meant to be with them? And I think that's the story of this team, right? It's just every single one of those players, like Hot and Cold said, has obviously been on top teams and they want to get back to that position. So now yeah. the invisible strings pulling them all together. Everybody has passed one another like ships in the night as far as NA roster goes, but no longer. The thing is, they all have a ton of land experience. Well, one of them has a ton. A couple others have been to a few. Hot and Cold has been to 13 international land events in his career as a part of Pro League or Majors or SIs. Spirits, Gunner, and Gav have also gone to lands, but you combine all of them together, they've only been to 11. So Hot and Cold's been to more than double the amount of lands as the rest of the guys on his roster. Even though Hot and Cold does have more than double, I mean, just being able to go to a land and being on a team that can make those events gives you untangible qualities that other players from good players to great players it, it makes a huge difference because it shows you how to play in a team how to be able to bounce off of other players and i think that's why it puts a player like diffuser in the perfect spot with all of these players with that experience actually speaking of diffuser if he's the rookie the one guy who we're going to be looking at the most because he has the most to prove because we just don't know who he is yet how important is it to bring a guy like him onto the team because He's in your wheelhouse. You cast him before. Exactly. I got to see him play in Element 2, and he and his team, Envy, went on an absolutely incredible one run undefeated the entire time. Only dropped two maps in the playoff bracket on the way to the victory. Wow. That's something that doesn't happen often, even in T2, where you do have this imbalance. The craziest thing is that among that pretty stacked roster of Envy, that included Fens, Kiru, Jibo, and Kobe, players that most people may not have heard of if you're only following T1. Yeah. He was actually the fourth rated player on that roster coming out. Oh, he wasn't even the top guy. Wasn't even the top guy. And that, you may think, what the heck is he doing here in T1? He was able to set himself apart by not just his ability to get kills and look impressive. He was consistent. He was reliable. And when it came to tryouts, he caught a lot of attention. Obviously, they picked him up specifically for the role that he plays. He's being put on this flex lurk role where he has a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility. And I think that's going to give him, like we said before, that little extra bit of room, wiggle room to develop as a player. Well, let's talk about their opponents real quick, because again, another set of guys that you specifically have casted before is this Luminosity core. Three of these guys were together on the old LG back when they played in Tier 2, and everyone else is somebody you've crossed paths with at some point. Yeah, I, I, I love it. Seeing all these guys make that leap. You have Eddie, Silent, and Kickstrow. Three people that I've been following since their time under the Wichita Wolves banner. Oh my God, NACL, dude. Wow. early, I think, what, 2022, 2021. Remember those really hype roster videos? Oh, for they were great. Then? They yeah. did such a good job with that. But the crazy part was these three, they had exceptional finishes in NACL at the time, three stages in a row. That entire year they dominated. It was a first place finish as the Wolves and then back to back second place finishes under the Luminosity banner. And they show a lot of promise. And my biggest fear when it comes to Luminosity is because they are all so new, they don't necessarily have a storied veteran on the team. It leaves a lot of error, it leaves a lot of area for mistakes late, mid to late round. And I think that's where we saw a lot of that happen in the SSG game is obviously when push came to shove, SSG always had an answer. They always had a response and Luminosity just wasn't in the right spot to respond back. Let's talk more about that Space Station game just in detail. It was a 3-3 first half, but then they shift sides and they can't win any attacks, which might be a clubhouse specific thing. It might be a new team figuring everything out for the most part. But some of the guys on this team, at least to you, Fox, seem like they still have some good redeemable qualities and potential for what they could do in the future. Absolutely. I mean, every player on the team was putting up some generally good statistics when it came to their game against SSG. It wasn't necessarily a statistical issue on where they weren't able to perform. Obviously, we pulled up Silent Wi-Fi and Hat specifically, 
everybody on the team was within a one kill or two kill difference from each other. And it shows that they're obviously able to put the statistics up. When it comes to a 1v1, more often than not, they're able to handle their own, especially against a team like SSG. They were putting up a fight. But when it came to the late round, SSG knew exactly what they needed to do. They waited, they bide their time. And in the last 30 seconds, nobody stepped up from Luminosity to be able to make that final call, the final decision and say, hey, this is what we need to do. And that's what scares me with Luminosity is nobody has that capability right now from calling. Someone needs to come out of the fire. They and might eventually, up. but right now, maybe not so much. Exactly. But that's the thing with a map like Clubhouse is that on the defensive side where they perform just fine, you can have a lot of your imperfections kind of tucked behind the curtain and hidden away. When you switch over to the attack, that's when you get exposed and in a big yeah. way. Mm. Luminosity did that late round inability to be flexible, got exposed. SSG were put together on defense and Luminosity struggled to play as a strong unit. They were getting a little bit fragmented, pushing in one by one, something that they're gonna have to avoid if they go to a map like that again. Which again, might be a new player problem, could be a, a rookie problem, could just be the way that this team functions. We will figure that out over time. But we're going back to Clubhouse mm. again. So Beast Coast with this team, never played a map before. We're getting a grand introduction to what this five stack looks like. But for LG, they had the option to do bank or club at the very end. They go for club. What do we think? It's a scary position if you're LG because Beast Coast has no information on them yet and you've already played Clubhouse and you didn't look too hot on it. So obviously that screams to me like, hey, we went back in the footage. We were able to adapt and work on things, make things easier. But Beast Coast has no information on them. They're completely in the driver's seat for this game. And obviously we talked a lot of negatives about Luminosity, but I really do think there is a little bit of limelight. And I think if there's an area where they can show it, it'll be against a new team like Beast Coast as well. All right, well, let's get predictions done here. Uh, obviously neither Lax or Jesse is with us right now. So Fox, you can still do your pick. What do you think? I'm going to put my faith in the Beast Coast right now. Uh, right now? Yeah, right now I'm going to put my faith in it. They obviously played it today. So depending on how they perform today will affect my prediction at the end of the day. All right, sounds so good. The Beast Coast. You got the Beast Coast. We're locking that in. But Jonah, here's the thing. Yeah. We, on short notice, we couldn't include <laughs> you in the grand prediction competition for You're the North American title. You're telling me I can't just title. run out of here with the, with the I, belt? I mean, if you did, I'd have to chase you down legally fair, because fair. that thing is the property of, of the body studio. Slam. Nice. It's the WWE. He nice. body slam you <laughs> on that. <laughs> He'd pick you up. But here's the thing. You are the representative for Laxing's picks this week. Yes, I am. No matter what happens, you do, all you have to do is just say what he said, and if it's wrong, it doesn't rub off on you in a bad way. It's, it's a great system. He's got a pick. I'll tell you that pick, and in this case, it's Beast Coast. That's fair enough to say. There you go. Don't think that's too much of a surprise. But listen, if he's wrong, we can make fun of him after this. <laughs> I have no problem with that. And if he's right, I'll say I agreed with him. It's perfect. Yep. There's no way in which you lose in this scenario. It's really it's win -win. Win -win. It, it, it totally works out. All right. It's about time we finally see what this new Beast Coast roster can do in the NAL with a team that has never played before. Beast Coast and Luminosity, week two of the 2024 season starts right now. Well, thank you so very much. I'm excited to get into this. And you and I are actually making our NAL debut because last week the matches ended up being postponed. So you and I get our first look at some of these newer teams and we get to start off with two basically brand new teams. Well, as the screen says, it's just a best of one. We've got five matches for you today, starting off with Beast Coast, and we'll be ending the day with Beast Coast as well. They'll be playing up against OXG because it was a rescheduled match. For those that haven't followed along, one of the 10 teams in the North American League has effectively been disqualified. So as such, they're not around anymore, meaning there are only nine teams, and because of that, there will only be four matches a day. So the reason why there's five matches is because some of those games that were played last Thursday that weren't able to go through have now been moved over. Operator bands are coming in, Nick. And you can see on your screen, Ying has been an almost constant ban at the top level for about a year now. It's not really all that surprising. Uh, I, 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 I was gonna say, it's, and three times so far through the matches, now a fourth to be added to it as well. No longer available. Well, 
default first bomb site that they'll go to is down below, Nick. This is relatively common. On a map like Clubhouse, you've got four bomb sites that are all decently viable, though the bar stage part of the map typically sees the lowest amount of play. I have a green part. I was gone for a second. I missed you. I Thank missed you, you for taking over, taking full control here. You said operator bans, so let's talk about it, right? Okay. Power yeah. operators. Go, go in. Go off. I'm going to go in here. Tuparu and, or Tuparau rather, and Maverick Band here, it's gonna be a lot easier now, but also hard at the same time to pitch up these walls. Normally, when, uh, you know, when Tuparau is open, you're gonna stop bringing out the Maverick. With both these operators being gone, I'm gonna go back to more old school style of Siege. We could see some bandit tricking, we could see those speed jammers be coming out, but uh, the big, I think, play here for the attacker is gonna be the Ying. Ying is such a strong operator to like make things easy when you're LG, when you're less experienced roster, not having someone like Ying available that simplifies the attack and rounds, that's gonna make it difficult. And I think LG, they will live or they will die on the attack inside, and that's what they're gonna start. Oh, that's very poor timing for hot and cold Oof. as a Valcam gets thrown outside. Only 10 seconds until the Valcam disconnects, meaning that you have a very small window to use that information. But you can't really hop on the cam if there's a logic bomb, and that's exactly what Wi-Fi does. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but it costs a valuable piece of utility for the Valkyrie of Hot. The Valkyrie mounts out of course, and last for 10 seconds anyway. Opening kill, though, goes for LG side with a trade back. Oh, instant there from East Coast. This is a lot of fighting going on very early on, and I guess if you're a defending team, you want to try to bring the heat to them as quickly as possible. It ends up with a 2v2 with a minute off of the board. <laughs> very early action. That is an insane thing to say out loud. Eddie and Silent will remain for Luminosity. As for Beast Coast, it's up to Gunner and Spirits. And Silent is very close to being able to strike into the site. I don't know if maybe he had some issues there with the soft destruction, but it sure appeared like he had one of the defenders locked down early on. Gunner dies, it's all up to Spirits, who's now gonna rotate all the way upstairs. Main floor towards the bomb site. Silent and Eddie have full control. Eddie with diffuser in hand. As now Spirits goes over towards Kitchen to open up a sight line. But Eddie is successful in getting the diffuser planted. Dies to Spirits, as that's some nice hatch play. Leaving it all up to the Finca of Silent, who still has some utility, by the way. One grenade in pocket as well as an Adrenal Surge. Spirits retake will happen through Moto. He's got the, not a rotate hole, but at least an opportunity to see over towards Blue. Silent is gonna sit there and not move a muscle. Just on the other side of the wall, looking over towards Dummies. Spirits will fire away, giving his position, but Silent will be holding this door angle and Silent decides to engage. He's good for it. LMG's got a buff at the start of year nine. They're not as good as they were a couple years ago, but they're better than where they were, especially if you pair them with Adrenal Surge. Nice to see LMG's make a return at the pro level. Luminosity takes the first round off of that very early set of skirmishing. I do think that the uh, thing LMG has a fear factor to it as well, because if you're a defending player back when LMGs were terrorizing the scene, it just, you hear that LMG start firing, you're oh my god, it's happening again. It feels so hard to win gunfights against the thing LMG, especially if you like mute SMG11 or smoke SMG11, where you only have 17 bullets yourself. But that round that we just witnessed, there were no layers from the defense of Beast Coast. They were happy to meet the attackers on the roam, fighting early in the round. And this is not the typical clubhouse style that we see from tier one Rainbow Six Siege. Normally you see defenders early roam, kill a couple of drones, fall back, play out the bomb set itself. Beast Coast, a little bit too eager to get into the action thinking, hey, we can just out-duel LG one-to-one -one in gunplay, in player experience. And of course, in that previous round, they got heavily punished from that. And they're gonna go straight back to basement again. Very big indicator here that they deem that they did things that were silly last round that shouldn't really have happened. They're gonna play the same bomb site with basically the same or similar setup and just make those micro decisions a bit differently. Not seek, not seek out those engagements early and try and play a bit more together to save those three. We'll watch the deployment of these Valcams by Hot and Cold with great interest as he was playing over towards Blue. Oh my god, three separate members of LG. Hot and you're about to get pounced upon by Kick's throw, but Hot and Cold shuts him down. Nitro Cell goes out, cannot find a second. But Hot and will get away with one moving over towards Dirt Tunnel. He doesn't really do any serious damage. Besides being dropped in Blue, might be retrievable. Spirit playing from above is 
There goes one of the Goyo canisters from Beast Coast, killing Houghton. Misfortune when it comes to that utility, but Spirits from Above will deal with this Luminosity aggression quite well. Three kills and will immediately head upstairs to further rotate, leaving Eddie to walk in empty-handed. Already better, right? We see the layers now from BC playing more close together, and now LG, they gotta work for this round. He can't just walk in unless Sion finds an angle here. There could be a gap, but no, this time, multiple defenders on side together, shuts it down. Eddie will drop and be... I don't want to say disoriented, but at least nearsighted as he's killed by Gavin inside of blue. Gavin playing in the bomb site, just firing away with P90 originally before unsheathing the SMG 11. East Coast really want early aggression on these downstairs defenses. I gotta say, two rounds in a row where they go all in to try and slow down this entry from Luminosity. It's something that we've actually seen for a couple months of top level play now, Nick. We noted at the six invitational how defender sided this meta was and part of the response seemingly been Defenders teams getting very bomb. aggressive on defense down. very early and trying to basically present these obstacles these speed bumps hurdles whatever you want to call them for the attackers didn't really yeah. work all that well in the first round for beast coast though it was a valiant effort second round looking much better yeah, the simple version of how to explain defense right now often is nothing should be for free for the attackers. They should not be entering the building without being contested, without feeling pressure. And this goes for pretty much every single map. It's not all that common where we see defenders bunker up, just turtling on the bomb side itself. Even on bank, for example, we often see teams play five guys in the basement. Or well, these days, you always have a soft room in open area. When you play clubhouse on basement defenders they start top four and then they fall back in stages so this does just make the attack that much difficult because you still only have three minutes to work with we got so much more map to fight for so attackers naturally the forces speed up mistakes tend to happen a couple of gunfights that go the wrong way maybe you miss your to play in a certain room and then just like that you might lose a member very early in the round for this one though utility play bandit tricking on the primary wall with a mirror window this mirror can get popped, then BC, they're gonna have six impact grenades to use to further deny the wall if Eddie and Thermite wants to try and breach it open, so that's what they're gonna do here. Pop the mirror intentionally, now they can impact trick, and there's bandits pre placed as well. The EMPs will go off just to open things up in the hands of Hat, who's got two remaining in back pocket. There's that hard breach that you've mentioned from before. I know that the site changes have been talked about quite a lot, but I'm just so used to that site in particular only being on the Russian weapons, seeing it on... Yeah. Well, my is very intriguing to say the least. It makes me stop for a second and go, wait a minute, you're not that's one of That's not my... right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not right. It's supposed to be on like Kepkin or Finca or Tachanka, but you can't really get as aggressive, I suppose, when you're defending this cash CCTV site upstairs. Playing it very standard on the side of Beast Coast. Yeah, they've lost that main breach, but Maybe spirits can actually get quite aggressive here. This is an ego challenge if I've ever seen on Gunner, the very first kill. Ooh. Eddie and Kixrow on the board. Kixrow with two, in fact, on a spirits and Gunner before being finished off on his own. It's a 2v3. We're halfway through the round. Okay, well, one thing that will remain a constant through these three rounds, Nick, is that both of these teams are bringing the heat. They are. They really are fighting it. I'm actually surprised that Beast Coast not just letting them play out the rounds in those like 5v5s and 4v4s because look at the player names on the left and right hand side of your screen. You would think Beast Coast which is just that much more experienced, that much better. So when they play those even numbers, they play out the strategies, you'd think they'd be favored here. But in the gunfights, LG, they come out ahead once again, three versus two, but they have spent all their fire and smoke on the Kavitov Wi-Fi. So now they're a bit more limited, but at the same time, with that being said, they have a lot of time to work with. 40 seconds, one man up, etc. Make their way towards Pop Garage, try and establish a plant here. One C4 from Hot and Cold could, of course, take down the first planter, but they have two options here. They have one guy covering main breach, covering both defenders' entry paths towards the bump side, but they have two players who can go for a plant, only one C4 on defense. Fuser losing his reticle now as 15 seconds remain in this round. Bandit pounced upon. Eddie's inside of the site and he picks up two. Hot and cold thought he might survive a little bit longer, but it is all for naught. This has been a back and forth struggle between these two teams. 
Do we see another cache CCTV defense, or do you think they opt for the tertiary bomb site and go across to gym bedroom or even go downstairs to bar and stage? I don't think you go back, frankly. I mean, I think CCTV as a second bomb site is always a bit of a surprise. It, it's such a vulnerable bomb site to just the capital alone. You know, you're always going to take Cal drafters and defense. Enemy brings the capital. You're going to get fired, like fired below your feet. You're going to die. And that's pretty much what happened last round. They bring the capital, they force the gunfights, they play inside of blue, they shut down the, the save attempt from Beast Coast lashing out. And that seems to be the game plan right now. LG will make a move somewhere. Beast Coast will make an aggressive response fighting towards the attackers. LG are holding those angles. It truly comes down to the individual gunfights right now. If Spirits won the gunfight on bottom blue when he swung the doorway, maybe that round plays out differently because then Beast Coast has the man advantage. But because Kicksworth got the double kill, well, LG are favorite then. So it really comes down to which team can play either more together, guarantee that their teammates get traded in those gunfights, so that you never lose a member for nothing, or of course, individual heroics. As I said, I want to see Beast Coast play maybe a little bit slower here. They are the more experienced team. Make LG fight strategically, right? The disc spoke about this as well. LG, they have kind of experience. They don't have a color. They might look very indecisive on the attack and round in the end game stages where they have to make those decisions. They have to problem solve. And so far, Beast Coast, they haven't even let them work for it. They're just throwing bodies at the problem. I wouldn't push that against LG because they can shoot back. It's also worth noting that this is Beast Coast's first official game, right? They won via disqualification yeah. all the way back on the first play day and what was originally a 7-0 victory. I think that's been walked back. I think it's just zero zeros across the board now, unless everybody gets yeah. a 7-0 victory. Oh, and this back. Beast Coast team, as you can see from the left side, is completely assembled of new players. The desk talked about this so well. Well, the couch talked about this, actually. I suppose there's no desk. <laughs> These five players have never competed together. That is astonishing. They're all quite experienced with the exception of diffusers, but you've got to get those game day reps in. Scrims are just ultimately not enough. Beast Coast riding the favorable side of Clubhouse, at least for the time being. We'll wait to see if anything changes with this being a defender-sided meta. It's been months of the defenders being in such a strong position. I don't know if it will. Halfway point now of this round, and the only real action that's happened is between Spirits and Wi-Fi. Everything else has been pretty par for the course. Luminosity going about opening that jacuzzi wall and now staring down the windows, looking into this gym and bedroom bombsite. Yep, more like a proper 5v5, but as I say, that Wi-Fi gets the opening kill on to Gunner, who dies in the middle of the site itself. But yeah, we see LG going through the strategical elements right now. Breaching walls, opening barricades, getting rid of castles, etc. And then... Beast Coast's response has been, let's sit back, make them work for it. I like this change up here. The only issue is, no C4 is below. Hot and Cold and Bandit playing that barbed wire. LG on the windows, ready to go in. I don't know if Beast Coast can shut this down. Oh, the first oh, Eddie, no! He doesn't look down with the vault and gets ensnared in the frost mat. Finished off by Diffuser. Yeah, you can get yourself back up, but not when you've got several sets of eyes looking in your direction. Both teams now trading blows as... Diffuser picks up another from this same spot. Wi-Fi starting to streak for LG as Diffuser looks for a rotate over towards construction. Diffuser, last alive of spirits, has been humbled. And a vault in, a position that Diffuser can capitalize off of. He's just waiting for the play. There's the vault in, very limited HP on Wi-Fi. Diffuser looking for more as Silent secures the kill on the spirits and Diffuser will play keep away. Waiting for Silent to get close to him. No diffuser in hand for Luminosity. They pick it up at the last second, but it'll be a little bit too late. As Diffuser walks in, Silent might be able to get this one down. Oh. And Diffuser hops on the Diffuser for the counter disable. And Beast Coast will tie the game. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but if that Frostmat doesn't find the injure on the initial entry there, that entire round might be a W for the attack inside because they have to cover. When you have two players on the gym window, one's going to jump in, one's going to hold the cross. If that first member dies, especially in a silly way like a frost mat, well, now the cover has to jump in and become the planter, and then the cover is no longer there, essentially. So 
very small things here going sideways. I like the setup. They recognized, hey, there's no C4 below. Hey, we got an opening pick onto Gunner. He's not going to hold this side. They found the gap successfully. Strategically, a good round for Luminosity. But again, very small details there can really change the outcome of these rounds. East Coast, they tie things up 2-2. They're going to go back to that basement bomb side. Third attempt, one for one so far. And they have a new kind of trick up their sleeve. More of a turtle situation, right? They're playing the Warden, they're playing the Mirror, they're playing Online, a lot of utility. And they're hiding Gunner on the Kaid inside the bomb side. He's hiding behind that Black Spox position. Because if he gets droned out, then the attackers know, hey, they have a Kaid. We gotta play the Thatcher here because Maverick is banned. We gotta get those hatches opened up. LG, they might not have found Gunner hiding on the Kaid, but they have just stuck the Thatcher from the beginning saying, we know what might be lurking downstairs. We're not going to risk not having the option to open up those hatches. So they will, again, strategically make a good call here. Bring the Thatcher regardless. Attack every pick the Monty. So that's probably going to be their win condition here. Monty can push third tunnel. He can push blue. Can push down bottom main stairs. A lot of options for the attack. Not sure if this holds true with every single region up to this point, but the shield rework, I'm not entirely sold on it being a benefit to operators like Monty, especially if they can't get extended. Monty seems to have far less of a threat behind him, I suppose yeah. you could say. You and I obviously didn't cast the NAL. We've seen Monty in a bunch of other regions, but when we did watch Brazil, I, I don't really think the Monty was anywhere near as potent as it used to be, especially in Brazil, the region where they love their shield operators and most of the top teams have somebody who is quite talented when it comes to playing on those shields. NA is no slouch when it comes to shields as well. Lately, it's oh. been forest on the Blitz and the Monty leading the way for Space Station. Now, all this to be said, we're at the halfway point of the round. And Luminosity has cleared out that main floor very click quickly. This is the third defense of the bottom floor bomb site for Beast Coast. And the first time that they are all relatively safe sitting in or near the bomb site. No offsite play for Beast Coast as was characterized or as the first two rounds were characterized. The big question here is, where is AD going to go? He's outside dirt right now. Grim on the blue hatch can fake out the bees, get some pressure. Munchie should be the driving force for this execute. He's got the fuser and of course, extend the shield. You can walk in anywhere that you see fits. So Eddie has to make a decision now. There it is, dirt tunnel, yellow ping is coming out. But what can they do about this? No grenades, no capital fire. So while they have information on the player positions, they can't necessarily clear them out. It looks like a blue take here, but Munchie and dirt, we see Wife on the blue hatch, silent down inside the oil pit. They might just try and go for an execute here with those yellow, those yellow pings. They're just waiting to dig in around blue and it will come down to what I assume will be a messy brawl. What? The diffuser looks the wrong way. Monty of Eddie being accompanied by Kixrow through dirt. Luminosity absolutely clobbering Beast Coast right now. Hot and Cold and Gunner will attempt to retake. A nice shot by Hot and Cold. He's only good enough for one. His Wi-Fi goes huge in the dying moments. And Luminosity wins yet another round. This first half, incredibly close so far between these teams. I think you can tell that Beast Coast, they, uh, they definitely are trying to figure out like, their pace right now, whether to go fast or to go slow. The first couple rounds, you know, as you mentioned, they play super aggressive fighting. You know, I would say too much. They're fighting constantly and willingly. Then, now they're playing too passive. They're giving up so much space to the attackers. They're not upstairs in bar and garage killing the couple of drones in the beginning of the round. They see Monty dirt, they let him be. And then they just let the attackers kind of walk over them. They walk in dirt, they find the first injured, they walk in blue, they win the gunfights. Beast Coast are now willingly giving up so much space. So it seems like an all or nothing style approach. And this commonly is an issue when it comes to, they're just a new team. They're trying to figure out how to approach this. You know, when you haven't played together, you know, with any of these players before, there's a lot of benefits because there's no bias. There's no predetermined, oh, I know this guy, we're good buddies, so he's going to back me up on my opinions. But at the same time, you also do not have any synergy. So you really got to figure out what your play style is going to be, which players are good at what different things, and what operators all the players should be playing, what positions, etc. So I like the Beast Coast have been to experiment here. They've gone basement four times. And they're gonna have a different approach 
all of those four times. Now they're playing more dynamic setup, right? This is pretty much like the old quote-unquote ASUS G basement room, where you play mostly Mute and Cast. I mean, this is basically straight out of Hot and Cold's playbook from his previous team saying, guys, I know how to play this round, just listen to my callouts and like reinforce these walls, etc. And Hot and Cold will play in the middle. They'll play in the bar, the most pressured position here, and where you got, you're gonna hold this bar hatch for the fallback for your teammates and yourself, and you got Spirits and Gavin upstairs roaming top floor. I don't know if Diffuser's been spotted over by Lounge or not. The player Diffuser, by the way, instead of the actual <laughs> Diffuser. Oh, boy. I feel like you and I actually talked about this with the Ace, the Operator, mm -hmm. just last week. And now here we are yet again talking about how there's a player named after something similar to the game itself. Loading mag. <laughs> It will confuse me. I'm saying yeah. it will confuse other people. I, I take back what I said about the Monty, by the way. The shield play walking through Dirt Tunnel was a huge component of how Luminosity was able to do so much work onto this bomb site. But how do you approach it here? It's hot and cold, has nestled himself right around bar, looking towards kitchen. He's got that kill hole in the wall. He'll be joined by Diffuser now, who drops. He gets picked off immediately by stage. My, my, that's not the start that they wanted for Beast Coast. They're doing a limited kitchen dirt take. All you take here on attack is you take office top floor control so there's no verticality in kitchen. You take kitchen itself and you go dirt. This is a pre like pretty basic uh, like rank strat for this map in particular. So Eddie can walk into the site, he finds the information, they have kitchen etc. That's it, Spirit's gotta hold the sign, but he does so successfully. Eddie doesn't bother to look over towards dummy, silent now in. I nails his shots onto both Spirits and Gunner. Another 2v2. This seems to be the story of this entire matchup is that we are perpetually in 2v2s, though the clock at the moment favors Beast Coast more than in previous rounds. Only 40 seconds left to go. Silent itching for yet another, but he'll be nearsighted in blue before escaping back over. Hot and cold punishing him, and Gavin shuts Wi-Fi down. And we are no closer to a resolution through this first half. Both teams showing promise, both teams showing struggles, and we'll see what happens now as Beast Coast will move to attack and Luminosity will try to tackle defense. I mean, I think Eddie might have made a bit of a slip up there in that previous round. The whole point of that strat is that you'll take Kitchen, you'll open up the floor, and maybe open the hatch. Monty goes in dirt, walks into side. The only player or place rather a player could be on is third box by blue or maybe in the the bottom main staircase hallway that's really the only two options because when you open the kitchen floor you cannot be in the back of the b bomb site eddie walks in doesn't check the blue angle dies as monty right shouldn't really happen he should walk in stop planting the guy in dirt covers blue the guy in the kitchen covers the rest of verticality that should really be the strategic approach there instead eddie gets blindsided gets shot from the side of the back gets shut down, and then they try and pick up the pieces there of Forest Beast Ghost. Again, they had a good read on what they had to do in that strat, where their player positions were the most important, and they find the victory. But I think if you're LG, you're perfectly happy to 3-3 half on Clubhouse on attack. And now the question is, can they defend in a similar way? Because the teamwork that we saw from LG was quite good. They're playing together, they're going for trades, they always have two people or three working together for an objective. And that's the same kind of style we expect to see on defense. We help one another, accomplish these small mini executes, and then try and play together. Beast Ghost, they gotta have more coordination on attack, because if you get picked off in these individual gunfights with nobody trading you back, you will fall on the attack inside. You don't have the map control to work with, you don't have the defensive setup, so now you gotta play offense, but you gotta do it together. Kickstar getting a lot of information as the Solus now roams upstairs. We'll see a duel between spirits on Deimos and whichever operator he finds canceled the current duel. Kickstar still just dealing with those drones as they come his way inside a construction, banded it off. There's no Kaid ban. So the fact that we're seeing teams prioritize bandit isn't a surprise, but certainly is not as usual. Kaid is typically the operator that you'll see to handle these. I imagine that because of the different areas that need to be covered, having four bandit batteries to do it is quite nice. East Coast, after taking about a minute off of the clock, will have to deal with those bandit batteries, but have managed to work their way into the other side of the top floor, breaking through Jacuzzi Wall. 
And one of the issues with playing Kaid is that if the enemy brings up the Thatcher, well, one EMP, Kaid clock gets disabled, wall gets opened up. You can't really trick without the two brow when it comes to Kaid. Once Bandit, you can. And also, as you mentioned, there are small walls to cover. Those four Bandit batteries can just net you more shutdown construction on the exterior, on the interior, and of course, CC wall. And you have impact tricks. Four impacts in pocket. None being tossed out though, wall will get opened up here, hot and cold uh, gets the job done for free. So Beast goes in a really good pace right now, a full minute to work with, ton of utility, Grim Beast, the demo scans, grenades, smoke grenades, etc. You're looking like you're in prime position to take this bomb site. Gunner might be the one to lead the charge, Wi-Fi is down as that's a kill for the Grim. Still three canisters containing those bees to find out where the defenders on Luminosity sit and put them into uncomfortable positions. A duel could still be had by spirits. As there goes, well, it looked for a second that death mark would go out. The death tracker will find the soulless. So kicks That's roll smart. and spirits will now be in a dance to the death. Hot and cold getting the diffuser down. And right now there's no real challenge for it. It's successful and he peels off. As kicks has been dropped, Eddie and Hat are the last two standing for luminosity. The only two with a pulse. Down oh, goes diffuser, what? it's a trade. Hat needs to be picked back up. Eddie, jumping on over, might have the time to do it. You have to be very careful though, 25 seconds left before the attackers win. Well, these two players from Luminosity will now work together. Hot and Cold's in a very prime position to deal with this. Down goes Hat to Gunner, and Eddie swings as Hot and Cold pops up from the exterior, outside of the building. He gets a kill on the inside. Beast Coast successful in their very first attack. I gotta say, you know, when new operators come out into Siege Pro Play, I always look at, okay, how can teams utilize these operators to kind of change the game, change the meta, or just do something very unique? In that previous round, it's very simple, but it's highly effective. Damon's playing downstairs in bar double door, and they know when they go for the plant, Solid's gonna try and deny it by walking into stock lounge and impact on either floor. Well, what do you do? You start a duel with the Solus by playing in that same similar position. You can see exactly where Solus is, and the enemy knows that. So Solus plays far back, doesn't go for plant deny because he's probably gonna die trying. So one simple operator here in that previous round, shuts down with a few win conditions, LG had to deny the plant, which was to go below with the Solus information. And it's small things like that that can play a massive role in these rounds. And because Deimos is a new operator to Ember Six Siege, players don't have the exact knowledge of, okay, how is this operator going to be, uh, be played? Unless you played that exact scenario in scrims before, you probably didn't think about it. Because it's a new operator. Beast Ghost, they are flexing their possibilities here. You said that Brazil, they, had good, uh, they have good shield play, and they have a couple players as well. Spirits, complete menace on the blitz. Oh, it was a shield though. That was the Monty. He probably would have been fine regardless, but very close bumping attempt there from Silent. But Spirits was a phenomenal blitz player throughout his career so far. Monty, he can play it, it's not what he's known for, but Monty with the rework works similar to a Blitz now. You can sprint, you can go fast, you can go for those aggressive plays, but you have less passive pressure. You can't go for hip fires. He mainly doesn't injure people, but knocks them down. And look at this, aggression, 3v1. That's oh, free. they time it so well. As the shield come out from Spirits, as Gavin gets the kill on Eddie to start off the show, only 45 seconds into the round. Perfect. It's a good I mean, bit of presence in the Mira as well. No Nitro Cell will be available. The only anti-plant will be there from Kixrow on the mute with the Nitro Cell in pocket. I suppose if you want to call those Goyo canisters anti-plant, then by all means, Kixrow using that Nitro Cell that we just made note of, so not a lot of explosive possibilities. Several oh. players still on this top floor, a very extended roam, and it's working out as Luminosity pick off Hot and Cold. It's a really good isolation under Eddie. The shield goes first, gets the melee, two players gun him down as well. But now Beast goes stalling things Whoa. out here, falling by the wayside. Wi-Fi through the window, gets a second kill in the round. Beast goes, they had that early advantage. Things were looking great, but now they have nowhere to go, it seems. Still got the Monty in. Be your focal point and guide you towards these bomb sites. But what a struggle it's been from Beast Coast to drone out that top floor. Almost seems like Beast Coast are languishing in this part of the map. 
Wants to shut down now on Gavin as Kicks Row ascends blue stairs. Diffuser now nearsighted, tackling main stairs with the Monty of Spirits still up. But as we say time and time again, the fewer opponents, or rather the more opponents and the fewer teammates you have, the less effective a Monty gets unless you're in a 1v1. As the observers are also showing us, the diffuser needs to be retrieved, so that will kill some more time. Excellent rebuff from Luminosity of Beast Coast Entrance. Yeah, I mean, the, the big issue is just that the Monty doesn't see any opponents, right? You find the first player, great, you get the console Eddie, but then Monty is just like on the other side of the map, not where the action is, not where the enemy roamers are either. Now things are falling apart. Two v four on different Beast Coast, but they need to land some great shots here from the diffuser. Diffuser very narrowly missing out on an opportunity. We'll have to confront the Black Mirror as he looks for more and more kills. Completely disoriented. Oh Both boy. remaining players from Beast Coast <laughs> stuck inside of blue being watched as Hat and Wi-Fi get the final two kills. And Luminosity answers back. These teams are so evenly matched so far on this map, Nick. Oh, they are. It is really a back and forth trying to figure out each other's play style. And I will say, for the side of LG, when they recognized Monty was on the board, they spread out a lot. They recognized that Monty cannot be everywhere all at once. So wherever he's going to be attacking from, we're going to look to make plays on the other half of the map. So Monty went towards like that gym bedroom portion. Where did all the kills happen? On the CCTV connector side. So it's almost okay, we don't want to deal with the Monty, great play there. But then I want to see a switch up from Beast Coast, where Spirit says, guys, there's nobody in the bedroom, I need to go somewhere else to help you guys, because the whole point of playing Monty is you can just run through the building. No one can really stop you on the roam. There's no smoke, there's not really C4s, and even the Vries, again, you just kind of bait them out, you go like nice and slow. Spirit has to try and find enemies with intent. It almost looked like he was avoiding enemy confrontation, but all his teammates could find the, the, the fights regardless. Now we see a different kind of shield play. A clash. On Clubhouse, on the upstairs hold of Gym Bedroom. Now, we don't see this all that often, but uh, every single season, Parker, I make a tier list for what I think, you know, the operator's strengths, so like, for ranked and competitive. I have Clash in this kind of, like, sleeper, low-key, really strong operator that no one seems to play. Not in ranked, but in competitive play. But Clash, as you know, and as I know, it's incredibly frustrating to deal with. And one thing about the current attacking lineup for the current meta, nades you can no longer cook, and they're rarely played. Sophia is not like a normal operator in the current meta, neither is Kali. You don't really have uh, counters for the Clash operator in your regular lineup. You have to go like kind of far out of your way to deal with the Clash. So in the current meta, I could really see this operator work out. I want to see how Wi-Fi uses this operator. I want to see how LG does not play around it, because this could be the defining factor for this particular round's outcome. The only real counter directly that they have from Beast Coast would be the nades in pocket. I guess you could also loop the Flores into that conversation with the Rotero drones. However, the timer on the Rotero drone is three seconds. So that's plenty of time for a clash to be able to get out of harm's way. Rotero drones can do a deceptive amount of damage, but East Coast are not going to be using them to antagonize one operator. You're going to be using them to take out gadgets, as you can yeah. see. Huge value to get a deployable shield. Open up some of those soft walls and just kind of go from there. Capitao is an operator who can counter the clash. Same with Nomad. Both of those are relatively meta operators. I don't know maybe about Capitao, though his pick rate has ticked upwards. Obviously, neither of those operators are in play for Beast Coast. So it will be a challenge depending on oh. how late it goes into this round. Right now, Wi-Fi on that clash has spent almost the entirety of live action playing in weight room slash gym. This is so smart. They're blocking the gym window with the clash standing in the middle of the room so Benny can trick the wall. Normally you play castle barricades, they get destroyed and then that you can't trick. They have a, basically a moving castle barricade. Clash is just standing there. It enables Eddie to trick the wall, shuts down hot and cold, and Beast Coast injuries. Now they're gonna problem solve on the fly with 50 seconds left. Again, all because of Clash makes this possible. Spirits looking through that window for one. Hot and cold, the first domino to fall. Silent prepared and ready, good enough for a single kill. Luminosity keeping their numbers advantage for now with 30 seconds left. They'll oh. continue to come to blows as Gavin inside of Logi is making things work. 
But now it's all up to the remaining defenders for Luminosity, of which there is a clash for one. Beast Coast will trickle in, and all of their 1v1 engagements will break in favor of their opponents. Spirits in a 1v3 with the timer, not his friend. A beautiful shot on the hat. The clash. He'll see the clash. It'll be slowed. Damage will go in. What are you gonna do? do? Feed that kill to Eddie, but Spirits is making this work. Excuse me. He's only a single shot away, but the timer runs out. A spirited effort. But Luminosity wins it on time. That was much scarier than it needed to be. It was. That was definitely close. It didn't have to come down to a 1v1. Could have played more far, you know, further back, more safe. Let Clash do the work. But the thing is, when you're Clash 1v1, it's kind of like the Monty. You rarely should lose those, especially if time is so low, which it was heavily favoring the Operator. And I was like, you know what? Clash could single-handedly win the defense the round. It kind of did. Enabled the bandit trick, denied the wall, both exothermic charges basically, or both attempts rather, and wins the 1v1. That right there is why Clash is kind of a sleeper operator and kind of underrated. Can't wait to see that in a ranked game where you just post the Clash up on the gym window. Much more effective than Castle Barricades. Though, I, I mean... If somebody really does want to deny that wall, you need to use two full castle barricades for it. And then yep. obviously it's it's contingent on your opponents not bringing an abundance of explosives. I suppose you could complicate matters by throwing in an ADS or even some Wamai magnets into gym that would keep that second castle barricade safe. That's the one that actually connects the gym to the jacuzzi wall, that one doorway. Yeah, but that's a, that's a heavy investment. That's two of your four castle barricades that are most likely going to get destroyed. I suppose it does eat through the explosive utility brought by the attackers, but it doesn't give you a full operator. Like, at least with Clash, you can be mobile. It's not yeah. just about setting down those castle barricades and forgetting. You can then reposition, as we saw, and it's, it's impossible to argue that that previous round was impacted in a small manner by Clash. Clash was inarguably one of the main reasons why Luminosity was able to win, and even then, Beast Coast kept it close. They're going to call a timeout, and... Hopefully talk through some stuff. First half was 3-3, by the way. Yeah. So Luminosity taking the upper hand on defense. Bodes well for them for the time being. Kind of surprised about the bombs of rotation here from LG. They win CC, then basement, then gym, back to CC. I mean, I, I guess Boris is not that popular, and I get that it's hard in the current meta of things, but I feel like if you want to make things really hard for a team, that is newly established, trying to gel together, which Beast Coast is. Bars are really a hard bumpster to attack when you don't have the experience on it as a squad. LG keep things safe though, they'll go CCTV instead. But again, complications arrive because holding garage control, very difficult for, for most teams because of Grim, because of Capitals. They deal with the rafter, uh, the raft position so effectively. And again, the oh. bandit trick. Hello? It just happens time and time again. I mean, all they did was EMP the wall try to like breach it open and that's it this is really lazy kind of sloppy play trying to play a simplified round against a professional team and here we see eddie finding another okay actually he didn't get that one i thought he was gonna get it but he found like <laughs> half the harpy's utility there is no cell mess left and now with that garage wall being opened up there's no exothermic charges left now the defenders know it's gonna be a garage stick they cannot breach construction because they've been tricked so now LG, they have a big up in this round. They know exactly what the take should be from the attack. Were you, were you gonna keep going there? I was, but then I, I kind of lost it. That's okay. It's been a very scrappy matchup between these two teams. I mean, it stands to reason when you've got newer rosters in play. Nice shot by Silent to kick off first bit of action in round 10. The bees will go up and now hot and cold will charge the stairs and an easy pick for him. Aided by the utility of his teammates. Hot and cold with just a minute to go is steps away from getting into the bomb site. And I just want to take a moment to talk about Houghton, who right now is sitting at nine and seven on Beast Coast. It was a, not necessarily a surprise to everybody, but it was a bit of a shock that hot and cold was let go from SSG. Yeah. He was, in many ways, one of the lower-performing players on the team. To see him come into Beast Coast in a leadership role, inarguably the most experienced player on this squad, doing the thankless job of support work, 
it's nice to see him back luminosity though at the moment they don't need any experience because they've got the gun skill to back up their statements they sweep through the beast coast execute and suddenly it's match point for lg <laughs> out of nowhere i mean Bit of an upset, one could almost say here. Kind of beating expectations. I was thinking, you know, I saw Clubhouse was going to be the map play here. I'm thinking this is going to test your teamwork, your coordination, your fundamentals, your like the small adaptations on a round to round basis, like what operators you're going to be playing. And I was expecting completely that Beast Coast was going to be the team kind of leading the charge in all those areas. But it's not. It's LG playing the Creative Clash. It's LG with a different problem set rotation. It's LG bandit tricking Beast Coast in two rounds now. So this is what I expected, but it's flipped. LG are making Beast Coast really fight on the problem solving, really work on their, okay, this wall didn't get opened up. What can we do in instead situation? And they're winning rounds because of it. Beast Coast only trick up their sleeve on the attack and half so far. Okay, they did a great demos earlier, but that was a single round. Besides that, Spirit's been trying to force them on team, and it has not really had the success that we expected. Yeah, they got the opening kill last time they tried, but that was really it. So, if anything, we gotta see Spirits individually step up, play in the right positions here on the Monty, get full value, but also Beast Coast as a team, recognize that you have a Monty on your team, let him go in first. Don't send in Gunner with Buck, who's going to eat a bullet to his face in a single gunfight, when you can send in Spirits to find the player positions, kind of bully the defenders a bit, and make them feel pressured, and you send Gunner behind the Monty to assist him to get the kill. Gunner's going to drop the office hatch, they have those pre-placed drones, they know top 4 in that part of the map is indeed clear, and Diffuser will open up dirt. So right now, it's a pretty classic round, but at the same time, LG are not roaming. They're not fighting for map control right now. It should be free for the take-in for Beast Coast, and it is. So this angle Gunner's playing right now. Open through that hatch, look and see if anybody's roaming. Knock, knock. Maybe they catch you by surprise. Beast Coast has certainly been surprised by Luminosity through the entirety of this match, going all the way back to when Beast Coast started on defense. We saw on the defender side through those first two rounds, how active Beast Coast were. Now on attack, they're running up against a Luminosity team that is quite disciplined thus far on defense. Electric Claw will fail though from Wi-Fi as he now heads back over to church and will instead use that utility to keep those three panels safe. Halfway point of what could be the final round with Luminosity looking much more poised on defense than East Coast looked on defense and Luminosity looked on attack. Let's see though. Problem solving, the pressure's at its highest. You're down on match point. One small step up and Beast Coast might lose this entire match. And of course, we gotta look at Spirits. Again, I keep saying it, the Mun team. That's the win condition. That's the opera that can make things happen. There's no Capital, there's no Grim, there's none of those power operators. It's just Heartbreach and Mun T and five guns on the attack. And LG is smart. They're playing the numbers. They want the 5v5, they want the equal numbers. They believe in the bomb site setup. They got church reinforced. It's kite trick by Wi-Fi. They cannot get through that on the attack inside. They got mirror windows and blue, etc. It's not gonna be easy for Beast Ghost, but here they go. Spirits is already in. Fuser attempted with 40 seconds left, and it's nobody really easy. seems to be watching. Hat will encroach upon his position, but Gunner's got oh. the wrong angle. Not before Hat can secure the kill. LG are destroying Beast Coast right now. Diffuser from above doing some serious damage. Kills Hat, but he loses Gavin by his side, meaning it's all up to Diffuser as he drops in the middle of the bomb site. He'll be nearsighted. Hat types, you guys aren't SSG. Stop copying. My goodness, the disrespect. Just to add a little bit of spice to what will be the final round. Luminosity, well practiced on defense. A far more comfortable team on Clubhouse, and they walk away with a win. <laughs> no, that'd be crazy. I love the fact that LG had happy to say it because it's kind of true, right? The identity of Beast Coast and all these those rounds looked like, you know, a budget SSG essentially. They didn't have their own identity in those rounds, and I feel like it kind of showed they didn't look all that comfortable. LG for this matchup, definitely the better team. Oh, absolutely. That was Beast Coast's debut in the North American League because they did not ultimately play last week. And I mean, it's a rough debut for them. LG did fall 
to SSG back in the initial play day. So it hasn't been a perfect run for LG, but today they did outclass Beast Coast. And as was talked about on the pre-show, this is an entirely new roster for Beast Coast of players that have no history with each other. It's very challenging to get up to speed quickly. There's only a couple more opportunities for Beast Coast to get some points before this stage of the NAL might be out of reach. Yep, take it game by game, game by game, week by week, just try and get better. That's the goal of your Beast Coast. And of course, again, try and find your identity as a five man new unit. Don't try and be someone else. That's never gonna work out because you need to understand the why and the how. By copying, you don't typically figure out those aspects. LG, obviously the better team today, but Beast Coast have some promising things that they can look at out of their matchup today. Additionally, the Beast Coast roster is very experienced. You've got some players that have been around for a long, long time and have had tons of success. They're going to help enable that team to reach a higher, I guess, a higher ceiling than if they had a younger team. And there's been some debate over whether or not you want to bring in newer players or whether you want to, quote unquote, recycle some of the old oh. vets who have a trouble staying on teams but that's it for our very first matchup we got a couple more to go we'll be right back
Well, Luminosity finally get their first win of the new NAL with their new squad. With the rookies, everything seems like it comes together, but it doesn't look like the rehash of Clubhouse that we saw last week. It looks considerably better. Beast Coast come in their very first game of the NAL. They will have to go back to the drawing board before they play their second matchup later on. But LG, they got their three points. They're out squeaky clean. They did their jobs today. Yeah, they definitely did. And unfortunately for Beast Coast, I liked some of the little hints of them that I saw, but to me, it looked like a real lack of preparation, a real lazy little bit of preparation. It looked like they tried to play exactly how SSG played last week. It didn't really seem like they brought Ooh. their own identity to the game. There was a little bit of flair here and there. Obviously, they had the good players, good individual plays, but unfortunately, it didn't seem like Beast Coast I was watching. The thing with Beast Coast, right, is that they brought kind of that energy we expected from them, right, a little bit of everything. They tried to throw a couple of different styles at Luminosity, and we saw some fun stuff. We saw some cool demos play, yeah. which we're excited to talk about, but Luminosity just kind of beat them to the punch. They made some really good adjustments across the board, and impressive changes, surprisingly significant changes, considering their loss to SSG was only a week ago. We yeah. saw a back and forth first half, which was weird because Beast Coast had defense first and didn't take as much advantage of a clubhouse defense as you might expect to do. And then they won their first attack round, and we were all like, oh, hey, this actually looks kind of interesting. And then LG just ran away with it on defense for the rest of the game. Yeah, we saw a lot of mistake correction from the side of Luminosity, obviously from week one to week two. And I think that's where I touched on Beast Coast playing like SSG. They played very slow, very turtled, all of their defenses. And obviously that's where we saw a little back and forth because clubhouse defense obviously is the more favorable side, but we saw some amazing plays from Luminosity. And not to say Beast Coast didn't come to play, they came to play, Luminosity was just just better today because the way that they were entering the map was just so fast. They were able to get in the map, get good control, and be able to capitalize on that control and have a full game plan all the way through to the end of the round. And you see it there in the entry kills. I mean, seven and four overall. They were getting in the building first and starting each round off with some success. And of course, there's ways to come back in any given round, but they just started it off strong and didn't let up off the gas. Yeah, they didn't let, off, let off, off the gas at all, and that was a highlight point that we said Luminosity didn't have that mid to late game ideology. They didn't necessarily know where they were going, and then once SSG had them where they wanted to, obviously it didn't go in LG's favor. But in this game, there wasn't a moment where Luminosity stopped to think, what are we doing? They just got everyone in the position, they knew exactly what they needed to do, and they didn't go for the plants at all. I'm assuming, obviously, we keep that in mind, but they weren't focused on it. They were focusing on slaying out and using the numbers that they were able to gain on the entry for their late round and obviously that was a much better performance from them it really showed a lot of good changes and it wasn't just on attack on defense too they obviously were adapting and every single round we saw a different look at how luminosity was playing one round it was fast one round it was slow and i don't think beast coast was able to get a grasp on it see here's the thing even though beast coast lose fed still had some cool stuff in his back pocket he had a TikTok idea just ready and waiting with that <laughs> demos clip from round seven that we will take a look at because that's one of the first times i think in na that we've seen this actually super creatively used i love this play from spirits not only this earlier in the round but it was the execute phase of this round that really did it for us right he was using that death mark tracker not to necessarily get a kill but to freeze the soulless in place and to prevent kicks row from doing the damage from below as the soulless you're hoping to deny the plant but with that death mark everyone would be aware of the Solus's position and not allow that to happen from below. It was a textbook play on how to use Deimos so that you guys can get to use it in your own ranked games. I mean, <laughs> yeah. he was able to shut down the denial and then not only that, but continuously keep that death mark on so that the rest of his team is able to communicate what's going on, is the plant safe? And I think we've seen a lot of that Solus play being able to stop plant from below. So him being there to also capitalize on his own gadget, I mean, it was a really nice play start to finish and then he was able to push all the way through, down another play on red and he was just, being such an annoying pain in the side, just so devastating, <laughs> just being a lurker, just keeping the players on Luminosity aside. Obviously, Luminosity ended up being able to adapt right. and ended up running away with it once they swapped sides. But it was a nice little clip to, to highlight Deimos. Well, one more good thing for Beast Coast. We got to talk about how the Rook did because his first game, Diffuser had a lot of pressure on his shoulders, playing with a whole bunch of dudes who've been in the circuit for a long time. And he had one very clutch moment that I think made Beast Coast think, yeah, we made a really good decision picking this guy up. And it was one of those we're glad we chose this guy moment, yeah. right? Exactly. It was a moment where he was in a 
kind of a 1v2 situation, ended up taking it to a 1v1 and got the clutch. Just a really high pressure moment where he was able to thrive. He was playing that support role kind of the whole time, bouncing between those more support and flex roles, but he did a decent job doing that. Of course, not the performance he would have liked to have. He would have liked to get a couple more kills. And Obviously. of course, Beast Coast would have liked to walk away with the win, but a good baseline just to start things off. Now that you've done it, only up from here. It's a nice little bit of promise, especially when you're able to see a rookie feel comfortable, get their own first clutch and their first match of a T1 Pro. Obviously, it does put you in a perspective where you're like, okay, well, was it a performance issue? What was the main issue? In my, in my opinion, the where the places that Beast Coast fell off was obviously the lack of their own identity. Sure. They, they have amazing players. Obviously, we saw a lot of those players make big plays, but we didn't see them all come together like we hoped that they would have. But everybody on LG, in their win, adapted so much more from that game against Space Station. What were some things we were noticing in the back? Well, one obvious thing right off the bat was just operator selection and how they were using shields to kind of bolster their new approach. We saw Monty picked twice on the attacking side. We saw one time not so successful, one time quite successful. And we saw them bring the clash on the defense. Yeah. A very unique strategy used to protect the bandit on the jacuzzi wall, allowing him to bandit trick, shut down that entry point. Really just indicative of the changes they've made overall. I think just the shield is one example of it. Well, let's get Hat in here real quick to talk about that W. Dude, can you hear me? How was that win? It's good, it's a good win. Feels good. How long have you been able to scrim with this particular team out of curiosity? We know the roster changes were hectic for most people. So how long has this group been able to really get together and hone things down? I think this exact five, maybe like a week, week and a half at most. That's it? Yeah. Jeez, bro. Struggle. What's going on, Hat? Uh, I just kind of highlighted a lot of your guys' changes from week one to week two, and I wanted to give you a little bit of room to just walk us through what the correction process was. Well, after the SSG game, we all sat down together and we pointed out all of our mistakes that we need to work on throughout the week and we put our head down. People did the talking and just grinded ourselves and, and obviously it showed in this first one. Can you tell me a bit more about the shield play? I mean, we saw that come out on both the attack and the defense with the clash. Was that one of those fundamental changes you guys had cooked up? Yeah, we um, decided we need a new gym like defenses and we uh, thought the clash would have been a good idea for a couple of reasons and then obviously Monty has been has been like a buff since new season that's how he picked it there's a lot of pressure on I guess your guys' team shoulders but talk to me a little bit about you specifically since you are the longest lasting pro league player on the team right now which is crazy to say because you haven't been around for that much time in pro league but you have had some good experience is there a little bit of weight on your shoulders that you have to be the leader for the team or how does the power dynamic of the roster work i feel like on our team there really is no confirmed leader we all trust each other 100 percent, and whatever who calls something we always go with it and obviously i've been the longest but i'm not the leader with no weight on my shoulder we know what we need to do to win all right brother good stuff is there anything else you want to say before we let you go i just wanted to say um beast coach should have got wi-fi <laughs> well, they picked up the wrong rookie, it looks like, at least for this game. Dude, again, congratulations. And for them, that is the single best thing they could have done for themselves. They knew there's a couple different rookies on the table. Who are we going to go with? There's plenty of guys on the board. Beast Coast take Diffuser. Wi-Fi still left up. They go with the other element champion, and they win today. There's a lot of good talent out there. You can't go wrong, necessarily. There's a handful of good guys that you see come out of these, you know, leagues like Element or in some cases across other regions that are great to pick up and will make great additions to any team. One thing I've always noticed about Wi-Fi, especially listening to, to Element uh, listen-ins, was actually how calm and calculated he was, especially being a leader and trying to gather everyone to be on the same page. You don't see that out of a lot of younger players. And so that was something that I just was really impressed when I would listen to him. Yeah, well, Luminosity pick up the dub here on day three, and now they're done for the day. Meanwhile, Beast Coast is not out of the woods. They have to play a second game later on in our game five. They play OXG, and OXG actually has a game coming up next. We'll get right to it after a quick break. Don't go anywhere.
Last week was a blazing start for Oxygen Esports as they opened up their 2024 campaign with a win over Los, while Wildcard tried their hand against M80 and came up just a little short. But as Big Green and Big Red meet in the arena this evening, it's important to remember that both teams are still knee-deep in their discovery phase. So no matter what happens here, it may not be indicative of what happens for the rest of the stage, but we are still figuring things out as we go. I'm Jacob, he's Jay as well as he's Fox A. Gentlemen, this is one of the matches on the card that I honestly think could be a low-key bang. Oh, absolutely. It's a little bit of a new guard versus old guard. No pun intended. Get it? New, 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 <laughs> is new guard. Of but course you meant oh that. God. Seeing the little the intricacies of both teams, it's a nice showing of who will come out on top, the old style of Siege or the new style of Siege. And for OXG, it's also looking at their roster, a new style of roster. Obviously, when you were on the team, it was a very different approach with a more centralized voice. They now go a different direction and try to rebrand a bit. Is that style going to work for them? Yeah, the current wildcard core and the current oxygen core played each other twice in the 2023 season, and they went one and one with one another. So as this rivalry continues to brew, even though these players, these teams have only faced each other essentially twice in recent memory, it's important to figure out how they, or how they build their base, so to speak, and figure things out from here on out. Figuring out exactly where to go is I mean, for Wildcard, for example, right, they're also a team that's looking at making some changes internally and to that structure. And we saw some good parts of that in their week one game sure. and some not so good parts. Yeah, they had a lot to, a lot of things to improve on. I would also say the same thing goes for OXG. I think OXG obviously had struggles on their defensive side, whereas Wildcard had struggles on their attacking side. So. They had a week to go through everything, and obviously OXG also has to preserve some of their energy because they have another game at the end of the day. They've just been able to watch what Beast Coast was looking like, and it puts a little bit of pressure on their shoulders because they want to look scary going into that next game. So they obviously want to put up a lot of a fight in this one. Well, I hate to talk about the team that you literally just left a couple <laughs> weeks ago at this point, it's okay. but let's start with Oxygen and get a picture on how that game against Los went. They played on Oregon. It was a really hotly contested first half, and then the second half comes in, and we we realize, wait, Los is just really good at basement and OXG seems like they're good at everything else. So what do we see from OXG in that game? OXG was amazing at the hard things. They were really good on the attack on Oregon, which is obviously the hardest part. Their adaptability on their attacks and their flexibility was very, very standout. But the issues that I guess we talked about arise was the basement, which you would argue is the easier side on Oregon. And especially when you play against a team like Wildcard, you have to be I guess a little bit of worried because Wildcard is obviously very good on defense. You got to make sure that you're able to get those easy rounds under your belt because once you have the hard ones down, I mean, you know, it, it's able to be a lot smoother when you can do the easy stuff first. Well, with, with OXG, right, you've got someone like Dream who's been a rock solid support for a long time. Basically, got someone ever. like at viewers. this point, he's been doing it since the dark ages. Like, exactly, exactly. He's been so key for this team's success over the last year or two, right? You've got newers, you've got Yaga who fit into that picture really nicely. But they showed us in that first game, yes, there were some hiccups, but they showed us how they could incorporate Gomez and Diaz into that system, maybe bringing a little bit of that M80 style into the mix. But it worked pretty well for the most part. And when talking about this identity and exactly how they're reshaping this team, they made the steps in the right direction, that's for sure. With a couple of guys from that Xset roster or the M80 roster now coming in on this OXG core, everything was a little bit jumbled, so we caught up with DS real quick to walk us through that. Hello, I'm Diaz Lucas BR, player for OXG, and my role is second support slash flank watch. Uh, coming to this new roster has been uh, very refreshing because it's a new, it's a new dynamic, completely new system. Coming to OXG, it's very, it, it's nice. It's just something new, you know. It's exactly what we're looking for. I think me and Gomez uh, add a lot to the team because we're like a package, you know. And we've been very successful on our past teams. We've we've met each other when we were like 15. Now I'm 22. So we've been together for a long, long time, and we've been. We've been evolving together ever since, you know. Just the chemistry is always there. We're very, very good friends, and it's it's good to, to be an OXG with them. We're focusing on everything, to be honest, because uh, we're a new team. They also haven't played uh, games in a while. Uh, so we're focusing on everything, uh, strats, communication, just the chemistry itself, everything. 
there. Everything seemed pretty squeaky clean for Diaz and OXG from last week, but even though he performed really well, and so did Newers, we have to ask ourselves the question. Los is basically a fresh off the assembly line team, brand new, still need to figure some things out. So as, as good as players on OXG did from last week, how much are those stats from Diaz and Newers actually gonna matter in the long run? We're not gonna make grand sweeping conclusions about what it truly I mean, you totally can't. You're yet. an analyst. That you, we could, you, that's our Absolute job. statements are your job. If but you want we're not to gonna do that, okay? <laughs> we had Newers and we had Diaz put up incredible numbers, 13 kills each. And they both had some incredible moments. Like Diaz, for example, through the first four rounds, played four different operators. He was playing more flex anchor roles for the first four rounds. Then he came in and played soulless and tore people apart, got a triple kill and locked stuff down on the top floor. Newers, on the other hand, did a very similar thing. Excelling on the entry, you see him here as the nomad, doing good work on the flex, showing that not only can he walk in the building and get kills, but he can help the team out while doing it. I'm a big believer on giving credit where it's due. Obviously, OXG is also a brand new team in the way that they want to build themselves and play and pretty much structure themselves, completely changing in the same way as low. So the fact that they were able to come out not only that strong, but show the adaptability, that was a big thing for me. Obviously, going from a one IGL system to just everyone sees the play, you make the play. Obviously, they found so much success in their game against Los, being able to find the openings when they needed to. And you obviously want people who have been more established on this team to make an impact early. It's good when the new guys are able to come in and do something really soon, but Newers was one of those guys that had a, such a strong start to his career. Since that Charlotte run at the very, very beginning in his rookie stage, we're still kind of looking for the old Newers to come back in a big way. So, Fox, exactly how can he do that? Well, I don't think he needs to come back in the huge way that he was putting up those numbers. I really think as a player that he is, he is evolving in the way that his brain is involved. He's also getting older. And so not to say that he's old, but when you Isn't develop- Isn't he only like 20 or something at this point? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, old he is, he is. that's old for Steve. That's old for Steve. But grief. when you develop as a player, especially in my last season with New, I saw such a huge improvement in the way that he was able to see the game, look at the game and capitalize off of these plays. There was a lot of moments where he actually took the reins, called an adaptation and from a rookie that's used to being on the entry, when you see that level of development, you could only imagine such an uprise on the rest of his career, on the rest of his trajectory, especially when you get players like Gomez, who's been having a phenomenal entry season, and you're able to just rely on him for the kills as well, too. Well, let's see what their opponents are up to in this matchup, because they had a game against M80 on Shell A last week, tried, was really competitive through that first half, then we get to the second, and a lot more questions start to arise. They ultimately lose that matchup, but for Wildcard, coming into this game against Oxygen, is this a more balanced matchup, or are these guys already in trouble? I like this matchup for Wildcard, especially because I think just like we saw Luminosity do, they're gonna make some productive changes. We knew that coming in, Wildcard were going to have a strong static defense. That's what the Bosco addition really allowed them to do. Those concerns, however, flipped over to the attacking side where they were a little too static, a little too slow. And when it came to making some on-the-fly adjustments in the late round, that's where they left a little bit to be desired. I think just like Luminosity, they've had a week. That's not a lot of time, right? <laughs> but it's something. And if they can look at that attack, say, here's what we need to tweak. Let's change up our plan here. Let's restructure this a bit. I think their chances are good. Their chances are very good. Obviously, defense is being the more favorable side. Picking up Bosco, we saw such a huge, huge old style of Siege in the way that they played their last match. Obviously, it's only one match to go off of, but I agree. I would love to see a little bit more adaptation because when push came to shove and things weren't going in their way, we didn't see them you know, stray from the status quo. We didn't see an aggressive entry. We didn't see anything too surprising, but... I will say, whenever OXG played against Wildcard or the previous Mirage roster and we played against Vert, yeah. Vert powers up whenever he plays against his old team. <laughs> and that is a phenomenon that needs to be studied. When a player gets dropped, they always play 10 times better against their previous roster. That's, let's let's see if that same thing holds true, because you're right. You were one and one against that Mirage core from last year. And then Vert, no longer on oxygen, suddenly gets a little a little boost in the stats somehow. It's a weird thing, you're right, we do need to study. But how did the old man do in his first game back? Bosco doesn't play a professional match in almost 400 days. Comes, uh, he comes back against M80, good, bad, somewhere in the middle. 
Oh, he played amazing. We didn't. I didn't necessarily expect him to be the, one of the main players carrying the roster, but obviously it looked like he had no rust on his shoulders. He is that confident player that you want to rely on, and especially being on the smoke roll on defense and being on maybe a planter, droner roll on attack. Obviously, you don't expect him to be putting up the numbers that he did. Step by step, he was there for his team when they needed him. Unfortunately, we need to see the rest of the players be there for him to get him that opening. If you can put him in those positions, he will capitalize. I mean, it's that Bosco Rampy duo reunited. And I know we kind of joked about that before we got into that game, yeah. but it was so very it real. Really was. Those were the top two performers, without a doubt. They started off extremely hot. I think through the first five rounds, they had a combined 14 kills. Of course, things took a turn in the back They did half. slow down at they the end. They did yeah. slow down. They did end up losing the game. But the point is, they started off strong. And I do think that chemistry from years of playing together, it's still there. So we had a half and half defense for wildcard. That was a 3-3. Then when they attack, only one attack win. And that's probably the thing that will be the most concerning based on what side they end up starting on. They decide or no. It's defense first on Oregon, which means Oxygen will have played this for their first two matchups, and Wildcard actually get a chance to start on defense again for the second time in a row. There's a lot of similarities to last week, but what do we think about Oregon here? It stresses me out because when we look at the defenses, Wildcard was really good on defense. And Oregon is a map that obviously, if you can get a 5-1-6 half on defense, it puts you in a difficult spot getting to attack, even though OHE showed a lot of promise. It scares me going back to Oregon for a second map for Oakshi. Obviously, they didn't show too much when it came to uh, when it came to Lowe's. Yep. They only looked like they struggled on the basement. And when it comes to the attacks on wildcard side, there's nobody that I'm looking to right now to be able to make that opening like Lowe's had. I don't expect them to be showing any fast rushes or anything that will shock OXG. And that's what Wildcard's going to need to do, obviously, if they want to be able to get away with some rounds. The scary part is the basement, though, and you brought that yes. up. I know Laxing and you guys, you were joking about it on the desk last week. That for some reason, OXG on the basement, it just doesn't happen. And that's what we saw against Los, even against Los, who struggled in plenty of different areas, right? Yeah. OXG could not attack it, and they could not defend it. It was a little bit of both. So they have to address that right away. They don't have that time anymore. They're going right into Oregon. They walked into this. Yep. So Clearly, they know what they're doing, or at least we think. You'd hope. We're certainly gonna you'd hope. hope. The whole game now at this point hinges on whether Oxygen have been able to clean up those basement rounds on attack or D or not, because they had the option to go to clubhouse or not go to clubhouse, and they decided to stick with their guns. Everybody on the desk for the NAL championship has picked OXG in this matchup, so let's see if every single analyst can be wrong for the second time in a row. Parker, have fun with, uh, who are you casting with again? Uh, Pengu. Oh. I'm, I'm casting. I'm casting with with Pengu, uh, who has a, a really beautiful shelf behind him. What is? The, it looks like a white sculpture next to your Rainbow Six award. What is that? What is this? Show show the class. It's a 3D pink, uh, printed penguin that has the Penta logo and the Siege like Diamond logo, Pro League logo back in the day. It was uh, a fan. I gave this to me, Healing Bee, one of my French viewers, like seven years ago, and I have had this guy with me throughout all my journeys in Siege. That is beautiful. Thank yes. you so much for sharing that. Wildcard versus OXG. What do we come to expect from this matchup? Wildcard was in action last week. They lost to M80, four to seven. OXG prevailed over Los, seven to four. Hmm. So, okay. in that case, you gotta say that OXG's the favorite, right? I mean, the desk seems to think that. Sorry, the couch. <laughs> Stop. So I'm just gonna keep calling it that until somebody tells me not to do it. OXG is in action later today as well. They're gonna go up against Beast Coast, who just played in the matchup that we started off the show with against Luminosity for Wildcard. It's a one and done today. Oregon, operator bands locked in. Anything peculiar that catches your eyes with these four operators? No, I mean, I think this is what you would expect in most cases. I mean, the Ying, the Fenrir, the, uh, the Valkyrie, you know, cookie cutter operators where, that often get either banned or played. Um, of course, you can say, okay, Floris, what's up with that? Well, it's just a big utility accounting operator that really makes the basement attack especially a lot easier. So, not surprised to see that remove from play from Wildcard because they start on defense, they start in basement. Why would you want the Floris open for your opponent off of XG? Now, Oregon is the... I would say the default of default maps. 
It's a 50-50 where any team can beat other teams. But Oryx Thief, if you can play Oregon, you know, back to back and just like keep doing well, keep hiding your other maps, etc., you're looking mighty fine this season so far. However, if Wildcard come out swinging here, they take you down and make you look weak on this map, then you're in a bit of a pickle. OXG starting on the attacking side can be difficult, like like the couch spoke about, right? That's where you want to shine. So let's see if they can do it. First round to bring those power operators that we tend to love. The Capital, the Grim, and of course the uh, not W7M special, but W7M during Invitationals did run Osa quite a bit on Basement Oregon. You can go Freezer, you can go Bottom Laundry Stairs, you can go Blue. Those Talon Shields need to cover that otherwise does not exist on that Basement bomb side for the attack. So, great Operator pickup here from OXG. Grim has entered the meta with a Fury over the last couple months. I know that if you were cryogenically frozen and were woken up, you would be astonished to see Grim's pick rate be what it is, but Commando is a great gun. Bring secondary hard breach. As a bailiff, as a secondary, there's a lot working for Grim in terms of a tool set. And then, of course, you've got the bees, which yeah, bees. are not just good for anti-flank, but are also great during an execute, because then you can easily use them for area denial and gain very valuable information as to where they're going to go. I will watch with great eagerness as to where Gomez places said bees. Oxygen's actually got, I don't want to say an unconventional lineup here, but there are some mm -hmm. quite strong operators that are missing for this lineup and bringing a Grim, a Nomad, a Capital, and an Osa, those four together is something we don't always see at this level. Well, I mean, uh... Ella, <laughs> let's talk about it, right? Ella, no, the shotgun, by the way, the Scorpion. Very uncommon pick in general. Just like the Scorpion is seen as a very weak weapon. Uh, but you get those Griswold Mines. They deny entries, give you in so when they pop, and you get deployable shield. Deployable shields are hard to come by. You used to always bring them on the smoke on defense. Stroke lost that quite some time ago now, so you gotta go to these kind of odd operators, if you will, to pick them up instead. Very slow first round. OHD, they want to set everything up to perfection. OG shield, bottom freezer. Freezer, rather. Then Diaz, rotate to bottom laundry stairs. That's where the second shield goes. This is a lobby slash freezer execute. They're going to try and plant lobby side behind the OSA shield. They're going to try and 3, 2, 1, attack from everywhere. Dream backside, nearest freezer. Uh, Gomez on the meeting hatch. Two players lobby. It's an all-out ball here on basement. This round has just flown by. Very first round between these teams. This wild card looked to hunker down OXG. Just crouch walking their way towards the objective. Second Talon Shield will go down as he sees the smoke. Almost tears some strips through Yaga, who's inhaling that toxic gas. He's down, but not before he can get a pick on the Rampy. Both teams trading. Time working against OXG and numbers also not in their favor, though it is technically a 2v2. Vertical's been downed. Gomez will take the fire to them, and it's Boss Goat himself. We've seen him clutch multiple times. Can he pull it off again against Gomez? Yes, he can. Nice to see Bosco back in the swing of things. One yes. of the most notorious smoke players. You, a smoke main, Nick, can obviously look at somebody like Bosco and be happy with that level of play. Wildcard, take the very first round as Bosco clutches it out of the final seconds. Yeah, I mean, they call him Boss Goat for a reason. I think it was, uh, I think it was like a, a stat from like about three years ago, like about my time of retirement, a stat came out about most clutches in pro play. And it was something like myself, Breedy, and Bosco were all by the top three or top five. We all play the same positions, we play the same roles. And I see Bosco as one of like the OG really strong anchor players of North America. And him leaving the professional scene of Siege was one that I was kind of sad about. You know, some players that come and go and you forget them or you don't think too much about it. But I was like, surely Bosco makes a return, right? Overall, nice guy, phenomenal player. I like the role that he plays. I played myself, I can relate to him. Seeing him back definitely warms my heart. I think they start well for him and for Wildcard. Now, from one anchor operator to another. Maestro, an operator that we might see more play of this season than last because you have three evil eye cameras. This is phenomenal. You can deny plants, you can deny drones, you get intel, they are bulletproof. There are so many strengths to this operator. The only real downside, if the attacking lineup brings out either Dokupi or the Brava, 
those evil eyes will or can get hacked and then work against the defenders. That's the one downside. However, OXG have not brought either of those operators despite being available. So Maestro in this round is in full effect. And Maestro is a very slow operator. Their wildcard they won't speed to. They pick up the Solus. That's a fast operator. But they also pick up the fastest operator in Rainbow Six Siege of the Oryx. An operator which we almost never see being played these days. He lost normal 5 zoom scope. Everyone did at this point in the game. So Oryx doesn't bring you anything but speed. Yeah, you can jump out a hatch, but that's not really relevant for Oregon usually. Metro Cell goes out, but there's nothing there for it. If you're gonna see an Oryx, usually it's not on this top floor bomb site. It's to roam effectively. Hands in the leadoff pick in this round. One second off, or one minute rather, off of the clock. And already wildcard gifted quite a leg up. It's the player on the side of OXG, lived the longest in the previous round. Gomez, gone. Buck, gone. That is a damning loss, to say the least. What are you gonna do without him? This attempt by OXG now to open up the attic. They're searching for an opportunity that may not be there. They need to ensure that the back wall, that attic wall is not covered by a mute jammer and they're having some serious difficulties. That they do. I mean, OXG, I, I like that they're playing a slow round both times so far. I think often on Oregon, teams go too fast, things fall apart early, and the round finishes so quickly, but they're going slow, but they're still falling apart. Gomez and Yawk both down for the count. Ramby active on the roam. Alcard are playing all the angles upstairs and downstairs. Well, OXG having some serious issues already. Made worse by the loss to Yaga is now Diaz tasked with looking towards split. Kanzen was an inch away, but playing by Zulu has a couple angles that he needs to watch. He sees the tip of the gun. It's an easy pick and he's expecting another over towards White. He reads into it so well. Kanzen is just killing OXG himself. Why have a whole team when you've got just one player doing all of the work on his own? Dream has been boxed out now by Trophy as those Keeper Barriers will slow him down. It looked like it might be a one botched Keeper Barrier, but out will go the explosives. Two different <laughs> evil eyes looking in his direction. It's Kansen to flawlessly win the round and then show a lot of enthusiasm after an impressive showing on his end. Oh boy. I mean, this is the thing, right? When you go to Oregon back to back for OXG, things are not, not looking so good in the first two rounds here. You gotta make a big adaptation. And not only that, but if you play again later on today, you know, you want to, as Foxley said, come in hot. You want to do well, scare your opponent, build that confidence yourself. You have a really bad first match and you have a second match on that same day, your mental comes into play as well. There's no hard reset button. I mean, sure, you got a couple of hours to work things out, but it's not really ideal. OXD, they've been going methodical, they've been going slow. It might just be time for them to make an adaptation here, right? Maybe go more, play on the entry. Match the aggression, fight those roamers, fight them whenever they come for you. Because wildcard, they are certainly fighting back. They are not giving up spaces free for free. And that's the current meta of Siege. Again, you fight for every single air map that you find relevant. Big tower, the bomb site itself, the rooms above and below the bomb site. And that's what wildcard are doing so well. They're extending out. Even now. They're gonna mix them into a small tower. They're gonna be upside down trophy. They're playing in most loose areas around the bottom side, denying OHD and easy racing. I don't want to say it's a delayed setup, but there's obviously work that needs to be done by Wildcard to get themselves in a comfortable position. Because they've extended out over towards dining, and now you see Spiker playing by bathroom on that main floor. Not exactly common for teams to go to that dining slash kitchen hall or dining hall slash kitchen bomb site. Instead, meeting is the preferred area, and that in many ways goes down to the viability of the two towers, right? You've got the front tower where you see Yaga in right now, which is a small tower, and then you've got back tower, which is in many ways a lot easier to defend and more comfortable to defend for certain teams. There's small tower right there. As now we're just going to scoot across the map go over to big tower maybe maybe we go to big tower maybe not not today can't do it <laughs> unfortunately additionally the extension will lead you upstairs for the defenders into attic over to t2 and t3 you can still extend outwards towards dining hall as you saw originally wildcard was playing in that area but they've fallen back now 
Only bit of damage that's been done is onto Dream. We'll hold on to that diffuser. OXG have pretty much full control of that small tower side of the map. Big question mark for me is where is OXG intending to attack from? They haven't cleared out top floor just yet. No very towards the bomb side. Thermos and Lobby, well, they're jammed out. And now they're in a bit of a stall. Decision making has to happen here. Very inside of Master Bedroom. Do they know? They have no idea. Solus has been such an issue for OXG. It was Kansan in the previous round. Now it's vertical in the same spot and he can get away safely. Rampy not too far removed. OXG hoping for a pinch. You're seeing great value coming out of those bees launched out by the Grim of Dream. Yaga wanted to be in pursuit. Now it's Diaz tasked with finding out where these defenders are. Wildcard are doing an excellent job of retreating. It's giving OXG a lot more map control, but it's costing them time and utility. Wildcard now sitting with their full lineup, not a single point of damage done to them. And they're in great shape in the final 40 seconds. They're playing those layers, the whole top floor, time is low, all back go for a late round flank instead when they go for the plant. The thing is, they have given a lot of space here. Attackers and try to go for a plant, no smoke on defense, can't deny this. They got off flank and three can go for those gunfights. Don't hold. Newer Doors. Off Bosco Rampy dies as well. What is going on? OXG have found two very quick kills. Fuser going down. Wildcard will now need to scramble. Newers has a good read on top freezer. There's an air jab not too far removed. Down goes Dream. Newers has to look elsewhere. Might this create an opening for Wildcard? Looking for a perfect cycle to start off. But OXG just out muscling them. Newers in particular, excellent through that round and OXG gets on the board. Damn, I mean, they gave up so much of the map. I, mean, I was like, yeah, okay, it's great that they fell back. They're playing big tower and they're playing bomb side, but they didn't actually have a way for wildcard to deny the plant attempt. Usually you play a smoking side of meeting, throw those toxic babes for towards like the default plant position. It either stalls things out or outright stops the plant attempt. They didn't have it. No C4s in position either. So they just walk in, OXG, <laughs> They start planting, and Newer does what he's best at. He gets kills. One through the drone hole, which is absurd, by the way. And the second was a nice shot onto the green hallway door from dining. Wildcard, though, when you go to territory bomb site, you're not really, quote unquote, supposed to win. That is like your freebie for the attackers more often than not. So that's perfectly okay. It's uh, all about this rotation now. You go back to basement. What can Orchi do? You go back to upstairs and get storms. What are they gonna do? See how they play it out. Similar side setup though, we have a third layer from Wildcard, the same similar other lineup, and probably gonna be the same position as well. One thing that I wanted to talk about on both the bottom floor bomb site, laundry supply, and then of course, of course, that top floor bomb site of dorms was not just about the operator composition that OXG is bringing, but when you were talking about a Brava, it jogged my memory from previous uh, previous matches that we've seen, especially around SI and other regions where bringing one of the three drone ops is almost a requirement whether it be a flores whether it be a brava or even yeah. twitch whose pick rate was quite high on oregon back at si and if you look oxg's not bringing any of those drone operators this is the exact same lineup from oxg that they brought back in round number one and obviously it came down to a 1v1 with bosco beating gomez so it was close enough oxygen using its forces get in close on laundry that just because it works doesn't mean it's optimal and again i it's not that i'm criticizing oxygen but if you know that there's going to be a, an operator lineup that has tons of electronics a brava as that trickster op is excellent if you know there's going to be a lot of explosives needed a flores is also excellent oxg are going to go with the same thing that they thought almost worked last time around they use their pieces of bottom la of bottom laundry stairs and we're able to exert a lot of influence. Will they pull off the same Executor or will we see some small changes from OXG? Yeah, that is the question. I mean, when I see the same attacker lineup, I'm always thinking, damn, they're going to go for the exact same Execute again. Which, to be fair, if you think as a team that it was a like, minor, minor detail, you messed up, you should go for it again. If you think you can course correct, but while card the second they see this Ocean Shield bottom freezer, they're going to prepare for the exact same outcome. But, with that being said, OXG could also fake this Execute. They also, this way one take, but they go for it, like a very hardcore backside hit if they wanted to. So we gotta see this kind of decision making and the problem solving from OXG. Minutes ago, got the green piece of the caps of fire, those are gonna be the telltale signs that the Execute will be happening. These are now laundry hatch, we'll just make the barbed wire. 
those nades, they don't really do a lot of damage these days to players. It's more about clearing out utility. There goes those smokes that had done so much damage to Yaga. The first attempt that OXG had on this bomb site. The same setup as we talked about on Laundry Supply Room from OXG as they just creep forward towards those bomb chassis. A Talon shield placed by DS. We can sit behind it, gain valuable information. Viewers first to die. Vertical getting flamed out by the Capital. Has to maneuver out of that position in Freezer. OXG in a 4v5. The clock will not be their friend as that timer is ticking away with quite a hurry. Wild card poised, ready. Not much movement. Vert will be the one to quarterback this push. He sees the legs on the Kiba barrier, just not far removed, softening him up. But he can't outduel OXG, who will bull rush in. It's all up to Dream on a single point of HP. Anzen and Spiker last two alive. Whether they get the kill doesn't matter. The timer will work for the defenders, and Wild Card goes perfect on laundry supply. They're up 3 1. Damn. I mean, that's exactly where you want to be. And you sh again, they shut down the push from OXT both strategically, but also in those gunfights. The big thing about Oregon is the opening kill is very crucial. It's all about numbers. I mean, we see it on these basement executes. It's five defenders and five attackers just fighting it out one to one. But wildcard, in both of those attempts, they get the first initial pick, they play that five versus four, and they just can overpower OHT. They have the man advantage, they have more bodies, they have more guns in their direction. So, OHT, I mean, yeah, you can you can fall here in the attack. You can go down one three, you can go down, you know, one four, whatever. The question is, how good are OHT at defending? Because if you go flawless on defense, hey, you can kind of not suck on attack, but you can have a, you know, a bad half. If you're actually right now, I think you're just hoping for a 2-4 on the half right now. I think 3-3 might be a bit of a, uh, you know, the wish for it, but is it realistic? The Skidstorm Storm defense, again, same lineup on Wildcard. They have a playbook right now, they're following it. It has a single strategy, as like the core concept. The operators, maybe the player position where they start the round. So for Wildcard, it's about those micro decisions. Hey, I need help over here. Oh, now they're pushing dining. Can somebody rotate to C4? And all of those kind of small communications, like that's the wild card they make their place. They don't change the bigger picture, but they change those small things instead. Not even 30 seconds in, and OXG have very quickly got into the building. There was one logic bomb used by Yaga. Second one will go. Both pieces of the Jokubi's utility now Expended within the first 40 seconds. Means at this point, Yaga will just be three flashbangs and a set of guns. That's about it. Obviously, those logic bombs were used to aid the entry for OXG. Did it pay off? That's the real question. Yeah. I mean, they're playing around it right now. Yaga waves the hatch drop. Oh, he wins the gun, but I thought we're going to shoot the ceiling there for a second. And that's going to be the good start for them. Rambi looking for a flank, though, looking to punish back. Wildcard recognized. Now they've lost the man advantage. They need to get it back. Rambi gets Yaga, who's running down freezer stairs. And we talked about how fast Oryx can be, but an often overlooked part of his kit is the ability to hop up through those hatches. Rampy will re-engage, but Diaz was there for it as Rampy jumped back down and wanted some more. OXG have been trailing in terms of player numbers for most of this matchup up to this point. So getting a first pick and then using that to continue to get these picks is huge for the OXG roster. Only two players left on wildcard now with a little bit over a minute to go. This is not the greatest of timing for the defenders, however. The Storm's bomb site is quite unique when it comes to this game because it tends to work out very effectively when you are entrenched in this position, whether it be the attackers who have full control of the site or the defenders. There's lots of hard walls. Sight lines can be very close quarters. Sight lines can be quite tight, meaning that lots of fights will be close quarters, and that obviously benefits these defenders. Now, for OXG, they got a lot of tools to start to open up the bomb site, and they've already started to do that. Yeah. Yuvaka can find the initial pick here on the entry, shut down one of the attacking, you know, positions, so this would be a great start for them, but they don't. Viewers is just going to run right through the remaining two players, and OXG split the upstairs bomb site. That first cycle that we saw from Wildcard was successful until they went to what would be considered the tertiary bomb site of meeting and dining. This time around, 
but it's a much more confident OXG. They enter quickly. They use utility to narrow down the roamers. They get a pick or two. And yeah, obviously Rampy lurking down below wasn't something they expected. But Rampy gets... I'm not sure what Rampy's thinking was actually to drop back through that security hatch unless he thought that there were a set of eyes from OXG on security and he was trapped in that position. Opting to go back down to Freezer is a play that can't quite pinpoint why he would go about doing that. Either way, OXG showing confidence, showing some moxie, and they prevail to keep this one close. Wildcard can still win the half. They just need to prevail on this final defense. OXG teasing a glass right now, but can be six picked off. I'd like to see the glass. <laughs> I mean, give it to us. Give us the chaos, right? I love to see it. A fast play blitz, glass, a lion, or do something fancy. Goes? Ah, la last second. He changed off it. Oh boy. Ash is boring. Boo! 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 But R4C has ACOG now, so yay! <laughs> Uh, take me back, man. It's, it's been feeling so refreshing. I've been playing uh, 44 games of ranked for the last like, three days or so. I've been having a great time. Ash Acock, Doc Acock, running out the building, having a good old time. Slower ADS speed, by the way. I know some people are against it. I personally, massive fan. Now that it's been a few days, been a week or so, you know, it doesn't feel all that bad anymore. It feels like basically it's normal at this point. It is quite nice to see the scope changes come into effect. I know that we are technically in what should be our third play day, technically in our second after there were issues on the very first, but for a lot of these players and a lot of these viewers, there's been some serious changes. The scope changes are something that you might be tuning in and notice, oh my gosh, old ACOG is back. Yeah, changes in the year nine of, I, I honestly think of just shaking things up to a point where it doesn't feel like a new game, but there are so many changes, especially to the operators that we saw as being problematic on the uh, on defense. Zombie now, you can shoot those Kiba barriers down. There are changes to Solus coming. There are changes to Fenrir coming. Oh Ooh, my. Nice. The trajectory changes make that a lot easier. <laughs> and Spiker can thread that needle, kill Yaga. OXG, like we said, they have trailed a lot in terms of numbers. They will trail yet again. I like that OXG did bring one of those drone operators, bringing Brav out. But we won't really see much use of those clutches. And it was the Brav who died. Yep. That is the thing. You see four lineups, they can be nasty. If you're not ready for them, easy claps just like that. Now OXG, they were good last time at finding those aggressive plays, seeking out those isolated targets off our card. But when you lose your player early and Rampy is playing more laid back, that's when things get a little bit more difficult now. Time is also slipping away. Very few options now for HD. They gotta just push up with the wall, go for a 3 2 1 bump to execute, or maybe try and catch Rampy instead of Attic, but it's a hard to reach position for the attack. I don't know if Rampy's aware of that drone that's spotting him at all, Nick, but he was very. Uh, he was very cool, calm, and collected if he knew he was being watched. I suppose the more time that Rampy wastes, the better it works out for the remaining players on wildcard again. No actual damage has been done to wildcard. The only person who's below 100% HP is Rampy, and it looks like the reason for that was he dashed through a soft wall and took damage. That's about it. Yeah. Anzin was red, outdueled by Diaz. Dream on the board as well. OXG have now taken advantage, but they're stacked up on white. Spiker can make them pay. Fuser going down vertical. We'll need to watch for that. He takes out Diaz. Dream succeeding so far, but Gomez will shut the door on a comeback in that round. OXG, high the game. And just as in our very first matchup, Nick, we are no closer to a resolution. No, we are not, but now it looks like a competitive match. We should be figuring out our problems throughout those first couple of rounds where they try and go slow, they go very methodical, they're predictable, it's a bit boring in the server, and now they're playing much more free inside of these rounds, and of course things are working out. I said 3-3 was a bit of a, uh, a dream, so to speak, but it came true. They found the 3-3 half, and now when you go into defense, you're actually looking like you're in a great spot if you're Archigen. Go so from struggling to suffering from success, arguably. Again, we'll talk about wildcard on defense on a map like Oregon. Strike first. You don't really play anything that unorthodox. I didn't see anything from wildcard's defenses that 
lead me to think that this is a, an innovative way of playing Oregon. You know, you, you said it before we even got into the map itself, that this is the default of the defaults. You know, you go to Oregon to test your fundamentals. It wasn't that long ago that the old Oregon, before it was reworked, was the map where good teams go to die because it was chaotic and unpredictable. Oregon can still hold that title, but it's far more formulaic in the way that you go about things. That's why we spend so much time talking about Oxygen's semi-unorthodox lineups. Now, if you look at what's being brought by Wildcard, we've got a Grim, they've got Finca, and they're bringing a Monty, but the Monty is not actually going towards blue, which is where we tend to see a lot of those shield operators go. Instead, it's gonna be a clear main lobby. That's it. Monty will need an escort. Did Vertical just miss the OXG player in security, by the way? Yeah, they got the cross. Question is now, how is Vertical gonna deal with this? They swing out the wrong time. They might just fall by the wayside, but no. I think y'all got the read on it. TT for has been shot earlier. So Vert now recognizes, I cannot push this position. Mute jammer inside the kitchen also stalls things out. Wild card not really advancing that quickly, but it's fine. Hanson's on Monty. He can simplify this once he gets close, and now he's here. Drop. Give up the space. They say Monty. Too big of a task for us. Let's just stall the site. Play out the 5v5. Defense always wants to keep the numbers. There goes Kanzen walking down freezer stairs to assert himself in that position. Very quickly come to realize that freezer wall has been completely shot open as we see from teams keeping that long line of sight playing off of the rotate between the bomb sites as well for the less experienced players currently watching pro play they might be shocked at how much is left open by the defenders it's quite common when you're new to the game to barricade all the doors reinforce all the walls even maybe between the bomb sites but as you get to know this game more you know that those long sight lines will often give the attackers pause and it will force them to drone you out because you're less likely to swing an open door than if you're given some security from the door being barricaded off. That long line of sight really helps out OXG on this defense. That it does. Try applying pressure onto the attack. You see it here, like, you're always thinking, okay, if I walk, you know, one step too far forward, I might just be taken out from these unknown angles or if the surprise into the angle. MC4 goes wide, fire goes out too, but it's going to be the defenders find that first opening kill. Well, Wildcard are not used to being in this position. Dream fighting with the Montane of Kansan. OXG just simply better on these defenses right now. Mind you, it's their first crack at it. Kansan unsheathing the pistol. Down goes Diaz. There's more, but Newers is able to win that engagement. OXG grabs the lead on Oregon with a successful first defense. Yeah, there's a thing. Yeah, things can be a bit 50-50 on the attacking side, but Oregon defense is arguably the better place to be and the easier place to be. Problem solving on the attack is difficult. I like the Monty there. Going down big tower stairs, we don't see all that often. And I think that round kind of shows why. Yeah, sure. Normally a player cannot just walk down the tower staircase. Monty can. But walking down tower doesn't give you all that much. You just have a lot of crossfires, you have a lot of things to worry about. Muncie kills a player down to that Shaiko position, as we call it in Europe, that blue tower position. And that's really it. Muncie cannot advance forward from that moment on. It's why most teams, they take Muncie, they go blue double door. They go in and they go to the left, they take, take elbow control. Or you go on a freezer staircase, you take freezer control. So Wildcard go for a different kind of play, probably to avoid all that utility. Uh, that was set up by the defense, maybe going where there are less gun faced in Monty's direction, but it was arguably a weaker way to approach things strategically. Sometimes different is better. It's a nice attempt. OXG, they're gonna bring an operator that we saw earlier today, Parker, that normally we don't see either all that often on Oregon. It's Clash again. So that, you know, my tier list, I'm gonna say it again. I put Clash in a sleeper position that is underutilized and underrepresented in pro play and in rank. Two party games today, two different teams have played Clash now on two different maps. And of course, it's Dream playing that operator. He likes to play very sheltered minutes with his operators. I always think back when I'm talking about this particular anecdote. Is Dream playing Maestro on border? Yeah. He'll almost always sit 
in what is referred to as jail or over by customs area. And it's just not usually a big part of map control for teams, depending on the bomb site. If you're playing Teller's Bathrooms, you're not necessarily going to watch that area. You can sit there and use those evil eye cams. Great effect. Deimos as well for Spiker. Uh, like seeing the new operator. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Clash here could also just be like a direct Monty counter. Clash just like... Monty can just... I mean, no one can really walk a Clash. You see it here. Walks out Clash. <laughs> He's not getting zapped. The grenade bounces back towards you. Monty can't really do anything in his position. Wherever Clash goes, Monty has to try and go somewhere else, or you try and bait the Clash in with the Monty and deal with it somewhere else, or in some other way. But the issue is you can't cook those grenades below anymore. So there's no easy way to get rid of Clash. On the attack lineup right now, it's just guns. Clash brings a nade, that's it. So Clash should be stable in this rubber. Rampy with the skeleton to kick is a great kill from down below onto Gomez. That's gonna soften up the defense. But again, Clash remains a problem. Activated that duel with Deimos. Those that don't know, Deimos sends out a tracker that will hunt you down and ping your location. You see Deimos' position, Deimos sees your position, and you can relay that verbally to the rest of your teammates. Nice shooting from Diaz, as both Spiker and Bosco are now in the grave. Things started out quite well for Wildcard. They got a read on where these players were from above. They used soft destruction effectively. Rampy got the first pick. But Kansas has just been idle in this position at bottom of white stairs. And the longer this takes, the less likelihood that the Monty of Kansan will prove to be that effective. It's a shield off as now the Monty walks up. Rampy not too far removed and out goes an impact. Everybody taking damage. One Adrenal Surge goes out, great timing. Vertical dies right after <laughs> using it. Wildcard are boxed out of the bomb site right now at top white. Hansen reduced to a single point of HP. He's dropped by the Clash. Oh no! But now Dream has been boxed out himself. He puts the shield on his back, but Diaz goes prone and gets a smattering of kills as OXG still remains undefeated on defense through two rounds. Nah, that looks like the most chaotic ranked match ever, where it's like, Seven people, they brawled on the white staircase leading to the bomb side. Yeah, they got coordination, they got some verticality, they're using their utility, but it's just a clash stopping all the attackers, keep us going out, impacts being thrown, and wildcard, they cannot break it. I like to say that, you know, wherever clash goes, you just go somewhere else. You don't want to deal with it, it's so difficult. They didn't agree. They wanted to brute force the problem, and as we noticed with the result, it really did not work out for them. They could have gotten big power, they could have gotten master bedroom, they could have worked that big window position, which they tried, but then Diaz happens. He swings that big window, gets through kills, and with those, you know, bodies forms of the ground for wildcard, the push was kind of over. All they had left was white stairs, they try and just go for it, it doesn't pan out. OXG, their creativity here, it works out, counterplay was great, the adaptation was made. It did take a few rounds to get activated from them, but ever since... Like round number four, OXG has been the driver. Great look for them. Now, Treasury bomb site. That's the big question. Can they get perfect bomb site rotated here? Three in a row. Was all for a 6 0. Then down to basement bomb site. That's a 7 3 right there in that regard. I do like the look of this wild card squad. I think the roster is quite fascinating. Obviously, you've got old teammates in Bosco and Rampy. Both played an SSG on those days, way, way long ago. Anzen's become, I don't want to say a bit of a journeyman, but he's hopped around different rosters. Vertical, the same as well. Vertical most recently was on OXG before moving over to Wildcard after OXG decided to not blow up the roster, but make some serious changes. Yaga was loaned out to M80 for SI. And then from that team, they decided to bring over Gomez and Diaz after M80 dropped their entire roster with the exception of Spoit. That was a, uh, I mean, surprise, surprise, but if a team makes every major, but they get, uh, they get clapped in groups, you gotta make changes, right? 
Same thing for mm -hmm. XG when they made their changes. Yeah, you can do good domestically, but that's not really where you want to be. Yeah, you want to do good domestically to make the major. But the goal is to do well at the major, at the Invitationals. OXD with these roster changes could be a team to look out for again on the rise. Foxy with a lot of praise for numerous improvements throughout just, you know, Foxy's time in OXD. He was just a, as we say, all brain, no aim Ash main. Now Newer's calls for his team, makes adaptations and reads the game better as well. With that R4C having access to the ACOG, Vert's gonna go with something a little bit closer on. Yaga, the very first kill, wild card. Well, folding a little bit early so far. Looking for their very first pick and they'll get it. Yaga dies to Spiker. And that's the smoke. That's a great pick for Wildcard. Out goes grenades, impacts in so, tossed out by Dream as he looks to guard backstage. Exothermic charge will give a greater opening now to Wildcard and Vertical just sprints on in. He's good for one pick. Does he know there's a second? No. Gomez picks them both up. Spiker, the last one standing. He dies to Diaz out of nowhere, almost. OXG move to match point. Yep, they get that perfect bombs at rotation. Three straight on the half. And now it gets worse. They will probably, most likely, if not definitely, go to that base and bomb side. Wildcard, they had a good start here. They got the first round victory when we started this matchup. They had a second round flawless victory. But then ever since then, it slowly kind of slipped away. And Wildcard, while I like their defenses, what they were doing, how they were playing, rotating around the map, their attacks so far have not really wowed me the same. They're not really progressing throughout the map. They're losing opening duels. I, I will say they try to just go for broke straight, you know, from vertical, rushing through a meeting door, trying to take side control, gets the initial pick. But there's no real backup. It's just one person doing an aggressive play with two players playing relatively far back, holding passive ankles. I want to see Wildcard do more as a team. If they want to go for broke, like, let's all commit to the play. Let's all go crazy. If you want to play like a more relaxed style, let's all hold angles. Because often what happens when you have a team that's kind of split in the middle, where half is playing one style of CS and the half is playing another, there's just a disconnect. And the support, the timing, the trading of bodies isn't quite Defenders, happening. And that's what you need in the attack inside, especially on Oregon. You can't just throw a body away here and there, die to a C4 without getting a kill somewhere else, unless you're gaining some absurd amount of map control. But that's not the case here. Neither Wildcard or XG on Oregon defense are giving up things for free. They're fighting for space and they recognize strategically what they need to do in these rounds. OXG go basement as expected. They bring out more utility. They're playing, you know, the mirror. They're playing the warden where they can, you know, not get flashed. They can't get smoked off on their positions. And Wildcard got to figure out what operations do they think are needed to break this. Defense. Of course, they're going to bring the Ash. Those are the things that happened. It's some time ago now. The Ash breaching rounds, the gadget can now counter the mirror windows. It will shatter the mirror window if you ash charge them directly on the surface of the window itself and you cannot see through them on defense that's why ash's pick rate has gone up in recent time in traditional play is a direct one-to-one -one mirror counter it's a great balance change made because now you have an easy solution you don't just gotta hop the roll with a bandit behind it when you meet behind it etc it's a nice kind of alternative way to deal with it and the R4C is still an incredible weapon as well. Oh yeah. Oh, so yeah. I mean, you know, you've got your you've got your typical entry fraggers running Ash with great regularity. I mean, it was it was vertical. It was on Ash last round. Now it's on Kansan. Obviously, the, the reintroduction of this ACOG, as you see it on your screen right now, Ooh. will help bolster Ash's numbers. You know, you and I are old enough to remember where. Ash was basically the main entry on every team for the longest time. It became IQ for a period of time there when Ash was weirdly in that almost like utility role. Yeah. When we were in that 20 second meta, her and Zofia were used very, very frequently. Ready to oh, you're right. I, I like to assume that we are experienced enough rather than we are old enough. You know, I'm, I'm pushing 27 this year. The age is slowly getting to me, Parker, you know? self conscious here, little bit. I mean, I'm almost ready to retire. So that's, oh, I'm, you're getting, almost I'm getting up there in age, you know? I've been didn't checking my, you know, I'm Canadian, so I don't have one, but checking my 401k just for the sake of the joke. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> the one thing I will say about this, Wildcard obviously showed some, some very obvious struggles in their matchup against M80. Chalet and Oregon are 
do, I don't want to say, again, default maps, but neither of them are particularly wild. Yeah, you've got your standard Oregon and Clubhouse tend to be like the two maps that most teams can know quite well and be comfortable on, but Wildcard are a newer roster. They get a great start here in this round. One minute to go, and Vertical gets the very first pick. Gomez is down for the count. Gomez has been exceptional. He was one kill away from breaking double digits. Solely for his own, uh, solely for his own sake, he's hopeful that his team can win this, or lose this round, rather, and keep going on. OXG, though, looking for these five kills to send themselves home with a win. They beat Lois last week. They've got their work cut out for them now as they're down to a 2v4. Oh. Nice play by Newers, though. He's broken a dozen kills. Still in a strong spot. He can reposition over towards blue. He'll do just that. <laughs> down goes Spiker. An ace is possible right now for Newers. He just needs the last two kills. He's got Diaz working with him. There go the bees. Last bit of utility used from Bosco. It's him and Kanzen now at the back of the bomb site. Sequestered. Bosco killing Diaz. They trade out. Newers will need a 4K to make this work. He's just going to play time. Here's him coming. Time working against oh. him. <laughs> and they just waited out. No. Newers doesn't even need to do anything. OXG prevail. GG's go in the chat. And what a set of defenses we see from OXG. They look phenomenal on the second half of Oregon and they walk away with the win. Man, what a way to go out there. I mean, that was like a one round for wildcard. They had a finally like two opening picks. They had good map control. They walked down to the bomb set. Things are looking good. Bam, Newer shows up. Headshot left, right and center out of nowhere. Really shutting down that advancement there from the attack inside. And man, timer hitting zero. No comfort in the end. No 4K for Newer's. What a great heroic effort from him. Honestly, a good effort from most players on OXG. Gomez, of course, almost breaking double digits as well. Dream didn't have a lot of kills, but the ones he did have were quite high value. Yaga was probably, I would say, the quietest player. Maybe Diaz, but for me, I mean, if you've got Yaga being the quietest player on your team, things are typically going quite well. Can't really speak for the rest of OXG, but I would be relatively happy with that victory. With all of these newer rosters that we see, Beast Coast in the previous matchup, now wildcard here, you just got to get your game day reps in. You got to yeah. get these matches going so that you can gain more me meaningful experience because scrims aren't just going to cut it. Wild card, just like we saw from Beast Coast. They both might have lost today, but they've got an opportunity to improve as a team. That's it for our second matchup, though, Nick. We got three more to go, so we don't want to keep them from you. We'll be back in a couple minutes.
Another day, another OXG win on Oregon. Twice now, over two straight play days, they've only played the one map. They've won it twice, almost the same scoreline in both matchups. But it turns out you really just shouldn't take this team to this one particular map because they are the kings of that particular site. And they won basement attacks and defenses in tandem in order to make it happen for wild card absolute heartbreak because they were up three to one and six rounds in a row from OXG to close that one out. OXG certainly fixed some of their mistakes that we talked about. They kind of got that system in order a little bit more and are coming into their own. Unfortunately for Wildcard, it was a bit of deja vu. Almost the identical problems they had last week I mean, but it wasn't for a lack of trying, I guess. No, it wasn't for a lack at all. They obviously knew that they had an entry problem when it came to their first week. So they tried to substitute a Monty or an Osa in their rounds to be able to get that extra bit of a push into the site. But unfortunately for them, the players around the shield were just dropping like flies. Obviously, OXG was playing around it perfectly. They knew exactly how to respond to it. And Wildcard just still weren't able to get that foot in their door on attack. There were so many big moments too, especially in the start of this game. Through the first three rounds, there were three quad kills. It was Bosco <laughs> in the first, then it was Kanzen in the second, and then it was Newers in the third. I mean, it was a big hero plays to start the game. It was exciting. I was very stressed out, especially being an OXG fan, because oh, obviously Wildcard, Wildcard is the Wildcard is the most slow-paced, slow-burn defensive team, and especially on their basement defenses, they were just stalling out OXG, and it looked like a little stressful, obviously, when we were getting into that fourth round, but when it didn't come down to the basement, OXG was able to perform when it was on the top floor site, when it was on the middle floor site, they were able to lock down the extremities and go for those executes. You were saying in the back, after maybe like round two or something, oh man, I think Wildcard probably had this one in the back, and they do go up 3-1, what happened at the very end of that game where OXG switched gears? Well, thank you for exposing me to everybody. <laughs> I absolutely will, about every time. I'll, I'll, almost, I'll just air the green room team. throwing out OXG, but uh, <laughs> when it comes to Oregon, obviously, if you can get that 5-1 lead, like I said on the defense, it's so difficult to climb yourself back up when you have that much of a cushion. But Wildcard were not able to convert their defensive wins to the other sites besides the basements. That was obviously the more prominent thing. So when OXG was able to equalize it and it came to the attack, we knew OXG was in a good spot when it was 3-3 because they just have to play the site. Wildcard's not going to make that first entry into the site. And it wasn't an unreasonable statement you made yeah. back there. I mean, look at Wildcard and the way they came out of the gate swinging. It was the first three rounds. They had two quad kills. They were looking good. This time it was Kanzen and Bosco uniting for nine kills through two rounds. But then they hit a wall. Bosco and Kanzen did not find another kill until round like eight between the two of them, right? Yep. Things slowed down dramatically, not only for them, but for the whole team. I mean, hero plays cannot an efficient game win every time, unfortunately. So as electrifying as both of those plays might have been, the big highlight is on the guy who won the first and last rounds for OXG in this game, and that's Newers. We started with a 4K. It was just 4K City for those first couple rounds, and he opened up round three. Kitchen attack, perfect post-plant coverage. He even gets a drone hole kill in this round, and suddenly OXG are on the board. It was a beautiful play from Newers here. His new and improved role, obviously, since picking up Gomez, is he's put in these positions where he is able to pop off if given the opportunity to. He's playing that clutch potential, that flex role, where he's able to just sit back, let other players deal with the issues. And then once he's put in that position, him and Diaz side, to, side by side, usually one, one or the other, more often than not, is going to pop off. So if you give him the ability, he's going to have the room to make those plays, obviously, because, you know, we talked about that old crew versus the new crew. The new crew came in today. <laughs> oh, absolutely, right? And we also saw how Gomez got into the mix a little bit more today than he had last week, right? Last week, it was all about newers and it was all about DS. Today, Gomez found the scoreboard nine and six as well to match his teammate there. Last week, he was getting really active. We saw him on several rounds getting into small tower, trying to contest the entry of that Lowe's team right at the start. This time, he played a little bit more closer to the site, a little bit more restrained, and overall, that benefited him in the long run. Well, let's talk to the guy who he tried to have an interview with last week, and it unfortunately got cut short. Mitch, talk to me real quick about the two guys that were top frags last week. Both DS and Newers did great. They were top of the scoreboard again for a second consecutive Oregon win. How huge are the players from both those guys? I mean, those guys are both just incredibly talented players. And like, honestly, I'm lucky they're on my team because I would hate playing against you them. You really hate playing against them. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding, dude. <laughs> Mitch, 
I've been seeing I've been seeing a lot of fun coming out of you. I've been seeing your plays, and I just really wanted to know since picking up the two new guys, does that feel like there's a lot less pressure on you to be that backbone for the team now that you have like Diaz? And also, there's a lot more flexible ops that I'm seeing you on. Is that a new room to play with? <laughs> getting on the clash, you know? I saw you trying to make the turtle the turtle play on you know, the on the white stairs. I, I tried, but uh, Diaz stole my kills from me, so it's you know it happens. I tried to channel my inner fox, you know, 360. I hate it. Uh, <laughs> Everyone it, no, remembers that one cafe clip. Yeah, you can't escape it at this point. <laughs> no, it's, no. it's your whole identity. True. But well, let's put the eyes on Dream. Dream, is there like a lot less pressure now that you've gotten more flexible players, players that are able to be that backbone? Are are you feeling a lot more confident being? put in a position of like a secondary flex almost? Oh, a hundred percent. It's really nice. Like even just the work ethic out of the two new guys, like uh, the amount of time we've put in going into the season, like I could pick any up I want. And I know like they're going to be right there, like behind me with an idea or like we're, we're all like, we're like kind of like team IGLing almost. So uh, if someone sees a play, like I'm really confident that like we're making the right ones, we're making the right calls and it's been going like really good so far. Hey, Dream, Jay's Wills here. Another quick question for you, kind of touching on what Foxe brought up, kind of this new structure, because curious, what is this, or who is this central voice kind of leading the team in these moments, right? Obviously, the guy sitting next to me is no longer there. Is that style something that all of you are being a part of, or is it one specific person kind of leading the charge? Um, I'd say I'm about like 65, maybe 70% of the voice that comes from the team. And then the the rest of it is just uh, like Gomez, Diaz, Yag, New, like calling what they see on drones, like if they think we can make a play here. And it's really just about like trusting your teammates and like going with the flow and like how the round is progressing and then making plays off of like what the enemy does. Why so Oregon it's, it's, two times in a row out of curiosity? Um, well, uh, people just keep taking us to Oregon. Personally, we prepped a lot. I would like to play a different map. But hey, if you guys want to keep losing on Oregon, like I got the best gunners in the game. They're on my team, so we can keep going to Oregon. I'm cool with that. Well, it was a very good shot that maybe you play a different map when you play the second game later on in the Fingers day. Fingers crossed. So what, in, <laughs> what are you going to do between now and then? You, there were some times last stage where we were playing two maps back to back. That was just the standard that most NAL teams had to worry about in 2023. We're doing it again here. So what did you do back then to prepare when you had two best of ones to play in a row? Um, well, this best one was a little bit harder to pre prepare for, I guess, for Beast Coast because we didn't find out we were playing it till like two days ago or whatever. Um, but I, I think it was just, we just do our prep in between the maps. We just talk about like, hey, we're going to go here. Like, this is what we think they're going to do, how we think we can counter them. And if we don't have info, it's just, we got to just got to play our game. Like, don't let them control the map. Like, just play how we, how we play and went out. All right, well, I guess we'll find out if we're actually playing Oregon three straight times for OXG, given the game in just a couple hours. Mitch, we'll see you then. Thank you. All right. Do we see Oregon again? They've won it twice. Surely we don't see it three times in a row, right? No chance. Surely. No chance. Beast Coast. I, Surely. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of footage on them. You know, I could see Beast Coast fumbling. I mean, yeah. obviously, look at how they played today. The They've tried to play like SSG. They might try to play like Los at, at the end of the day. <laughs> do you, you think know? they bot we'll review in the see. next hour and a half? They go over the bot, see what they can They could, next. maybe. No, I don't I don't think they're going to go to Oregon another time. No, they got a lot of time to figure it out. And the key thing here, there's still two games up until then, and one of them coming up next. M80 and Sonics, I have no idea how this bad boy is about to go. We'll see you in just a sec.
Some called it the most surprising move of the offseason. He was the third highest rated player of the recent Six Invitational in Sao Paulo, a staple of one of the two best rosters in North America, but left that team for what he thought was a better opportunity. But life comes at you fast because now he's back in a lobby with that squad, just not with them, instead against them. Sonics and M80 is game three of this day of the North American League. I'm Jacob, he's Jays Wills, he is Fox A. Citizen is back in a Sonics lobby, but he is not playing with the Sonics. He's playing on M80 with Spoit on his team. What the hell is this timeline, guys? Whew. I mean, if you would have told me this a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> I would have been more surprised that Citizen had left Europe at that point. Like a couple of years ago when he was playing on Na'Vi, he was, he was winning in Tokuname. Now he's in NA doing this the road. The road to get to this point has been ridiculous, but I love that we are here. I mean, playing with a chip on your shoulder, maybe just a little one, that's got to feel good. Yeah. I think the only American on this lineup right now is Ambi. Ambi and Merck. And Adam. Andy three, and Merkin. Uh, three Americans. <laughs> they, they keep coming in. Three Americans. Three Americans. Oh, good grief. I, I was going to say, we can't... Eventually, there will be an M80 versus Los game where there's not a single American that in will the lobby. Be wild. That one will come up North far American later. League, yeah. not a single one born in this country. Oh, man. Imports are really good and out of hand. At I least for, for M80, it turned out really good last week for Sonics. They dumpstered Dark Zero. So both teams coming off a really good high with the wins they had last week. Yeah, the statistics both looked very promising for both teams. Obviously, M80 was on the third for both attack and defense, Sonics being at the top because their game was by far the most blowout, which we didn't necessarily expect to be that much of a one-sided win. Dark Zero was supposed to put up more of a fight. And I know we're going to talk about their problems later, but Sonics made it look easy. And that was supposed to be the match Again, of the week. Against of the week. Troy and Bolo and NJR is not supposed That's to be That's not supposed look. to happen yeah. at all. But it's such a good look for the Sonics. Already, with these two new additions, you come out of the gate swinging hard against a pretty rival team, you could say. Yep. That's a great way to begin. It's time for a good old heavyweight bout here in game three. So let's talk about M80 first. They had their game against Wildcard in their opener on Chalet last week, and it was a really good showing. Seven to four, dead even first half, but then they locked down their defenses, only lose one round, and they generally looked pretty good on most sides here. M80 is one of those teams also trying to just dial things in a bit because they've been a big anomaly as far as the NA League is concerned. Amazing performances domestically, not so much internationally. And they have their sights set on the absolute peak. They want to get to a major final. They want to win a major. And to do that, they need to continue to build on what we saw from them in week one. And they tried to pick up a style of team that I would say is the first time that they went for, obviously getting more supportive players. And I think that showed a lot last week with the droning and the way that they were taking time, obviously relying a lot on cameraman for those last couple of seconds of execute, especially against a very turtle heavy wild card. You'd love to see the leadership step up and be able to carry M80 through just that little extra step, especially in those last couple of seconds. Well, everything worked out really good in game one, but let's see if Kino thinks that this so far is actually going to surpass just what they did in the first week. We caught up with him real quick. Hi, my name is Kino, and I'm a professional R6 player for M80. M80's image last year was, was pretty bad. I'm a big part of it. That's one of the reasons why I got benched. Uh, I didn't help the team much, but uh, I, I definitely want to change that. I'm not going to put my hands on any expectations, on any goals or anything like that. I'm just going to, I'm just here to play my game. I'm just here to, you know, have some fun with my teammates. Having a, a roster moves is, is always very stressful. I mean, there's a lot to work on every, every time, but I'm looking forward to playing with them. I'm looking forward because it's a brand new team. It's a fresh start and uh, it's another chance for us to prove ourselves. I think the new players are adjusting pretty well. I already kind of knew the system and how uh, how we're gonna work it. Cameraman's English is, is pretty good. He's been learning like specific like in-game phrases and stuff, and he's been catching on very, very, very quick. Like every day he gets better. I'm very familiar with the coaching staff, with the split, uh, and adjusting with the new players. It's, it's been very easy, I'm not gonna lie. Since we, we don't have much time, we, we have to focus a lot on our on our chemistry, on, on our team play, because we've never really played with each other besides me and Spoit. Uh, it's a completely new roster that I haven't played with each other. So so it's it's hard in a sense, but at the same time, like it's enough time. We just have to grind every day and and make sure we're putting in putting in enough work before our NES starts. 
Yeah, it's high praise from Kino about his teammates while also still acknowledging it's a little hard to figure out what to do with a brand new team with a couple players you've never actually gotten lobby time with. But for him and his teammates on Chalet last week, everything looked like it went pretty well, especially for one of his teammates, Noodle, who's also starting up his NAL tenure as of this stage. And we wanted to compare him against the one of the newest additions to the Sonics. He would have been the newest had they not made SI changes. It's him and Ambi for this game, Fox. I love this comparison because both players obviously are playing a similar role on the attack, being the main entry for the team. Obviously, Sonics had a huge blowout. Ambi was a big part of that, being able to get in, get those kills. But Noodle, you may look at his statistics and you look at his entry and you're like, how is he entering for his team? How is he getting them through that door without necessarily getting any kills? And because, I'll tell you why, he is specializing on just getting the space for his team, especially as the Buck opening up these angles, getting into these difficult corners and adding a little bit of opening so that the player behind him can get that trade successfully every time. And it's nice to see both players having different ways of finding success on a similar role. It doesn't show that there's one specific way on entering. You can create space. Obviously, if you get the kill, it's that much easier. Ambi on Clubhouse. Your buck is going to thrive there every single time, and he did that so well. Huge reason they ended up taking that win. So let's do a, d a deep dive into why Ambi was able to get so much of that pressure, and it's because the Sonics just look like they really haven't skipped a beat in spite of picking up two players that are brand new for this stage. They won against Dark Zero, and it was a drubbing. That match went lopsided way sooner than any of us expected. SQ just looked like they pushed Dark Zero until they couldn't handle it anymore, capped off by that brilliant play from Ambi and G in the very last round of club, this thing went haywire for DZ quick. This team set up really well with the great information, especially coming from Adam and Gio, obviously giving everybody the information that they need, the guidance that they need, and obviously the, we have to acknowledge Merc just ramming straight through Dark Zero. <laughs> Whenever a wall was put in front of their way, their next op, their next step was to just go straight through it. They didn't pause, they didn't take a moment. The thing with this team is that you add someone like Merc into the mix here, and you've got to wonder, how does he, and how does Adam, who he brought with him, right, fit into the whole picture? And this comes in with all the changes that we're talking about that this team is going under. Yeah. But it's a big moment, right? Switching in for Citizen, kind of taking up that maybe a one-for-one -one swap is a bit of aggressive, but filling that void that he left. You want to watch that Geo Clutch again real quick? I say we watch the Geo Clutch one oh, more please. time. The very, very end, he is playing Clash. Ambi has a little bit of cover on him up in CCTV. But this whole thing, the way Geo just keeps his cool and sticks the defuse, just shows why this guy's won a hammer before. The way he was able to reload and not get punished is baffling to me that they weren't pushing onto them. Obviously, it felt like they were playing a little too scared in this position. And then Geo was able to hit the nice headshot onto the player on red. and. Unfortunately, Bolo oh, was knocked no. downstairs. There was nothing that he could do. He just had to watch it happen. But just Geo being able to stay alive, gather that information, be able to constantly put the pressure on the player behind green box, holding everybody down. I mean, the information, I feel like, put them in the best spot, but Geo capitalized on that 1v3. That doesn't happen without the pressure that Ambi gives him earlier on in that clutch, too. So it's everybody working in synergy with one another. And so far, we're hopeful that that sort of trend can continue. But as we keep moving in, we got to talk about the guy who defected sides and the hole that he's now left on the Sonics team. Citizen left for greener pastures. Merc is now in his place. Jonah, how significant is a change like this? I mean, I love this storyline for Citizen here because when Sonics were looking to kind of regroup and change things around, right? Putting Grixer on the bench, bringing someone in his spot, that's when Citizen gets the chance to move to M80 and he jumps at that opportunity. Some would regard this as a controversial move for the Sonics too, bringing into players that may not necessarily fit with their system. They had a fantastic performance at SI. Why do you need to change that? Well, they're looking to shift things up and Merc could be that solution. He could be the solution. Obviously, he was a solution last week, especially against Dark Zero. He was able to just consistently be one step ahead of Dark Zero. Just nothing was really stopping him getting in his way. The confidence was, was the biggest thing that was leading him through. And I think that comes with the lack of pressure on Merck's shoulders. He just has to come in, do his job. And when he has to fill in the shoes of Citizen, he's not necessarily that far off from being as talented as Citizen is. Is it to say that he's meant to be a one-for-one -one replacement for Citizen? Or is that not the way that you think he's shaping up on this team? I think Merck has such a 
in-depth play style and what he can accomplish. Obviously, when he was on TSM, he was able to play a plethora of roles, and I love that he was able to show that last week playing Mav a lot. So he isn't necessarily being the one-for-one -one operator for a citizen, but I mean, he's been doing a great job at just flexing his position. Chalet and Club, by the way, both taken off the board first. And we're seeing Oregon played again. Obviously, neither of these guys played Oregon. So now they're getting a fresh start on a map that, again, I seem to remember Sonics being really, really good at this map for some particular reason. What do we think of the pick? I mean, they're good at all the maps, no? I mean, Clubhouse I mean, and Oregon, obviously, what the heck? Good at they're all insane. Of them. No, but in all seriousness, right, an amazing performance on Clubhouse. That will translate here to Oregon quite a bit. I mean, you do have a lot of hard breach focus. And what they showed in that steamrolling over DZ is that they can adapt that play style a little bit based on what their opponents throw at them. DZ didn't adapt enough. And that is something that we're gonna have to see their opponents today deal with. If M80 can stay loose, if the leadership, right, of cameraman can kind of step up and carry them through, I think we're gonna have a good fight on our hands. But to counter your point, I think it's really hard for you to just push through an obstacle when it comes to Oregon, dropping a hatch. It makes things very isolating. So it's gonna be a new obstacle for Sonics to have to tackle. I would agree, I think they're pretty set up really well for this <laughs> game, but it is still gonna be a new challenge in itself. Who do you think takes this map, Fox? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with Sonics. They just looked so strong last week. All right, so everybody on the desk, by the way, almost was totally wrong for two straight games. So we'll Not have to see how, how we correct course here. What, what did Laxon pick, Jonah? I actually don't have that in front of me right now. I got. I, I was picked. waiting for the call. I'm pretty sure he picks on. Okay, pretty, pretty sure, sure he picks, picks on. I mean, okay, the, the guy didn't it. bring me up backstage. I was waiting for him to explain his reasoning. I'm okay with it because if we're all wrong, I'm still in the lead. At this point, yeah, you're totally right. Here's the here's the dealio. At some point, you will get knocked off that pedestal, unless you don't, in which case Jesse will be really pissed that you won the title and he wasn't even I'm here running right. out of here with the belt after this, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yep, good point. All right, it's Oregon time. It's M80 and Sonics, and it's Parker McKay and Nicholas Fordson courtside. Oh, we've upgraded. We're playing on a court now. This is exciting, Nick. This is so exciting. We do have a battle of the Titans here, obviously. And I'm intrigued to see these teams with my own set of eyes. Obviously, the matches that we saw last week were quite surprising. Sonic's destroying DZ was not something I had on my bingo card. I mean, this to me is the match that they've... I mean, it's just like there's so much firepower, there's new players, there's new rosters, a new look for both these two teams. I almost want to say it's a shame that it's going to be happening on Oregon of all maps. Like, I want to see something else. Voto, social prediction, dead even, 50-50, because, yeah, both teams are looking very good. That's a tough one, honestly. I, I, Looking right now at predictions and the overwhelming majority said Sonics. In fact, almost everybody voted the same way. I'm looking right now at every single prediction here. Wow. One mind, hive mind. Yeah, I mean, somebody set the trend and then the rest of us were just a bunch of lemmings following them off the proverbial uh, predictions cliff. Hmm. Ying banned out as we now get into the operator ban and it will be exciting as to how M80 and Sonics tackle this map. If you tuned in just about an hour ago, you would have known that the wildcard OXG match was played on this exact same map. Operator bans though already looking a touch bit different with Monty being banned out by... M80. Yeah. Aid will go as well. The Ying ban is quite common. She is the most banned attacker right now. As for defenders, Azami and Kaid have led the way into today's play day. We've actually seen a lot of Azami, and we will see Azami here as well. Hold on a second. What is going on with that picture of Warden? Why does he look? What is? <laughs> oh yes, yeah. he doesn't look. He doesn't look well. Let's put it that way. He doesn't look. Uh, that boy don't look right. Oh boy. What is going on with that warden picture? I think I just saw a debate on uh, on Twitter not too long ago about uh, someone made that same like observation. It's like what's happening with this particular picture of this operator. I've seen it before, but you're right. It does not look uh, 100%. Also, this is the classic uh, M80 Monty Ben. It's not because G was good at Monty. Right? It's because Kino shouldn't play the Monty. So this is like, it's a genius ban, really. Maybe are buffing themselves by removing Monty from play. And if Sonics, they want to play the Monty, that's like a, it's like, it's like a bonus. Mm. Gone for play. Five seconds to insertion. All right. All right. All right, all right, all right. 
Attackers Heading into today, Clubhouse was the most picked map with Oregon not too far behind. We started the day off with one Clubhouse, and now we have two more Oregons, which means that so far we have seen four Clubhouses and four Oregons and one lone chalet, my friend. This is one of the, I guess you could say, downsides of a best of one is that when there are a lot of newer teams in the league, they tend to go to these default maps, which we've already talked about every single time it comes up. Clubhouse in Oregon are those default-esque maps. You're right. No one to though. Lids in play. Finger boost. Ink, you know, goes aggressive, but no one's there on the defensive side. Lids, of course, but the shield rework is... It's a quick boy. Like before, you can sprint. You can mate enough from a safe distance. No hip fire, however, and your feet are always exposed. Even when crouch walking, you're standing still as a shield player, your toes will be sticking out. So... When we tend to watch these new shield players in this season, they're always constantly moving, jiggling back and forth Reloading. because you're no longer safe by standing. Of course, Skidoo takes big tower control. He's gonna vibe out, hold that staircase passively. Maybe they want map control, they want everything. Lobby, freezer, big tower. Then join out the bomb side and then figure out where their approach is gonna be going from. Defense, all about utility. Simon, like you said, Parker, open and use this round by Ambi. All fine positions. Goyo Fire from Adam, gonna stall out the attack, and of course, one step push comes through, the fire will be going out with as well. The changes to this M80 roster dominated a lot of the conversation in the offseason because of just how big of a change it was. I mean, you brought in Cameraman all the way from Brazil. You decided to keep Kino on this roster, even though he'd been benched at SI. Spoit is technically the one long-standing member. I suppose you could throw Kino in there as well. Noodle brought over from playing in the Middle East. Citizen brought over from the Sonics. And of course, technically, if you want to split hairs, none of the players on this team are technically North Americans. This Kino plays under the Brazilian flag as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So... You talked in the previous matchup about how Ash's charges now break mirror windows. You could have seen it right there. M80 using one of those Ash charges just to deny a window from Sonics. This is very interesting round so far. 20 seconds in and it looks like M80's changed up where they're going to attack on three different times. Now they'll go through Freezer. Rexon, the first one to engage on the cameraman. Cameraman wins that duel though. Ambi punished by bomb chassis but not before sonics can actually get on the board and basically kill everybody except for kino over by blue he takes the head off of adam he runs out of time sonics will win the very first round based on the clock but my my it sure seemed like m80 took their sweet time getting into the bomb site no i will say though it was a very quick adaptation from m80 when things didn't really go the way they wanted to they were clearly wanting to go for a bottom laundry take into the bomb site but they did it with like 30 or so seconds left. The moment that the smokes came out from the attacking side and they were gonna storm the side itself, guess what? Defense popped the Goyo canister. That, that fire lasts for 20 seconds. Attackers need to locate but and the impressive thing for Medi, they immediately swapped the freezer. Now, like no seconds were wasted, they just changed the plan on the fly. But the issue is, when you're changing the plan like that last second, it's not gonna be perfect. There were some gaps there, there are player positions that weren't really hit. The coordination is necessarily not 100%, but again, when you change with so few seconds left, that's the downside, that's the kind of price that you pay. But Sonic's playing good utility, that's all that it is. The mirror windows, the Goyo canisters, it's about trying to problem solve on the attack with utility. When you play the Blitz, you lose self-destruction, for example. That Blitz could have theoretically been a forest. Then you can deal with all that stuff during the middle of the round, so that when you want to build that execute, the Goyo canisters have already been burned. That's not going to be an issue for you. It's a lesson learned, though, from a midi. I'm sure next time the attack basement, that's not going to be a problem. It's those small adaptations that we need to keep track of as we see those bombs are being played. about the drone operators as well in the previous match that tend to pop up on Oregon, whether it be a Flores, whether it be a Twitch, whether it be a Brava. No drone ops being brought, but instead we will see Grim quite regularly. 
Sophia now riding along with Citizen is an operator that has tons of potential in the meta, but is just right now outclassed in a lot of ways by other operators. We'll see how Citizen uses this Polish op. Got that closer road. Oh, okay. All right. Work the wall bang. Just like that takes down Citizen. And now we spoke about Bosco earlier in our previous matchup. I love seeing him back. I'm a big believer of Merc, actually. When TSM had that ASI miracle run, Merc was just running over people. Then we see him in wildcard with two master changes later on after TSM running over people. Now Noodle running the free as well. Gonna kill onto Rexen. He's also one of those aggressive entry type players. Or Noodle, Citizen, pretty much anybody in the server to be fair, can just be popping off. So at 4v5, at 4v4, it doesn't matter. You can never count either side out here, especially not on Oregon, where it needs to be very hectic, very chaotic out of nowhere. Exactly. Action, action can hurry in... Action can happen in a hurry. Sorry, words are very challenging today for some reason, yeah. I think uh, it's... It's like an eclipse or there's a full moon or something. Something in the water, I'm not sure. Attic opened up now. As M80 want to dig their claws into this bomb site, Merc doesn't know that Kino is posted up in a spot that Citizen was on just earlier. That's the opening in closet and will now get swung on, losing the duel to Adam, who sacrifices over half of his HP for that kill, a worthy sacrifice. Still at top white stairs, still looking for more. 3v3. M80 will need to retrieve that diffuser. Ooh. Nice shot from Spoit onto Geo, who's playing by the bunks near Big Window. Bees will go out, and Ambi is cornered next to that bomb chassis. Cameraman letting his utility do the work, but also wants to play it at the same time, and will just continue toy with the window. Adam outguns Spoit. A second kill coming in now from the same player on Sonic's Noodle. Bell into action. Down goes the Warden. It's all up to Adam to clutch out at top of white, being watched by Cameraman. Lots of damage being done, but Adam swings and gets the kill. He'll head for home, oh. but he loses it out to Noodle after a brief bit of hesitation. M80 win the round. 50-50 gamble there. Is he planting left or is he planting right? Of course you'd assume he's planting on that default location. He's got to be on the right-hand side. No, you are wrong. You picked the wrong one. But I will say Cameraman with a great read strategically in that round for the attack. Rotate to Kid Storm's window, and the beasts go out. And just like we see demos being used sometimes to kind of isolate players and stop them from aggressing and moving around the map, so was Scrim in that round. Cameraman with Anki Storm Appel for 40 seconds straight, who's using one B at a time, just locking down the Warden inside of Kid Storm's. And when the plan kind of fell apart, he Cameraman just said, hey, Noodle, just swing the Kid Storm rotate. I got the red thing on him. Just, uh, you win that gunfight, trust me. And once you win that gunfight, you can plan inside of Kiss instead. Last guy stuck on white staircase. That was just problem solving 101 from M80 by understanding the player positions from Sonics and seeing, hey, these guys messed up. They got a retake now from a staircase They're in a really poor position. And even though Cameraman might have over aggressed in the window, got you know, taken out way too early in the round, he still set his team up for a successful 1v1. Great stuff all around. Get a second round already. This is exactly the kind of situation you're gonna find yourself in on Oregon attack. Not going down tier two, not going down tier three, but get one of those rounds early on to keep things with Sonic started off really strong there. Merc in particular, the one player that you wanted to give some credit to. A lot of impact upstairs. He's playing that spot now. M80, by the way, getting very aggressive here. Something to punish Attic, or at least try to. Spoid had an altercation in Split, and then as well over towards Attic, but didn't find anything for his troubles. Instead, he'll go back, survive for the time being. Do you think that a lot of this comes down to controlling the pace? If you let Sonics run over you, they will run over you. M80, despite, you know, they fall in gunfights sometimes to Merc's aggression, they're not afraid to fight back. They're gonna keep fighting back. And they, because they already got one organ round in the first two, they can now risk things a little bit more. They got one in the back, right? They can now have some fun with this, make an aggressive play if they want to. They can take those risks. It's only when you start facing like, you know, oh, we're down on match point. If we lose this round, it's over. That's when you're kind of scared to make this heroic. Right now, not the case. 
Rather was an action there on a hack and the batteries, not successful. You find the drone. And then 80. They were quick in the beginning. They got inside the building. They got into a confrontation. But since then, they've mostly been droning, rotating out the map here. They kind of prioritize that big power portion of the map. They have no OSA. They have no shoes in the attack. They have no easy way to establish a plant here. But not a try for it. Flash will go out to accompany the line scan that had just gone before that from Spoit, who, as we saw early on, was in the building within the first 15 to 20 seconds of this round. A little bit over a minute to go. Zem80 gets ever closer to this meeting bomb site. They know there's one player in there. They'd seen bullet tracers from kitchen door as well as Geo is prone on the ground. I don't know if Kino is expecting this. First casualty of this round is Merc as Noodle eliminates him. Like surely Kino hears this, right? Like <laughs> it's very loud. Geo is just army crawling his way. He's a worm. Geo is a worm and he's doing worm things on the ground. Unfortunately for him, the sun came out and the worm dried up and now the worm is dead. Ooh. Sonic's losing all of their duels. M80 a single kill away from winning this one flawlessly. Adam denies that. Only good for one kill though as the diffuser had gone down. M80 hopples Sonic's in that round winning on the tertiary bomb site and going up 2-1. Damn, a good look there, especially Kino on the intro of all things. I mean, Geo is one of these players that is very, he's very special. He's very unique. He loves to play positions where he looks absolutely doomed and then make it work. And in that particular round, he made it work for a very long time. He was a worm instead of meeting in an impossible position. No way in, no way out, just stuck in a corner. And he ended up swinging here prone peeking because the bees were coming. The second he gets spotted by the bees, he is definitely doomed. He lost the 50-50 gunfight, after that Kino gets a double, he gets the plant down, etc. Things fall apart. But Geo is just one of those players where he loves playing. Bomb when you have the number you do, Ambi, Adam, Rex, and Merc around Geo, he is also the guy to put in those positions. Where you just like, it's all about just waiting, being patient, and utilizing your position. Not so much your aim. Let the aimers do the aiming, and let you do the braining. That's really all what it's about right now, playing the right players in the right roles. M80 up already now, as you said, 2 to 1. They're gonna blow up their attacker lineup twice now in the attacker repeat phase. They're showing us some blitz. They're considering an Osa for a short moment there. Now they're in the Cavatao and Dokubi instead. M80 clearly favoring the roam clear by playing the Dokubi here. Thinking, hey, there's gonna be active members from the first floor or top floor from Sonics, and they would be correct. Gio again in this very front floor position, roaming top floor with Solis with pretty much no real support. It's just him against the world. And he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's That's not the, the only one. <laughs> He'll be joined the great beyond by, with Merc. I mean, that's great. It's just, again, the Dogebi attacker repick there. They just popped the call. They sprint into the building. And the thing is, when you play a pro league round like this, it's all about timings in the server. You tend to know as a player where the enemy is going to be at certain times in the round. 2 minute 11, they can be at this spot. 1 minute 30, they can be in this position. There are certain timings like, oh, on the basement uh, room clear, you're supposed to beat the, reach the hatches, the bomb side, at about 1 minute 20 to 1 minute 40 seconds in the round. If you break that timing by just sprinting to the building, you saw Geo, he's on his scanner. He's looking for drones. The round just began, but because the Meteor is so quick to the punch, he gets caught off guard, he dies for free. And now I'm Meteor, they're actually all by the bomb side. Two outside blue, cameraman bottom main stairs, might just make that last phone call and just go beside here. Two of the remaining players on Sonics have yet to register a kill as well. That is a troubling situation as Ambi and Rexon have been held off of the score sheet. Adam looked very good in the previous round. You're going to need a very strong performance here. A citizen is reduced. Ambi trying to retake laundry stairs. He gets swatted away. Now it's Rexon looking towards Ebox. Adam and Freezer on a sliver of HP kills Kino. Now it's Rexon to get on the board. Sonics putting these last two players in their positioning to good use, though Rexon is now reduced to almost rubble. Might as well use that Nitro Cell. You don't know how much more time you have in this round. Rexon playing by this bomb chassis. He's being watched by Blue, also over by Pillar, flattened by Noodle. Adam, last man standing inside a freezer. Smart glasses on. Nice shot on the camera, man. Goodness gracious. The Nitro Cell looked like it was ready to be released. Adam now has to work against the timer being planted, the diffuser being planted, timer running. But it's Spoit standing pat. 
over on Pillar, and we have a. <laughs> We have, we are looking inside the minds of these M80 gamers. M80 on attack on Oregon. Showing yep. off some serious firepower and strategic depth. All played by them. I mean, it's, it's looking really good. It's, uh, it's, uh, you know, Oregon has the nickname of Oregon because there are so many matches that are just like a dread to watch. They're slow, nothing happens. It's the same stuff. Four. And then we see these kinds of rounds where a team will just storm the building and there's pretty much action the entire way through or something's at least going on. And and with that, Sonics will call a technical timeout. They feel overwhelmed. They feel that they're getting run over, which is exactly what is going on. Unless this timeout just like makes things click for them, they get like a 2-4 or a 3-3 three, three half on defense. I am slowly gonna start counting them out. Because again, this is a tag organ. This is the quote unquote harder side. And maybe they make it look easy three rounds in a row. Speaks volumes about this M80 team and the potential that they had. Because they are, like so many of the other teams that we see here in the NAL, a brand new squad. All three of our matches that we have seen up to this point have involved a brand new team. Beast Coast assembled right before the start of this stage wild card doing the same thing a completely different look for these teams and now it's m80 with a brand new look i mean you could extend that and say that lg and sonics have new looks too because of the changes they made but the core is still there their identity is still there our next matchup that will follow this is dark zero versus space station you know those teams you know those players they made very minimal changes in the offseason technically dz didn't make a change in the offseason because they locked in their roster before si space station dropped hotten and picked up iconic off of the old m80 squad you're saying is bobo plays next i'll give it a rest that's all i need to know and i'll be there no matter what now you know what's funny hold on you know what's funny this is the north american league there are more British players in the NAL than there are Canadian players right now. <laughs> Spirits and Canadian are the only two Canadian players actively competing in the NAL. Whereas you've got Nave Citizen and Noodle, who Noodle splits his allegiance between Poland and yeah. Great Britain. But either way, we still consider that as an active player. I thought that was quite it's interesting. It's a skill issue, really. That's what it comes down to. Can buy talent. Canada, you know, don't have much of it apparently in Siege. Ooh. It's weird. Only the one of the most iconic people to ever come, you know, compete in this game's name is literally Canadian. Oh, he's the he's the outlier, you know, he's like the, oh, okay. the exception to the rule here. Now we gotta talk about the clash, by the way, because another team, three for three, have brought out clash here. First yeah, match up, second it's match Geo. Up. Yeah, it's Geo Geo, but still it's clash clash. It's like we don't see this all that often. And it's again, every team does it in a different way, on a different side. Break the works there. Working off the intel that Geo gave him as well in the clash. They get the kill, they have map control, and Geo can retake that cause of position if he wants to at any point because he's playing the clash operator. The reason why I say it's Geo is because does it surprise you that Geo is playing a shield operator? No, no it shouldn't. It at this current point in time, if Geo does not play a single shield operator in a match, it is something that we might want to note. <laughs> He does a great job of being useful, but again, like enabling the teammates around him. That's why he plays those shield ups. Also, why Monty was literally banned by MAD as a countermeasure. And you know, if you're getting run over by your opponents on, on when, they are, when they are on the attack, why not slow things down by playing the clash, by playing Melusi? Sonics have changed their approach right now on defense, saying, "Hey, we want to fight the players with utility because we're losing gunfights." There goes the final EE1D in the clash. We'll slow down Spoit's advancement through Trophy. Nice uh, shot onto Merc falling around, but the shield will absorb all these blows. Oh! Geo turns around and makes it work with the super shorty. But Sonics only have Rexon left with the diffuser running against him. To make his way out of dorms, he dies at Kino's hands. The timeout does not work. M80 look unstoppable at the moment. They do. I mean, again, adaptations are great. It means that there's an active, uh, you know, communication on the side of Sonic's being like, hey guys, this is not working. Let's try and change it up. 
But Imedi, they're adapting as well. They read the play. They see the weakness. They say 3 to 1, go for a plant. The only one that can walk into us is a clash with the shield up. They can't stop the diffuser. They can maybe get a kill like we saw. The little 180, 180 again, shotgun switch. But that doesn't matter if the bomb goes down. It doesn't matter if you win your gunfights elsewhere on the bomb site, which Imedi, once again, they do correctly. And now you're in a very difficult position if you're softness. You're losing base and bomb site, which is your primary. You're losing kit storms, your secondary bomb site. You almost feel as if you should play tertiary bomb site because nothing else is working. But statistically, that is also a terrible idea. So nothing's working. Sonic's just gotta go for broke. And again, it might just come down to minuscule things like who wins a gunfight, those 50-50 engagements. But when you have so much firepower up against you, it is hard to just say, hey, just be better. Because you're up against really strong players yourself in the lineup of MAD. Once again, it's basement. Things will stay the same from the attack inside. Always still could be. Sometimes the blitz, always the grim. That's like the key operators. However, it's different players playing those operators. Cameraman, he played, for example, grim on opposite attack. On basement, he plays Ibana. Now it's Noodle who plays grim instead. Citizens on Doki. Kino, of course, stays as a shield operator. Nothing changes there. But M80, they're showing how flexible they are with this roster, despite it being very new for them still. It's the back and forth between these teams as well, where you have a really good week and then you have some very obvious struggles the last week. Sonics crushing DZ 7-2 on Clubhouse was something that I don't think a lot of us expected. Sure, maybe Sonics can win, but by that scoreline, that's really something else. M80 eating wild card. On Shelley wasn't a terrible surprise either. But again, this M80 team, if you go back to the old roster, was always spoken of so highly, but had very obvious issues with coordination and just overall team chemistry. I will say that M80 are excelling right now, but through these two games that we've seen, I don't know if it's because M80 are looking strong as a team or if it's just because they have such a skilled roster of individuals. Fair point. But the, the question is then, does it really matter? At least for right now. Domestically, this is enough. But as you said, M80, they were a great team commission before. They made every single event, basically. But they would bottom out, going home in groups, getting first rounded, and that's not good enough. It's why they blew up the roster, kicking every single player but sport, and of course, Kimi returning. They want to do better at majors, at international events. So, you need domestic success to qualify, then you gotta do more. Individual performance can beat Sonics right now in the server, but you need that great teamer to excel at a bigger stage and against bigger opponents. Right now, it's a great look. Great pace, it's a great round from Idiot once again. Shattering mirror windows, dealing with utility, opening up hatches, roam clearing quickly and effectively. They got those score canisters popped, they got 40 seconds, they got Beast and Pop Noodle, they got Keen on the Monty, they have no phone call from Dokkabee. So intel will be limited based off sound, Bees here from Noodle, they gotta spot some players to work with. Adam's gonna get lead off pick with 30 seconds to go. He's looked like the best player on Sonics round by round, but the rest of the team coming into action. Adam with a nice kill. Looking for number 10. This boy taking down Merc. This boy's the only one left standing, and it's Adam to break double digits. -la 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 -la, he says as he runs away, and Sonics <laughs> will win the round. Just like that, they finally figure out their problems. But again, it's that basement bomb side. It's so hard to attack against. It comes down to a lot of factors. And Sonics, they held on this time. They get a 2 4 half on Oregon, starting on defense, however. This upcoming round, the first in the side swap, very important. This is the moment where Medi will either build a significant lead going 5 and 2, or Sonics, they start mounting that comeback and working their way back. Round by round, one at a time. Because that's how you gotta look at this as a player. It doesn't matter if it's 0-0, zero, 5-5, zero, five, five, or whatever. Just one round at a time, until that victory or loss screen comes in front of you, and then it's over. Fuse. Let's, um, Hold let's on, hope that's not locked change. in yet. Oh. <laughs> let's hope that changes. <laughs> Come on. What do you have to spoil it? You know, I died to a fuse puck this uh this morning. 
in uh, in seed. Doesn't happen very often, but uh, you just get you can be quite uh, quite quite good sometimes, you know. You stand on site, minding your own business, fox come flying across the goddamn room, bang, you're dead. Just like that. We've seen flash being played today a lot. Why not some fuse gameplay as well? You can now use them on reinforced walls and hatches. There must be something you can do with that. Also, uh, I think Citizen with a small counterplay here. He's sitting in the middle of classroom on a mute jammer, by the way. Then you're expecting a Dokubi to be played. They make the call and they go in fast. Then Kino is baiting it by playing meeting. So, pretty uh, maybe a specific like counter strategy preparing here or like a like a pocket strat from the defense. Doesn't work out. No Dokubi, no phone call, and he goes in top. Ambi's still searching for his kill. That was the first yeah. half in the books, by the way, where M80 prevailed 4-2. Now we'll see how they can muster a defense on a map that has a distinction of being very defender-sided through much of its history, especially since the rework. Retooling Oregon. Try and make it a bit fresh, maybe not as stale as it was after, you know, six, seven years of being played at the top level. But you got to expect M80 will be happy with this side swap. Still playing very aggressively. Kino, you blink and you miss it. Suddenly he's up to eight kills. He's a name that we actually haven't been saying all that often. Might just be because the action has been oh, no. breaking out in such quick bursts. Ami thought that Kino was the main adversary for him, but instead it was Citizen in this position who's now punished by Geo. Ami will go yet another round without a kill. Disappointing performance for a player that Quite literally turned 18 right before SI. Played some of the hardest matches in Rainbow Six Esports as his debut. They did decently well at SI as well. Oh, he's done great so far. Definitely proving himself to be like worthy of playing a first play of each, but grading one for one always favors defense here. Because again, you have even numbers, but you got the bomb side. Citizen, yeah, he's a great player. He's two and five right now. So statistically, not a bad player to lose compared to that of Kino, for example, as you said, sitting on eight kills. And time also is a problem. Oreo canisters, they're gonna stall for 20 seconds. You got C4 and cameraman as well. And Sonics don't look like they got the setup ready just yet. They only got 30 seconds. They gotta go. Gridlock, Stingers, Spice Fangs, Head Drops, here they are. Noodle a kill for M80, but the numbers will equalize because Adam, whose name we will keep saying over and over again, proving his worth on this Sonics roster through this matchup. Merc not too far behind him as it's this split execute. Rexon, Andre stairs, smoking it off. He's got the cut and the rotation for cameraman. Now Rexon will assume the position to get that diffuser down. It's all up to Noodle in a 1v3. He gets slaughtered by Merc, who looked like <laughs> he was looking in a different direction. Fascinating stuff. Sonics bring the game within a single round. Yep, and that was that very important moment there. Can they actually close the gap, or will it slowly slip away here? And it's a great execute, really. It did not like they had the time in that round necessarily, but it made it also playing very far back, you know, almost looking like they were expecting a big power blue tick or something like that. They gave up laundry. Yeah, okay. They know the enemy has the capital. Maybe they don't want to risk themselves getting fired off by the capital bow. Fair enough. But they're almost allowing Sonic to just walk in and plant for relatively free. Playing all the way into that killer. Playing inside of elbow, inside of flu. And again, not really finding the important parts of the map. We see right now big resources here being uh, put down towards the blue portion of the map. Which in that last round just wasn't relevant. That's what you're kind of gambling though. No, you got front takes and you got back takes. If you put all your stuff to one side, enemies probably gonna go to the other. That's just mathematics. Why make it harder for yourself by attacking the stronger side? Well, please don't. Tag our lineups though. Going through the motions again. Decisions as to what you choose to bring. Capital, Grim, Forest, that utility of course always being brought out. Adam on the gridlock, like a last round being brought. You get the nade, you get a shotgun, you get the flank block. Of course, the box gadget can really remove a lot of your game sound. It's an extremely loud gadget when it's causing out those stingers. And MBC07, last round got caught off guard. This time they gotta tighten up on the roam clear instead of Sonics. Make sure they drone more and find those lone roamers if there are any. Good luck coming out again as the lineup for Sonics looks 
very similar and well, with this being Oregon, it's not a terrible surprise to see a lack of bona fide hard breach. Instead, the secondary hard breach will be brought in the hands of three players on Sonics. Rexon's Capital, Merck's Grim, and Ambi's Buck, who is still looking for his first kill. We started this matchup about a half hour ago, give or take. He's still looking for something. Ambi is playing utility operator, so it's not like you're not gaining value out of the buck he's played for two rounds so far, but Ambi is certainly a very talented player, and Sonic's likelihood of success increases greatly if Ambi can hit the scoreboard. Yeah. I mean, Ambi is still a young player, like you mentioned last round, and it can get to your mental when you go like 0 3, 0 4, in this case, 0 7. Ambi needs one kill. Then he'll probably be activated and become more alive again. See four players towards bottom laundry right now, just looking to make a play. Drones going out left and right. The terror drones too. The jammer stops it, however. And again, we're still in that second phase this round. Utility dumping, clearing out those important things. But the mirror windows cannot be dealt with with this lineup from Sonics. No Kali, no Ash, and no proper hop reach. So Intel is true for defense. You can utilize those power positions still available to them. Both mirrors are facing Laundry and Freezer, so it's all of a front side. It's been a lot of mute jammer action so far as well, denying Sonic's very valuable and precious intel through this round. The drones that you see being spent consistently. It's a bit surprising. Boy, now watching the fire behind him as Ambi finally gets on the board. Woo! Adam out dueled by Spoit looking for another, but the fire looked to do some serious damage before Rexon could finish it off. Now Rexon will plant the diffuser in the exact same spot. M80 now will scramble to get up there as Geo and Ambi bleed out. This is a 2v2, very winnable for M80. No Rexon, or Merc rather, over by Freezer. You can't deal with him at all. Merc finishes things off. He's been excellent on this bomb site. He was great in this spot on defense and now just as good on those two rounds of attack. And we have a tie game between these teams. Just like that, seeming out of nowhere. And it comes down to the exact same problems last time from M80. They're playing so far back. What they're doing is that they're putting two mirror windows, one for laundry, one for freezer. And they play the Asami keyword barriers as well. And they think that's enough to hold that portion of the map. Then they play three guys on backside, holding big tower, leading hatch, and blue double door. They got Bobbire, they got, you know, the Primal Shield, etc. But the way that Oregon Basement tends to work in pro play is that you need to figure out how many attackers are attacking the front. If that's four attackers, you want to send, if possible, four defenders and match the firepower, match the utility. That's not what Emedi are doing successfully. Not at all. They're playing two against four and then three against one, which is like, great. Three against one, they win. But the issue is, it's the other side where the attackers are coming from with the majority of their firepower, where the diffuser goes down. And we know in Siege, once left. that diffuser gets planted down, the post plan is disgustingly favoring the attack. It's like 75, 85% win rate once bomb goes down, unless you're like in a 1v3 or 1v4 or something like that on most bomb sites. So as long as bomb goes down, you're happy losing bodies. You're happy dying on the back end of Big Tower because it doesn't matter to the overall story of the round. So, now it's tied up. Maybe they're trying to extend now, change the bombsite, go upstairs instead, play Big Tower and deny drones, try and play as dynamic on this bombsite as possible, but it comes at a cost. If Citizen overstays his welcome inside a Big Tower, he will die before falling back to reinforce off the wall. So it's this fine line of, hey, apply pressure, kill some drones, but fall back before it's too late. Located by attack. Oh, one thing that M80's actually excelled at is dealing with all the drones, Nick. Previous round, it was the Mute Jammers that were such a great degree of difficulty to overcome for Sonics. Despite that, they still won the round. This time, Mute will be in the hands of Noodle. Loading new mag. So if you have to... Well, if you have to drone up the site, you've got to be a little bit more careful. This lineup by Sonics looks all too familiar. They've brought a proper hard breacher this time. We still got backup though, with Merc holding those secondary hard breach gadgets. But teams don't really bring many of those pocket EMPs anymore. They'll just go with a Thatcher whose ban rate has fallen off of a cliff. 
wasn't that long ago where Thatcher was being banned all the time. The fact that he remains unbanned allows teams to use him. Change those pocket EMPs, obviously freeing him up. I'm not sure if Spoit knew that there was somebody behind him, but Amy gets one of the freest kills of his life after Spoit <laughs> eliminated Rexon. Remember when I said that Sonics had backup for Hard Breach? Well, it's a good thing they do because that's the ace dead from SQ. Amby, excuse me. Okay. I was unfamiliar with your game. I mean, man was zero rate out of this game. Now he's 3 and finding a highly impactful kills in this particular round. ADS clearing a wide, or might be clearing rather, getting the shield too. So really good progress being made out of nowhere because Andy finds those picks. Grenade from Geo goes in and M80 who looked like they were gonna skate the finish line relatively easily, breaking Sonics early on, forcing SQ to take a timeout so early in the matchup. M80 themselves might now be in a position where they have to call the timeout. Andy was attempting the defuser, but suddenly oh. Kino comes out of nowhere. 2v2 to be had. Kino looking for another, but guess who it is from Sonics? It's Adam. Noodle from down below pulls out the shotgun. He'll have to go through the rails. As now he repositions. They know where he is. So it should be easy for Sonics to just watch top white, which is sealed off. Merc getting the diffuser down successfully. Noodle in such a troubling predicament. As Mr. 14 kills of Adam will look for a 15th kill. Sonics. Hoping to take the lead. Been a rough go in that sense for them, but now they move to attack and we are looking at a very favorable attacker side at Oregon. Noodle getting ever closer to that diffuser does some damage to Adam, but Sonics are just playing keep away as they'll both look for final kill in the same direction. Noodle spotted. There go the bullets over his head and it's 15 kills for Adam. Phenomenal and impressive play from Adam. Picked up alongside Merc after Grixer was benched and Citizen asked for his release to go to M80 or well, don't know if he asked for it to go to M80 or just asked for his release and then was picked up by M80. But after losing four rounds in a row, it does not surprise me at all that we will see a timeout called here by M80. No, I mean, this is the time. This is before it gets, uh, gets too dire and it comes down to I mean, it's how you play these rounds, what your philosophy is, because from a way, they started things off well, and then they got caught off guard, you know, they died on the master bedroom side, and we got a ridiculous skill, which you kind of just cross off if you're a Like, okay, that happens, and we popped off, whatever. But generally speaking, they just cannot contain the attackers whatsoever. They look so locked out in so many of these rounds when it comes to map control, when it comes to, I almost want to say, like, confidence of fighting back, really. And yeah, we don't see attacker side organs all that often, but if you're really good at attacking, you can make it look this kind of way. And oh, I mean, yeah, with the Muncie ban, I was thinking maybe that's going to be an issue for these teams on the attacking side because some teams do crutch on it. Same with the Ying. You really heavily rely on those operators. Not the case right now. Both teams showing they can play a different style of Siege, not involving either of those two power operators and making it work just the same. Oh, we'll wait to get back to the game in just a second here. I I love the differing camera angles. It's like Spoit's camera is like so pretty okay. Kino's is all right. Maybe it's a little out of focus, but Noodle and Citizen are zoomed in like the Hubble telescope. I'm assuming this is a tech pause that we have right now. Yeah, I got a quick rehose coming in. I didn't see what the players are typing in the chat, but a bunch of question marks all I saw, and then one player just like disappeared. <laughs> we'll be back shortly. Now, so, uh, this is one and done for both of these teams. Due to technical issues last week, there have been a series of games tacked on to the next coming broadcasts. For those that haven't followed along, the 10th spot in the North America League was owned by Mirage. After a series of issues with the organization and with the roster, it was announced just the other day that Mirage would be disqualified and would be forfeiting the remainder of their matches, including all previous matches that they were supposed to play, which was played on March 15th, quote unquote, played against Beast Coast, but ultimately was a 7-0 disqualification that went in favor of Beast Coast. As far as I have been told, they'll be walking back that verdict. Every wow. single team that is playing Mirage will receive an immediate win. But because of what happened on Thursday, while we go down one game, 
we then go back up one game because while the Mirage games won't be played, all of the matches from our very first play day have been spread out. So you will see Beast Coast versus OXG to end today's broadcast. Beast Coast were in action earlier today and spoilers, they lost to the Luminosity Gaming four to seven. OXG were also in action earlier today and again, spoilers, they defeated Wildcard Gaming seven to three. Dark Zero versus SSG is up next. What is it about this matchup that is pushing it to be so attacker favored? I think it comes down to the players that you have in the server. Like for example, when you have, right, first of all, when you have Adam hopping off that he is, I mean, what is it, 15 kills now? I mean, that alone is gonna be a big driving factor for a lot of these attacks. You're just finding kill after kill after kill out of nowhere. But also when you have players like Merc, who is such an aggressive player on the attacking side, really good at reading the pace of the game, taking up space and map control, and just generally speaking, both teams, they have players who are not afraid to go for plays, right? And that always favors the attack. You see a small gap, you see a small opportunity, you take it, you win that gunfight, and you push there as a team. No one's afraid of making that. Often when we see Oregon, teams are playing very timid, they're playing all the guys, Dave, let's get to the bottom side, you know, 5v5 action, 3, 2, 1, go, complete chaos. Most of these rounds from either side, we've seen pretty much half the server is dead before that 3, 2, 1 execute, with the exception of when the defenders, they play basement with no roamers, because of course, then you're going to have a 5v5. So it really comes down to just so many small close happenings throughout the round, which again, usually favors the, uh, the attackers in this I think uh, all the lineup we saw Sonics for example they tried to play like Clash and Melusi one round just like slow down the attack again like reduce the possibility of playmaking but when you start playing really passive gadgets and you play very passive on the bottom side again you just give up the space the taggers just walked in ignored the Clash ignored the Melusi defenders are stuck in like really silly corners on the bomb side itself on kit storms not the strongest side itself and then again defenders lose so while you have to play passive and watch out for not dying to silly stuff, you also cannot just stop swinging and taking gunfights entirely because then attackers will run. We're back! We are! <laughs> Perfect timing. I don't know if you deliberately planned that so it would end. I don't know if you had any I mean, greater information, but... Parker, you know that casters, they control when the game starts. Of course. This, is something, that I, this is something I learned very early on, actually, was that, yeah, when you say caster start the game, the game actually starts much quicker. <laughs> is this a real Blackbeard, by the way, or are we going to see Adam swap off of it at the oh. final seconds? The Deimos of Geo looked locked in and ready to go. Oh, yes, nice. Adam goes to Dokubi. You on the line. No Waymos, Deimos. Pocket EMP is coming out though in the hands of Adam as again, Sonics will go with a hard breacher less lineup. This time they will be Merc and Rexen bringing those secondary hard breach gadgets. You call them can openers. Yep. Actually a fun fact was Citizen who taught me that term when he joined G2 back in the day. He was like, why do I bring them can openers? I'm like what is a can opener? Like, That's the your secondary hard breach gadget. It's like a can opener from top down. So uh, Citizen, Kind of coined that term as far as I know. And he's here. <laughs> Merc already in the building. Starting out over by Small Tower, working his way through dining. This is a downstairs hold from M80, looking for some success thus far on defense. Conventional wisdom would suggest that defenders are usually in a very good spot on Oregon, but conventional wisdom has been thrown out the window with this matchup as the attackers have had a very clear upper hand through the entirety of the nine rounds played. Yeah, that has definitely been the case. Remember earlier we spoke about pacing and when you should be expecting things to happen, those timings. You start reaching catches about 120 to 140 or so. We're right in that area and Sonics are all in the building and very well. Yeah, there we go. They're going to start opening up hatches at 128. So a decent pace right now for the attack. They're going to have enough time to both deal with, again, the roam, reaching, and then, of course, figuring out the weaknesses on the bombs at itself. 
placement, the one side of the in time member for Oregon that often plays out in a 5v5 or a 4v4 fashion, where it's all about that final execute. Opening kill, very important. Control over pillar and blue for backside, very important. And of course, playing freeze and holding down that as well, also a priority for most defending teams. We see the bees of Merc here in the meeting hatch, as well as the diffuse on Adam. That's probably gonna be the primary point of execute here for Sonic. Still plenty of time left as well. It's not like Sonics are working against the clock. They just hit the 45 second remaining mark. Adam continuing on with just oh. incredible play. Gambi dies, Adam goes down as well. M80 having their best and most successful rebuff of the Sonics assault so far in this matchup. M80 takes their lumps for it though. Noodle being severely damaged. Rexon as well, low HP. These Kiba barriers in blue. Greatly assisting Citizen, who really isn't living up to the muster. When you look at how he's playing against his former team, only two kills so far. Hoping for more, he drops Geo down. That's one for him to go up to three. Rex in last one standing from Sonics, and M80 will once again tie the game. These two teams evenly matched, and finally M80 is able to put a single defender round in their win column. Yeah. Out of four rounds, they win a single one. The third attempt at basement, by the way. So, yeah, they win this one. Great. But now for the following two rounds, it's locked. They have to go to secondary and then lose and go secondary again. Or, of course, go secondary slash third grade. Those are their options. So, yeah, you can win when it's the easy option. But now it becomes more and more difficult every single victory. This round matters so much more than that of the previous for this side of immediate. For Sonics, it's just another round. And they do a lot better typically on the upstairs attack because you have all those like open angles to work with. You can find those opening picks, you can spread yourself out more thin essentially on the attacking side and enable all that individual performance from Ambi, from Adam, from Merc, from, um, from Rexon as well. Or it's mostly just Dio who's like that solid mid-section player who will hold a flank, a drone for his teammates, pop that global ability off the line, etc. So again, I want to see Mady fight for the space with confidence and not just give things up for free. They're playing Milusi, they're playing Frost, they're playing Mute, they're playing Operators that will slow the, uh, the round down a little bit, but they also have great guns on all of those Operators. Now we see Citizen actively playing deep inside a big tower. Got the barbed wire downstairs, has a cube barrier. This is much more commitment than last time, where Citizen kind of he went into tower, shot a single drone, and immediately gave it up. This looks like they actually want to commit to that decision and not just fall back. Spoit sitting at top armory stairs, waiting for somebody to improperly drone and run by. I already heard that blunder with Kino and... Was it Citizen that was playing down below in classroom where... Mm, yeah, Kino Citizen, yep. Yeah. Sitting on the mute jammer and you had Kino playing longer range over by split. And obviously Sonics don't drone that one out effectively. They end up dying because of it. Ambi started off slow, as did Rexon. Both struggled to get kills until later into this contest. Now Ambi has found three to his name, but still a three and ten is a far cry from what Ambi is able to do. If Adam wasn't playing the way he is, this matchup could in theory be over. That's how close it's been between these two teams and how much of a difference maker Adam has been so far. Most impressively, Adam's not even doing it on your typical fragging operators. He's doing it on a lot of these mid to flex ops for the team. And mm. SQ has a bit of an embarrassment of riches when it comes to aggressive players. So there will always be somebody itching to get that kill and always will be somebody good enough to get that kill as well on their side of things. After looking a little bit quick over previous rounds, Sonics have now struggled to get into the building to begin attacking this bomb site. There's only a minute to go, and they are far removed from the pace that they set on the previous round. Very with him, both those bees there. He's worried about Big Tower, and again, it's because this time it made the hold on to the space. Citizen not giving up Big Tower just yet. A bot Grim Bee canister and Cell Mess as well here. Utility not going the way of the attack right now. They still got trophy control as well. Spoil playing that kind of all or nothing position here, fighting for his life. And there comes the first kill, oh, Merc! No. Somehow team kills the best player so far on Sonics. 
Flashpoint will now also capitalize off of Merc's negligence over by Trophy! And what a play it is from Spoit. Citizen, the final kill on the round, and M80 have suddenly swapped things around on defense, and they sit on match point. You see the change up there. They said, guys, believe in the position because last time, exact same bomb side, they fall back fast. They fall early to like getting surprised by them repelling a master bedroom balcony. But now M80, they've read into what it is that's going wrong and what it is that Sonics are doing to catch them off guard. So now the question is, can Sonics figure out their problem? Can they make an adaptation to the counter play right now and break it once more? And you know, if they win the upcoming round, that tertiary bomb side, they will take us all the way to overtime. So it really is a, uh, a possible final round here. The attackers look so good, but that previous round was the most one-sided round, I would argue, from defense, at least from the side of a Mady so far. Both teams have used their timeouts, both of them entering this matchup with a perfect record, albeit only one game played so far. One will continue on undefeated, the other will unfortunately be sent home with this match in the less desirable column. Overtime still very much a possibility, and with how defender-sided Oregon has looked, it would not surprise me whatsoever if Sonics were to prevail on this tertiary bomb site. Meeting in Kitchen, what could be the final round between these two juggernauts? Completely new team of M80 and a new look for Sonics after somewhat controversially losing Citizen and benching Grixer, which I think honestly surprised a lot of onlookers after SI, but blow will be softened a bit as Merck and Adam so far have at least lived up to the billing and have looked magnificent through these two matches I'd have to agree and again this is early days this is like again like what what will this roster look like in a few weeks in a few months from now long term they stick it out together that's the bigger question for me is what's the long term look so far it's gonna be utility for this round the Twitch, the Nomad now it's Sonic's trying to slow things down a little bit, play with more intel, play with a bit more reliable consistency, so to speak, in terms of operator lineup gadgets. Play with that global gadget of Doka B, one call went out, and just sit inside of the classroom, waiting for the next move. Maybe the EMP will enable the hub reacher off Brexton on lobby side, trying to apply pressure here from various positions. Poking a big bit inside a big tower, poking inside the lobby as well. Forcing out the swing serve from cameraman, a great opening kill there for Rexon. It's exactly what Sonics needs if they want to keep themselves in this. Now Spoit falls as well at the hands of Geo. Just waiting ever so patiently. You got two picks. Yeah. He knows low. You got almost half of the round to go as well. Rexon has been the one carrying the bomb in so far, the case rather, towards the bombs. Is successful on both laundry supply attacks that we saw getting that case down. Oh my, oh sloppiness no. as Kino gets killed through the drone hole by Adam, who's just stat padding at this point 17 kills against this M80 super team. Now it's Noodle dropped as Rexon's getting the diffuser down. Sonics put this round away flawlessly. All they need is Citizen, who gets caught out by Geo, and we will indeed go to overtime. This won't be a quick one by any stretch of the imagination. And it's no surprise given these rosters. It's such a surprising that's happening here. Last round, they made it get their strongest defensive round victory so far. And then Sonics, the round after that we just witnessed, they get the most one-sided round in the entire match so far, going flawless on that Churchill bomb side attack. Adam just found his way into the middle of the building, inside a server, right next to the bomb side, very quickly in that round. And it's because they got the kill to cameraman early on by main lobby. They knew there was a gap. That sole player holding down that portion and he just took that free space. M80, they will start defense. Sonics, they will be on the attack. It's effectively a best of three in terms of round count now. And if they go the distance, it will be twice defense. For the team that starts there, and same for the attack, of course. No surprise, both teams probably gonna go basement here on the first attempt to get on defense. Why wouldn't you? It is statistically the best bomb side. And it's worked out greatly so far. Of course, mixed results, but I would say it consistently across the board for both teams. 
it is where you want to be. Despite the fact that some teams struggle on spawn side for some reason, you still have so many options. You can play the Nero, the Booyah, for example. Sam is open. It's just too good not to be open. Well, if there was ever a time for you to ultimately fall short, it would be on that tertiary bomb site. Yeah. As we see this map get played more and more in what could be considered to be a quite a large meta swing of more information on the win rates. There was a nitro cell that was tossed up at the feet of Ambi that just missed out on killing him. He can continue to soldier onwards and he's not far removed from the Azami of Spoit. Difficulty controlling the recoil on the C8 as Ambi hits one shot and Spoit manages to get away from that right now, at least with his life intact. He's gonna link up with Cameraman. Adam is like, he's very often just kind of looking, you know, last time at last, he just stands somewhere, repels somewhere, just kind of looking at the landscape around him, waiting for communication from his teammates about what the next step is going to be, maybe try and get intel in big tower, he can punch the window, go for an easy pick on the spoil, but they lack that intel right now from Sonic. It's Adam alone on big tower, no one's really joining for him, and he's in master bedroom, but look at the timing right now. 1 minute 40 seconds, there are still active roamers on the map on two separate areas. It's a very slow round, but just like that, Merc gets a kill and he gets injured. And he gets baited out as well by the Banshee, but Merc still pulls it off. Ambi will continue to bleed out. Let's go. Until Rexon becomes his savior. Citizen is hoping for a read on this from the kill hole that's at the top of the stairs, but Citizen can't find anything through it, and you don't want to overstay your welcome. Citizen staying alive for the cut and thrust of the execute is critical. He doesn't have access to a nitro cell that was burned earlier in the round, but you're still a shotgun and an SMG-11. Both of those have incredible value for your team. Sonic's at the one minute mark, now clearing out meeting. He's starting to line things up for what will almost certainly be a laundry execute spearheaded by Rexon's Capitao, as we have seen time and time again throughout this match. Yeah. The good thing as well here is that because they're actively roaming, the reinforcements are not on the hatches, but elsewhere. So despite time being low, hatches read the soft open by defense. So that buys so much time for the attack. They don't got to deal with utility right now. Bees can go out, as you mentioned, the capital fire, and a lot of players hovering laundry side. You are correct, Parker. They're going to go for a front take with 25 seconds left. Fire over towards Freezer. So Adam and Merc will work together. Taking control of that part of the map. Kino eliminating Merc, though. That's one domino to fall. Fire now. Citizen swings out. He'll suffer the damage to get the kill. Ambi dies. Geo will also die. M80 shutting SQ down in their tracks. Rexon is there for one kill. He'll have to attempt the defuse plant with Adam overseeing. Adam's got too many different areas to look, oh. and he leaves Rexon all on his own as Kino goes massive in that round. He'll propel M80 back to match point. Back and forth, back and forth, and again, that was a very chaotic round. When the time is slow, when the fires, the smoke, everything happening all at once, the green bee spotting players, well, in the end, utility might be a great thing to bring, but gunplay gets you the furthest. Kino landing, headshot after headshot, shutting down, the push essentially, falling things out. But now there's a side swap every single round, so you might figure out how to play either attack or defense, but then you only get a one chance at it, then you go to the other side. So now we gotta see if it can end it up cleanly here, defend basement, uh, and then afterwards attack basement, or if we gotta go all the way to a 7 7 scoreline with M80 having basement bumps at locked for that final round to come, where they have a tough choice between Kid Storm secondary or that tertiary option. Sonics they do pretty much the exact same thing here in terms of other lineup. Is that Asami, the Capital, the Mira, the Util Operators? Well, my is to try and fortify those player positions, either to stop the smokes or the fire from the Capital, for example, or a grenade or a flashbang. And the Warden can see through smokes and see through flashbangs as well. Rexon, though, not playing on the bomber side as you'd normally expect from Warden. He's starting the round inside a big tower, looking to get aggressive, possibly, or going for a spawn beat look like. Love that sound, by the way. The suppressed spear in the hands of Citizen. Kino now up to 14 kills. A lot of it because of what we just witnessed in that previous round, but still a name that 
If you haven't been hearing all that much, it wasn't long ago that Kino was, I don't want to say the scapegoat for M80 struggles, but was certainly the odd one out on that team. Mm. So much so that M80 thought it was ideal to bench Kino and bring in a substitute on loan from OXG. Yaga did not look anywhere near as comfortable on the team as I think they hoped. Not that Yaga is a bad player, but it's just very challenging to immediately step up to a team that you don't necessarily know if you're even going to stay on after that. Kino was brought off of the bench and back to active duty, and well, at least in this game in particular, it's been paying off. The rest of this M80 team has coalesced around him and go back to something I said earlier, which is I don't know how much of this is M80 as a unit versus their individual skills, but that is a question that will be answered the more that we get to see this team function because I can almost guarantee you that M80 have not even come close to reaching their potential. Same with the Sonics yeah. for that record after adding Merc and Adam. Oh, both of these teams had a great start last week and they are certainly looking as sharp as we expected here in this match. One of the best to lose though, womp womp. Right now, <laughs> M80 sitting in the driver's seat with half of the round to go. Yeah, of course, Kino, he's got 14 kills like you mentioned, but this round he finds himself on the blitz, so he's been doing a great job at getting kills with a gun, but this round, he might just be the initial entry operator for his team. Spike there, got a kill onto Merco, peeked the mirror window, inside laundry towards Freezer, and this is the prime position for M80. They get the opening pick, they shut down Merc, it's also utility as C4 gone from play here, and this is gonna set them up greatly for the execute. They got the blitz, they got the finger boost, they can strengthen their players, get the insult with the beast, and go for those gunfight. It's up to Citizen now instead of blue, in a noodle on the hatch to make the play together. Magnet will catch one of those nades tossed out by Citizen. Adrenal Surge comes in. The first of three. Kino is waiting for the call to drop E-Box. It will be greeted by a Nitro Cell by Rexon, but he falls off of that spot. Sonics giving up control. Instead, the Nitro Cell will go towards Freezer. M80 pulverizing Sonics. All that's left is Adam with 18 kills. A perfect opportunity for him to pad his stats, but it's Cameraman to work with Kino to get the job done, and M80 will prevail in overtime. <laughs> Individual heroics there. Yeah, it's a team effort. But when it's overtime, White comes online that final round. Just gets the perfect timing and hits all the headshots. Three kills for him. Really open things up. And yeah, this game deserved overtime. I'm happy went to overtime. It was not a Oregon. It was a good match of Oregon. It was an exceptionally exciting game between all of these teams. Unfortunately, somebody had to lose. And in this case, it was the Sonics. M80 and their new super team coming out ahead. As for Super's team, they lose in OT. Get a small clap for that one, Park. Well, Thank you. Yeah. I was very I was very, very proud of myself creative. for that one. That said, we are halfway done the broadcast. It's a little bit actually over halfway done the broadcast. We still got two more matches to go. DZ versus SSG is up next. But first, post-match debrief by the desk after the break.
Sometimes gambits really do pay off. In Citizen's case, the overall choice to move from one team to another absolutely did. In his case, is the one that matters the most. Sonics fall eight to six on Oregon, and Citizen finally gets the dub that proves why that was a good move for him on a personal level. I'm Jacob, he's Jonah, he's Fox. They did the thing, first overtime game in the NAL. First time we see this kind of old team rivalry butting back up. That was a really good series, but it had enough popcorn eating moments beforehand to make us go, how is this one going to end? It was a great series, and usually the player that leaves the team always ends up beating them. We talked about it the prior <laughs> game. So, I mean, obviously, you know, Citizens got to be feeling pretty good about that win. But start to finish, both teams came out just swinging at each other. And I really love how it was an attack side at Oregon. You don't really see much of those. So the fact that they were just able to, I guess, duke it out onto the attacks, obviously had a lot of things to look at and be like, wow, like what a play. Attacker sided maps are always going to be more exciting than the defensive ones. And this one delivered wholeheartedly. And I kind of broke this one down into a couple different acts, if you will, right? You had yeah. the first act really, where it was a very clean cut M80 dominance. They were getting into the building early on the attacking side. They were steamrolling Sonics moments after the words in the green room were uttered, Sonics look like the best team in the league. I'm not going <laughs> to name names. But they were clean. They came in fast. They came in hard. And it was very difficult to slow them down. That is eventually when Sonics kind of moved it to the second act, where they finally got their footing and started to take the fight back to M8. I can completely agree. I mean, Sonics was looking to bring it back all the way to the end. They looked like the dominant force, especially when they were on their side of attacks. And then we saw the third act, I would say, which is M80 locking in, you know, <laughs> correcting the mistakes and switching up their tempo. It looked like they completely slowed down on the way that they were defending to make sure that they could bring it towards like the little overtime. And then once they got to overtime, it was a completely different M80 in my opinion. Very slow, very methodical, especially on that last round on attack, taking their time, opening up the angles. They'd have a player on every single position of the map. They got rid of the mirrors and step by step just enclosing Sonics on themselves. The one problem about games like this that are very streaky, four rounds straight from M80 that make it a 4-1 game. Four rounds straight from Sonics immediately after that that suddenly turns into a 4-5 and we think M80 has the advantage, then Sonics have it, then there's a back and forth and suddenly we're going to OT. The problem with streaky games is we can't predict what happens in OT because nothing about the way that that first, like several segments went, makes the rest of it predictable. So I think M80 should be really happy they won this thing and then don't have to worry about what the hell this game actually meant. They should, and especially being able to recognize where they went wrong to then slow it down on the overtime and close out a very clean overtime, just getting the next two rounds back to back on the defense and on the attack. Very hard to do, especially when you lose such a monumental like lead. Yeah. But then to just focus up and get those last two rounds, I mean, of course you got to be happy running away with it. Let's give props to Sonics for one thing. I do think that might be Adam's new career kill record at this point. Hasn't been in Tier 1 for very long, but he's already making a huge impact for Sonics in just his second game. 18 kills. That was his final tally, but he delivered consistently throughout this entire map. It wasn't just a first or second half performance. I mean, 18 kills. You need to do that the entire time if you want to reach that kind of a number. I mean, we saw it early. He was helping or doing whatever he could to try to stall out M80 as they were working their way into the building. And then they switch over to the attacking side and he keeps it up. He steps it up and gets Sonics back into the fight. Especially playing on that secondary support flex role is really hard to find so many of these multi kills and be able to put yourselves in the position that you're consistently able to pretty much win your team rounds when it's relied on you. There's a lot of players in the league that we refer to him to, especially players like Handy and Nate. And obviously, this match just goes to show if you put him in these positions, especially on the difficult operators, like getting a 4K with Goyo, yep. you know, <laughs> that gun's not too fun to use. So having the confidence to do that and the lack of pressure, just trusting in your teammates to be able to be like, hey, if you give it to me, I'll make sure we win this round. Let's give them 80 props, though. I think Spoit had a much better outing this time around. Kino had several highlights, one at the very beginning of overtime, one at the very beginning of the map to put them in good contention. We don't have to talk about guys like Citizen too much because when those guys pop off, off, everybody on M80 just seems like they thrive together. And I love that it's Spoit again, kind of taking center stage here because that was part of the big transition that M80 were trying to make happen coming into the stage, right? You're trying to slow things down a bit, getting rid of some of those big heavy hitters and building a more stable foundation 
around this one player. And so far, working well. Well, let's talk to the man of the hour real quick. Citizen is on deck to talk about knocking off his old team. It finally happened. The gambit paid off. Mr. McMillan, talk to me. How does it feel, dude? Feels great. Honestly, it just feels good to beat those guys, you know. Old team, old vibes. I don't know how they're going to play me. Just beat them, you know. They play good, but we play better. Citizen, speak freely right here. It's just you and me. Last week, last week, right, Ambi went yeah. ahead and said that he thinks that Merc is better than you currently. Do you have anything? Yeah. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I don't care because you saw Ambi, what do you go, 3 and 12 or something, dying every round, kind of crazy. So, like, he can say whoever's better. Well, we beat him, so we know who's better, you know? Oh, boy. I mean, speaking of who's better, <laughs> Does it feel like a different environment? Does it feel like there's a, a little bit less pressure on this team, a lot more easygoing than your previous roster? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Like everyone's putting in every, like lots of work. Like everyone has the same mindset, the same goals, the same ideology. Like I just, it, the environment from my previous team to this team is just crazy. Yeah. I think we've uh, got a really good thing going on right now. We just need to make sure we improve and carry on throughout the season and hopefully make the major. Staying on that for a second, Citizen, kind of want to dig into this a little bit more. What was the motivation behind making that move in the first place, right? You moved to M80, you're trying to get something done here. Any more insight into the reason behind the move? I just weighed my options because a lot of NA teams were doing like complete uh, reworks and I just, you know, I had to... Uh, I messaged saying that MAE were looking into me from my, my agent and elegance and he's you know he just helped me out and I thought like MAE would just have be the, the the better option than Sonics on their rebuild, you know, and I think today it panned out my way and hopefully carry on it carries on in the future. All right. One of the things I was curious about coming into the stage was would there be too many cooks in the kitchen with a whole bunch of big names on on M80? There's cameraman in there, Kino's had a big presence, obviously Spoid is there, but now you are in the picture. Do you ever find that there's moments where you're tripping over one another or do you think everyone's syncing up pretty well after two games so far? As of right now, no, like there's no tripping up. Like I think everyone's got like respect for the main caller, which is like cameraman and I help out when needed and the other three, like they all chip in when they need to. And yeah, it's just like a, a good environment, no like beef, no one gets annoyed if their idea doesn't like get used or anything. And it's a good place to be in really, like it's completely different from other teams. Last question for you. You were the import player last year when you went to Sonics and then you, you had some time to get acclimated to what it was like playing in North America. But now you're you're on the other side of it, watching guys like Camberman and Noodle come in from different continents, come into North America to play. Are you ever like the guiding hand for those dudes uh, at any point because they're new to the scene and you're not? I mean, just with camera, it's just this like, learning English, you know, I help out with his English when needed and so do the others. But with Noodle, I think like he was basically an import anyway and uh, the Mena League, so I think he's kind of used to like this situation. And like, yeah, the only difference is just Cameron's English, that's the only thing. Well, hopefully there's even more of a chance to keep on improving that. Ben, again, congratulations on the 2-0 start. We'll see you next week, all right? Thank you, see you later. Everything for M80 just seems like it's firing on all cylinders at the moment. There's not really much else you can say about their play that should be better other than maybe don't let a 4-1 lead slip nearly that drastically, but phenomenal start for those guys so far. Obviously, we talked about it in the pre-show, the language barrier difference and cameraman slowly getting better, and obviously you can attribute some of the little intricacies that went wrong to that. With a little more time, they'll be a little solid. And the real winner at the end of the day, in my opinion, is probably Elegance, because that guy <laughs> is managing like 80% of the league. So the at fact this point, that, yeah. The fact that he was able to make Citizen get the spot on the team, obviously it's looking really good for that guy. I can't believe we're giving Elegance mentions <laughs> the NA on that, dude. I, I, I really didn't, I think, put enough emphasis in my own mind on how that language barrier could impact things, because we think of Cameraman as this experienced player, a famous name, right? Someone that we know brings a lot of leadership potential to this roster. And I think we saw that week one, we've seen that now, but yeah, you're right. I mean, that's gotta yeah. be something that this whole team is working around and working with cameraman on. I'm definitely interested to see kind of how he fits into that role more, even with I that. I mean, we mind. don't even really think of it about it being a problem because they've won two games straight right. and they're, they're fine, they're, right? They're absolutely. fine, clearly. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But as an IGL, it provides a whole different element to the game. Sometimes yeah. when you want to say something and you don't necessarily know the words to convey it to the rest of your team, obviously we saw that as an issue when the first roster of M80 happened with their coaching staff being primarily Brazilian. But now obviously, yeah. it's going a lot better in their favor. We had two heavy hitters go to overtime in this matchup. Is the same thing going to happen in our fourth game of the day? The two longest tenured rosters or the two longest tenured orgs in the North American League going head to head next.
Hey, this is Poison, and you're watching Unmuted. I mean, I think it's an operator getting zapped by a Twitch drone, but I don't know which operator. I'm just going to say Bandit. Uh, let's just, like, throw, like, some random guests in the air. Let's just go, like, um, let's go Legion. I don't know. That sounds like someone getting electrified. I'll say Thermite. I'm not sure about this one. I'm going to say Thermite. I want to say this is Castle, the boy Miles Campbell. I really hope I'm right. I've played that guy too much. That is Castle getting shot. What? I thought I would know that one. Honey, I'm home. Concentrate on one thing at a time or you will achieve nothing. Okay. Oh, I don't know. What is this? I don't know. Shoot, I know that, but I don't know it. I have like two ops and I want to say it's Cav just by how she sounds. Whose voice is that, man? Sophia? I'll lock in Twitch. I'm gonna be wrong. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say that was Dokubi. But I think that's, um, Nook. Knock? <laughs> I should have known that, man. I play Knock. Same as a heist. I just have to wait. If you don't like my methods, you can tell me later. I've, I don't think I've ever heard any of these voice lines ever. Dude, whose voice is that, man? I feel like this is Vigil. I'll say Grim. I want to say that's Cade. I think that's Maestro. That's like a Spanish accent. Okay, I think it's Flores. Awesome. It's probably that only one I'm gonna get. <laughs> that does not sound like Flores, man. I understand why people are missing these, cause, whew. Let yourself adjust to the dark, and you see the monsters before they see you. Don't try anything cute. Is it Glass? Cause, uh, I mean, I'm just guessing off, like, what the operator does. I don't know if like the voice lines have anything to do with the actual operator, but like, is it Warden? Uh, I want to say that's Thatcher. Okay, the last one's got to be Zero, right? Okay, awesome. Who is this guy? Zero. How did Ashen get this? Because it makes no sense. Yeah, it's kind of easy to tell.
Bomba Club. <laughs> it's the longest running struggle in the history of the NAL. Two franchises who have been at each other's heels since 2019. 28 series, 47 maps played over five years, and now it's time to write the 29th chapter in this historic battle. Welcome back to the North American League. I'm Jacob, he's Jays Wills, he's Fox A, and this is Dark Zero and Space Station, the single biggest rivalry among two North American teams ever in NAL history. Yeah, they have a lot going on the line, obviously. Being both big teams, you're usually gonna see one of these two teams end up in the top four, so Getting each other out of the way pretty early on means that they get to scrim each other for the rest of the season. So obviously it's a win-win for both teams. What's crazy to me is when this began, all the way back in the day in 2019, the first recorded matchup I've got between these two teams, at least on Liquipedia, is January 14th, 2019, and it ended in a tie, a 6-6 oh my six God. tie. I didn't even know we had ties back then. Way back then we did, yeah. I mean, draws were the bane of Space Station's existence. That's where the whole Draw Station gaming meme was born from oh, yeah. literally the dark That's ages true. of Pro League way back when. Oh, they had That's so crazy. many ties. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they're a lot happier now. Obviously, they've been doing really well internationally and then coming home, just making their team a little bit stronger. I mean, they've been looking pretty good. And so is DZ when it comes to international. Overall, since 2019, we've had so many different battles between both of these teams. It's a 13 to 12 series record for Dark Zero, keeping in mind there are three ties total between both of them. But Space Station has won 24 maps next to Dark Zero's 20, and they just played in the upper bracket of the recent Six Invitational, where Dark Zero knocked them off two to one. So overall, both of them have been neck and neck for seemingly ever over the past this five years. This is crazy evenly matched. I had no idea it was this tight. I think both teams, obviously, from the last event, too. In the last picture, we see Canadian and Ashen just screaming at each other pretty that much. That moment was fun. <laughs> and yeah. I think that was a highlight, especially everyone giving props to Ashen for standing on business, even though they lost. Him still standing there and screaming, I mean, it just goes to show that little bit of banter. But it adds an extra element. Both teams want to slaughter the other team. I think that there's a lot of things that we obviously want to do to somebody in the server, but based on the way that both teams played just last week, one of them had the result they were looking for. The other, we kind of got to talk about the moments where things really don't go according to plan. Oh, and it really didn't go according to plan. DZ had high expectations. They were riding a high after a very good six invitational performance, especially considering the circumstances that got them there. They brought in Naif, they brought in Bolo. They're bringing in two guys that, of course, are quite talented in their own right, but still need to get used to this new roster. It was about getting them up to speed, getting them ingrained in that system, and they started that process very successfully. I mean, at SI. At it SI. It was very successfully. SI. I was thinking so I was So now we have to literally rope the entire thing back to how they played from just last week. They had the Sonics. It was the other team that was also top six at the recent Invitational. And we all thought whoever wins this game is going to open up their, their, their season and it's going to be fantastic. Dark Zero had probably the worst opening you could have had that wasn't just a straight 7-0. And now they're looking to bounce back from that. I think they're the team that had the most pressure going into the start of this stage. And I believe Naif was the one that tweeted after the game saying, we just didn't play like ourselves. We were not there today tough when you go up against a tough opponent like that one that you do have so much history with but we expected so much more out of them and that's why it kind of hit a little different because they really did not show up with such high expectations like i mentioned with that after that si run you expected a little more from them and we need to start seeing that as we get into these this week two week three i'm curious if the expectations that dark zero thinks they have on their own shoulders also hold up when we talked to njr before this stage started let's see what he said Well, I guess NJR wasn't saying anything after all. <laughs> Just speaking into the void. I, I actually read lips, and he said that we are the best team in North America, and we're going to smoke SSG. Well, well perfect. That's what he was saying. That, that doesn't, doesn't 
really go well after his performance just a couple of days ago. Good right? freaking segue, dude. <laughs> Jonah's only been here for I mean, less I've than got, 24 hours. I'm and he ready gets to go. How a desk works. He had a TA, he had a tough showing, right? All yeah. jokes aside, right? We again high expectations because this guy has been on an uphill trajectory since the disrupt days. He goes disrupt, he goes DZ, and it feels like every single year, every single stage, he gets better and better. Last year, top n top player rated across the entire league in stage mm -hmm. one, top three mm -hmm. in stage two. Best Talk player at SI. Talk to him. Best player at SI. The Talk guy, to him. The guy's great. I mean, he's right there. Look at him. He wasn't talking to us, but I'm talking to him. The point is, last week, not his day. Nope. No. He did not load into the lobby three and eight overall and really just did not give DZ that kick in the pants they needed when clearly they were so behind. And I hate to harp on him and say it was just his fault that the team lost. Obviously, it was not just his fault. No. It was a pretty abysmal showing, obviously. Sonics just steamrolled through them. They had the right responses. They had the right answers. They just weren't there to back up the gunshots, unfortunately. And I especially think the map took a huge play into it, too, because we know that NJR is such a pivotal player, but he plays these positions where he loves to lock down areas. Is. And when he gets tested, he shuts down whoever's in front of him. Clubhouse is not that map. You have to be very proactive on it, and it just wasn't his day. We're not going to say that one loss ever goes to just one player unless it's literally a 1v1 round 15 overtime clutch, in which case, yeah, you can pin a win or a loss on just one player. But we're not saying the same thing about NJR because, one, only one game, so there's still way more that we have to see from how Nafe and Bolo play in best of one. That was the first time they played a game. And it wasn't a best of three because all of SI was conformed to just best of threes. So we'll see how they do in the actual league format going forward against Space Station Gaming. This is one of those rosters that everyone thought made just the perfect adjustment coming into the season. Only one player change. Iconic joins the team and suddenly everyone thinks they have what it takes to make a balls to the, one Rolf, uh, balls to the wall run for a major title. And speaking of star players, I mean, Iconic didn't do too hot last week either, but he was there leading the team. He was there behind the charge and making sure they had that extra little bit of trajectory in the mid to late round. And that's what they brought him on for, is to just have the little bit of guidance. And obviously they looked really good. They had a game plan from start to finish all the way through. But when it comes to a team like Dark Zero, obviously Dark Zero loves game plans. Yep. So I'd expect to see a little bit of spice at SSG today. I'd expect them to see very balls to the wall, like you were saying, just aggression. No, this should get fiery. And with the change they made, right, you lose hot and cold. You do lose a little bit of that stability, someone who's consistent, that backbone, right? But you replace it with the Batman. You replace it with <laughs> the hero of this league. What are, the, what, are the, what are the gifts is he tweeting out these days? I, I, I don't know. Is, is he on to like Peaky Blinders or something? Uh, like, who or, knows? Or was that an old gimmick? What, what, what is Iconic tweeting today? What is Iconic? It's a great question. Dave, Dave, listen, when he's locked in, he's locked in. And the heroics, the clutch power, some of the historic moments that he's had, kind of perfect for a matchup that could get chippy like this, don't you think? He wasn't the guy that showed up in that game last week, though. No. That was Ashen, and oh my god, it's like it, as soon as SSG picked him up, it was a match made in heaven. And it's kind of nice. I'm slotting right into Laxing's seat here because Laxing was all about Ashen. He was hyping him up pregame, and I mean, he was spot on. Ashen was delivering consistently as well. 13 and eight overall, just really good at helping his team take space early, maintaining that space. You see him providing some good cutoffs there. He was someone that SSG relied on to establish their foothold in each round, something that as you know, right, is critical to success. I and mean, what is there not to love? He's the main entry roamer on SSG, and obviously if you give him area to play loose and he's getting those 1v1s significantly, LG was giving him those 1v1s. So he was capitalizing on it. Obviously, he was thriving, and obviously he was in the best spot, best position possible. But Dark Zero is a different beast. The way Dark Zero plays is very slow and methodical. They don't give you those ones. They try to push you into these positions that they're crossfire, that they're held. They want you to get aggressive. They want you to do that. But Ashen isn't just a pretty face and a good gun. He also is a very smart player in the way that he plays. He takes his time, and he plays off of his team. And SSG is very good at preparation. And after the first week of them having a lot to go off of what DZ wasn't doing right, I think they're going to have a lot of good obstacles to overcome and ways to, I guess, shut Dark Zero's slow passive style down. Well, the last time they played upper bracket of SI, best of three, Dark Zero won that, even though it still went to a map three. We have a cafe on deck. 
Mm. And I do remember several battles between these teams, especially just last year. I remember a best of one where both these guys played very different roster compositions overall. How are we feeling about the Cafe pick for this one? It's a worrisome map if you're SSG because we just said NJR loves holding positions. I think everyone talks about NJR on the white window upside down repel. That guy, <laughs> you cannot get him off that white window. So that's obviously a little worrisome if I'm if I'm SSG, but SSG picked the map. So obviously they know what they're getting when NJR is going to be on that window. They know he's going to be there. And I think that's exactly what they wanted. This one, yeah, I don't know exactly how to feel here. I even DM'd Laxing just a few moments ago when we learned of the map to see if his prediction might change. Okay. Because this one could get a little shaky. Did he say anything different about his prediction? I'm going to check right now, and, and, and I'll let you know. Oh, dude, we're doing <laughs> he a live, live, live okay. Twitter well, DM. Well, while he pulls his DMs up, we'll do predictions for everybody else. Li or sorry, Fox, are you changing your prediction based on what you think the map is, or how do you see this one swinging? No, I just think that DZ needs to prove himself, especially after last week. It was very slow, very sluggish. Okay. And I think SSG came out firing. Obviously, in my opinion, LG is a weaker opponent compared to how Dark Zero is looking out to be. I'm still going to stay with my prediction of SSG. All right, SSG locked in. What's the live prediction from the The Lexi? verdict is that he is going to stay with his original prediction, which was not SSG. It was DZ. Let's go! Some dissension on the desk, finally! Finally, we got a little bit of that, I was going right? to say, there had to be someone shift up, and of course, Jesse goes with the Space Station pick. But Laxing has gone rogue, and if he were to win this, he jumps above Jesse a little bit. Well... Makes sense. Rogue's not an NA. Hmm? Rogue's not a team in the NA. Nice. You said they gone rogue. I mean, All right, not, Parker Mackay, settle down. That's oh, absolutely the kind, of, the kind of dad joke you're not supposed <laughs> to be the one making. Is what it is. It's time for the heavyweight fight. It is big fight feel here in Philadelphia for the 29th time in history. Dark Zero and Space Station. Boys, have fun. Well, thank you so very much. The new look of Dark Zero that we saw at the Six Invitational looks to rebound after its disappointing first match last week. As for Space Station, they just want to keep rolling, baby. They dispatched LG 7-3. They're just going to keep banging on all cylinders. But if the map of Cafe proves to be too much, then it might give DZ an opening of their own. A big fight feel it certainly does give off. And I think the social prediction just goes to show how close it is. 60% saying DZ, 40% for SSG. Nick, what are your expectations of this matchup? I mean, looking at DC going into SI just in February, I was thinking, okay, they pick up Bolo and Nave. You know, they don't have that much experience together yet, but they came in very strong in this expectation. I was really hoping and praying that they would stick it together as a roster because Bolo is only a temporary pickup for invite alone, whereas Nave was a long-term deal. But then after as I finished, everybody was happy with what happened. They have now signed a long-term deal with that entire roster, and they're here to stay. I'm very excited for the long-term future of PC with this specific set of players. But uh, so again, domestic play versus international competition is a different kind of beast, and you gotta do well domestically first before you make it to international. We'll watch how they do. SSG, they banned the Ying. Dark Zero answer with Dokubi and Asami. And then SSG rounded things off by banning the Valkyrie. Intel, of course, been banned from both sides. And Intel is key on Cafe, so it makes sense. Yeah, if you just want to reference these operator bands as well, Ying still far and away the clear cut favorite for most banned attacker. Seven times banned so far through the entirety of the North America League. That's ben, just over 85%. <laughs> Okabe in second with three bands now. So the two most popular attacking bands will show themselves off. In terms of defenders, it's a grab bag. You've got Kaid, Fenrir, and Azami all sitting with three bands at the top of the defender ban list, and you've got one of those banned right now. Dark Zero got rid of the Azami. Valkyrie bringing up the rear with two or two bands will now make it three as that's removed from SSG. Valkyrie, obviously a good operator on every single map, but in particular, especially good on the bigger maps where you can hide those cams mm. all over the place. Cafe is not necessarily known as a huge map, but there are parts of it where a Valkyrie camera can give you a ton of information. Also, well why is Iconic's name still not Iconic yet? Like... Uh, names are hard. You know, it's... <laughs> yeah. We gotta get someone on that. 
I'm not gonna lie. But hey, here we go. Easy on attack. HG defense. Now, like most of the maps like we saw today, like Clubhouse, it can be very hard to attack on Cafe. It's a map where you find yourself in a difficult spot just simply entering the building. You go on the roof, you pop the hatches, the second you drop, you're on the fire, C4 is below, people in piano, mirror window staring down like we see right now from Ashen. It's just very complicated, really. One operator that has been brought into Pro League with a recent buff is Grim. That's an operator that has started making Cafe a little bit easier to attack. Same thing with someone like Capital. These utility-oriented operators really help clear out those strong positions from defenders and put attackers in a better, more comfortable spot. For this particular round, no Grim, but Bolo is on Capital duty. So when they find those players in those strong positions, they can use the fire and get rid of them. This nitro cell that we see on the laundry window, or well, rather laundry going up into the cocktail window is one that has been practiced many, many times. There it goes. DZ avoids it just for now. Fortunately for DZ, they lost Canadian very early. SSG will lose Fultz in response. Both of these teams now struggling. Down one player, but DZ, close enough. Olo can taste it. Right now, playing that small opening inside a bathroom, looking in the back bar, Ashen Falls to Naif. Easy with the upper hand for the moment. Just a little over one minute to go. Yep, still looking good with a minute to go, as you said. The issue is Jaina no upstairs, holding down with the fire. We spoke about it. He's going to burn all the way down. No escape for him, even if he tried. And now DC are very much in the driver's seat with four players against two and every member in basically full health. Thanks to Naif on the thing, get boosting people up with those adrenal surges. SSG will just sit and wait now. As DZ storms their way into the top floor. Bombsite's not up there though. So oh. after you get hold of that diffuser, you need to get down and actually tackle this reading defense that you see unfolding as we get the beautiful boogie drone ripping through the floors. Fuser's been picked up by Pambazoo, but the objective might not be that important. As Iconic falls, it's all up to Forest. Playing bottom white. Rotating over to Reading. Get a good beat on somebody there. Slaughters Bolo. Pambazoo still with Diffuser. Spam pings inside of the site, likely from a bulletproof camera or even a yokai drone. Doesn't matter how they got it. That's all she wrote. EZ prevail in the round number one. And it's a clean start. I mean, from, from start to finish, really. It's a solid DC round where whenever you speak about this team, we think, okay, fundamentals, methodical, kind of slow. That's probably their biggest weakness. They have a lot of rounds, not just with this roster iteration, but ever since Troy joined, basically, where they will be executing with 5, 10 seconds left. And if one thing goes wrong, if that diffuser planter goes down, for example, the round with that is also lost. Even that previous round, it's four versus two into a four versus one, they start planting with less than six seconds left. It's just a little too close for comfort, but when it works, it absolutely works. SSG, they got four different bumps they can play. They just gotta make the choice, which one do they want more? They're starting on these more dynamic bomb sites to start a reading and uh, a library. Now they're going dining and the mining. And this makes sense. When you play top floor, you're kind of stuck in corners. When you're playing that kitchen and kitchen bomb site downstairs, you're kind of stuck in corners too. This makes for the more dynamic bomb sites like we see right now on the primary floor to be what most teams prefer to play right now. Especially like I mentioned earlier, because of operators like the Grim, like the Capital, when you're forced into playing these very static positions, like on the top floor cocktail bomb site, you just find yourself not really having a chance to truly fight back. So, that's why they're gonna choose these bomb sites instead. Also playing the Mossy, the Mute, again, Intel, a very big priority here for teams, both in terms of denying it from the opponent, but also gaining it for themselves. That's why we see, again, Mute, Mossy on defense, and Forest on the attack. Technically, the Ram has a drone, the Boogie drone, but it doesn't really give you Intel, it just destroys the floor. See if Canadian survives the first minute to a minute and a half of action in this round. So I suppose you can add Ram to that drone operator lineup that we talked about earlier, which was Flores, Brava, and Twitch. I do like different drones being brought in. Well, Canadian is still not very much alive, but also involved the other way. Jane, I know killed Canadian in round number one. 
How about Canadian killing J90 to start off round two? Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, the great thing about Canadian dying early, if that were to happen again, is that as the leader of the team, the IGL, you can make a ton of calls because you now have freedom. When you're actively playing in a round, like any other player, you gotta worry about your aim, your positioning, what's going on, sounds, etc. When you die, however, and you're watching player point of views and cameras, you have so much more mental freedom to just lead the team in the right direction. And it's why a Canadian doesn't play the typical laid back, super supportive role in attack and defense. He plays almost in the front very often, especially on the defensive side, because when he then dies early on, if that happens, he can still lead the team. DC progress on top floor right now. Flashbangs fire going out. We see the roamers falling back. They are surrendering all of top floor control to Dark Zero with a full minute and 10 seconds to work with. Again, this mining and dining bomb site. So verticality is still important, but not inside of cocktail, but more so inside of piano. That's where we expect Canadian to go to with those boogie drones of RAM. But they still think there are roamers, it looks like. They're double, triple checking every single corner before saying, guys, the coast is clear. And sadly, no, the boogie drones. It's a disaster. The first one gets caught on the bottom of the wall. And the second one gets destroyed by being tossed into the wall. Or perhaps by the other boogie drone. I'm not entirely sure. They have a mind of their own, don't they? they do. Down goes Iconic to Naif. Now Fultz will follow DZ's entry on Cafe. Picking up where it left off. Oh, Forrest denying a flawless round as he punishes NJR, but now a long rotate over to the bomb site. Forrest does have a nitro cell in back pocket. It's possible with the right read that he could do some serious damage to DZ. Hmm. Forrest battling the caliber based destruction of a shotgun, trying to retake, but it's Bolo to end him in his tracks and give us a beautiful view of the basement. Troy Jaroslavsky's house as DZ <laughs> goes up to nothing. Yeah, another clean run from them. I mean, it just looks like uh, another day in the office, really. It's just composed, it's methodical, it's one, two, three in terms of like steps. And this is what happens when you play not so much like, because like DC are not playing old school seats, so to speak. They're, they're still playing that new style where you spread across and you're playing like with aggression and you're going together like three to one countdowns. But it's very much like a step-by-step -step process that's a bit more predictable, I would say, if you study them, if you know how they play the game. But it's so hard to counter because it's thought out ahead of time. They know who's going to go in what positions, where the fire from Capital is going to go, where the flashbangs are landing. And unless their opponent, so SSG in this case, they land some crazy shots or have like counter intel or like a counter strat, it just looks so difficult, really, to find any footing here on the defensive side in the first two rounds. SSG will call that timeout. It will talk things through and hopefully cook up a plan and a solution at that to gain a couple of rounds here in defense before the side swap. Attackers need to locate and defuse as many bombs as they can. Timeout after two rounds is a very brisk pace to call that. I mean, call out is usually very precise with when to call his timeouts and how to maximize their impact on SSG. I will say, if you think this team is not playing up to its potential with three kills across two rounds, probably a good, <laughs> probably a good time to do it. And probably not playing up to their potential, that's for sure. Mm. And you got to call it early. The big yep. problem with calling it at this current point in time is that you, if things continue to go bad, or if you start to do well and then things go bad again, you can't really fix it, right? We refer to yep. it as a parachute. It's just, that's it. You have to go about it. Oh, what? Oh. Uh, mm. So, that right there might seem quite small, but that can be the sign of a much larger problem. Yeah. Iconic was trying to get into Piano, and right as he does that, J90 starts castling off the door. J90 then pulls out the super shorty, shoots the pan, shoots the wall once, trying to give Iconic a way in. Can't do it, so Iconic has to waste an impact to get it done. You've now cost time, you've wasted an impact, and it's just like that level of poor coordination can start to eat you and the team alive. Those might be the types of small mistakes that call out saw through those two rounds. And that's why he might've thought they, oh yeah, we need to call this timeout. And then that happens right after. 
DC are approaching this from a very linear, direct approach right now. Thatcher, Harbreach, and the Munty means they can just kind of open side walls and maybe approach side very much directly. Capital here can use the smokes on the ceiling of the bomb side to smoke off the verticality because that's SSG's playbook right now. They're playing far back on the bomb side and they're relying on the players up above to deny any plant possibility. But when you have Monty, when you have Capital, smoke the ceiling, Monty walks in, DC, they arguably have a counter strategy angle right now. Of course, it comes down to execution more than anything else. SSG, they got pulls, they have reliable information from up above, but one of those C4s they have, they have two available, have to land onto Monty as he goes to the plant, because if that bomb goes down, it's a done deal for DC in the post plant. Got a you know. drone in the middle of the site. Will certainly age you. This Canadian walks in, electrified through the wall. Here goes the nitro Support. cell dropped from above. Like an anchor. Nobody is found on DZ side of things. J90, first blood yet again, second time through these three rounds. Bolo answers back right away. Canadian trying to drop Forest. It's Bolo to get in on the action as Canadian now must be retrieved. Ashen playing oh. well from above, eliminating Pam Bazoo. It's been a very linear take from Dark Zero. They just wanted to hit the site bang on, and I don't blame them for it. But they haven't done the work needed on the floor above. SSG. Down in numbers before Fultz equalizes. Now it's Ashen in his own plume of smoke as Canadian was reduced to one HP and Ashen's toxic gas cleans up, giving SSG their first round victory. It's a very impressive retake there from SSD. And honestly, I think strategically for a very long time, DC completely won it out. But then a few things go on the side of SSG. They get the injure onto Troy Canadian, which buys them valuable seconds. They, you know, DC, they gotta slow things down, hit the reset, go for the revive. While that's happening, they start doing verticality, they find the kill vertically, an injury on Canadian, and then the toxic babes go out, finding more damage, more injuries, and more kills as well. The entire round was won by Space Station off the bomb site. Despite having two players on site itself, those players fell very early. But we saw the strategy there from both teams. DC, they smoked the ceiling, they smoked the side, and they actually pushed deep with the Monty, taking full bomb side control. SSG, because they had the pulse and because they had that C4, they were countering one another. It was beautiful to watch, but the retake is successful. And I gotta say, one thing that you know, Iconic was great at on a matey, like the way he plays the game and calls as a leader, were the retakes. One thing that SSG just didn't last last round, again, the retakes, playing together, understanding where they can assist each other, despite being in pretty bad positions. But that's your kitchen and kitchen done. It's a very unique set of actions in a round that probably will not happen again in this series. So now, things will change. Upstairs we go, on that primary floor, with a heavy extension up above. We see Aruni Gates, we see Jaeger ADSs, and Vomai, as well as Employable Shield. This is very much like the utility method that we saw, what, two years ago? But in the new style of Siege. Forest first pick, by the way, comes in the first 30 seconds of the round. Goodbye to Nath. He's been doing a pretty solid job supporting this DZ roster. No oh, grim, yeah. though, for the two minutes and 15 seconds that are remaining. That means that you will not be able to have soft destruction work on the top floor and you won't be able to lob those bees down onto that second floor, keeping the defenders in risky positions. NJR thinks he has a read, by the way. I couldn't tell if he had a defender dead to rights on a drone and was looking for something, or if that was just one of the defender cams. All the while this is happening, Ambazoo has found his own way in. Taking some damage, a couple bullets from inside a train, it necessitates an adrenal surge as Canadian looks for the follow-up pick onto him, but cannot get it. That's Fultz positioned in this spot. And if the fight comes to him too close, he's got a shotgun primed and ready. Easy need to be wary of this with half of the round now still to go. And I think it's doing a great job right now. Just sitting back. They know they got that early pick. They're in the driver's seat. They have the advantage. They need to wait for DC now to make the first moves happen. Or, of course, if they have reliable intel, they can seek out a play. But right now, they're, you see the outlines. It's like the server stopped. They're all standing still. They know they do not have to move. DC got the Nomad. It looks like they're trying to go for this kind of like limited take where they take a little bit of top floor, like cigar and stuff. They air trap everything and they might be leaving the location. That's what it looked like. 
Now, however, it seems like they want to actually pick apart and clear top floor. Jaina, no, aggressively swings out, gets shot down by Bolo, and can eat and find a second kill as well. All of a sudden, by moving just an inch each from these two players, they get shut down, and all of a sudden, top floor is not that strong any longer. Just uh, don't mind us. It's going to take the next two and a half rounds for Pambazoo to reload the LMG on red stairs. <laughs> He's letting the rest of the team do all of the work. Because while what? SSG were successful, Bolo is taking matters into his own hands with this round, denying SSG from having an opportunity, unless, of course, Ashen can clutch a 1v4. He's allowed the bomb sites to be taken over by his opponents, his adversaries. As he sees the Finca, there's some strips through Pambazoo. There's no real intel to go off of. Denying Bolo more than three kills in the round is certainly something to be proud of, but too many people from DZ. There was four of them still alive. Bolo dies. There's three more to find you, and they will indeed find you and kill you. DZ making quick work so far of this first half, up three to one. This thing about the current DC iteration that surprised me a bit, especially at its, at its eye. If you're gonna play like Nave, you're thinking, okay, you know, support player from Europe, you know, etc. But Nave is not just a support player. He is phenomenal at actually getting kills and seeking out plays, and he is very intelligent about the way that he perceives wow. Rainbow Six Siege. One thing that Tri wanted to get onto the roster for a long time was a second voice, essentially. A second kind of co-leader, if you will, because it's so hard to have the full overview in the current style of Siege. Attackers and defenders are usually pretty spread out, and as an in-game leader, you know, as any player really, you only really have the information that you see in front of you or that is shared by the other voices in the roster. And bringing on someone like Nave really helps elevate how well Troy can lead the team as well. Because you have more overview, you have more voices, but when it's time to just frack it out, you get Bolo, you get Nave onto the roster, you go, guys, strategically, this round is not looking so good. Let's just start killing the opponents. And they did that last round. It's just, okay, Let's walk into piano, be in the repels, pick up three quick kills, go downstairs, pick up two more. It looks so easy and so simple, but it cannot be understated how difficult it is to do. You cannot just run over your opponents like that. We don't see it all that often, and SSG and their roster is not a team that you just run over. We saw the stat line before this game at live between Dark Steel and SSG as an organization across all their you know, iterations of rosters. And they are very close in terms of matchups. But right now, DC very much looked like they should have been up 4-0, if anything, and are in full control. It really just looks like a different DZ team from that Sonic's match last week as well. Oh, certainly. There are obvious times when you're having a bad game, and there are times when your opponents are having a great game and making you look like you're having a bad game. I mean... Time and time again against W7M, we'll say, well, why are these teams playing so poorly against them? Well, because when you're the best team in the world, you make your opponents look like they've forgotten how to play. DZ didn't really look like themselves last week, not to take anything away from Sonics, but they didn't look as comfortable as they did right now. On the contrary, actually, on the, on the other side of things, SSG don't look like themselves. They're not playing aggressive. Their roams aren't particularly working out. Yeah, J9 knows broken the ice twice, but that's been it, really. The rest of it has been a slog and a grind for Space Station, which again would go back to why Callout would call that timeout after just the second round. Yeah. Still plenty of time to turn this round. SSG on defense for just two more rounds, and then maybe they'll find a second wind on attack. One of the slowest rounds so far. No killing, no entering, I think entering the building for the attackers. Fire goes out, some bees, etc. This could be the telltale sign, but nope, Nave gets shut down, and surely that should mean that DC are now locked out for this one. Should. You still what? got Bolo on the board. Yeah. Try to keep try to keep numbers close. Bolo had a very impressive previous round with three kills to his name. Currently leading the lobby with seven. Iconic, the only player so far yet to get on the board. Yes, his name is Iconic, not Zidane. Nadine hmm. creeping up onto this position. I don't oh, know if he expected friend. Iconic to be so close, but it's Iconic's first kill. I might have cast her curse Canadian just a little bit too much there as now it all falls up to NJR as two separate players from SSG will be around the corner. <laughs> NJR actually flashes himself. Unlucky. SSG wins their second round. 
The reason why I said that DC looked like locked out is because the whole point of that strategy when like you go on cocktail repel and white hallway repel is that you spend the Grimbies, you spend the capital fire, you do some flashbangs, you repel in, that's your way into the map and into that round. When you die on the repel before even entering the building, you spent all your resources. You don't really get a second go or a second option. And that's why we saw DC being, okay, let's just, again, try and wing it on the fly. Canadian walks into side, just crouch walking, gammed in that 50-50, ends up losing it, and that just completely seals them out. It's a very big commitment when you're on those window repels because you don't have time to go on the roof and spend 30, 20 seconds to like rotate that way or go all the way down to the bottom floor and walk up a staircase. So one of the downsides of Cafe, you're very much committed to which portion of the map that you're going to be going to. Same in a map like Consulate, simply because it's a very long map where the rotations are just not that quick. SSG now looking better though, figuring things out as they go after a technical timeout. 2-3 still down this one round though, and with this final on the half, they can equalize to a 3-3 half, but it comes down to again that kitchen and kitchen bum side, which historically not all that great with all the defending side, but they made it work last time they tried. Spot that Iconic is holding inside a bakery can be one that is not necessarily tough to flush out, but and proved to be quite a large obstacle for teams that aren't particularly well coordinated. DZ doesn't usually have that issue, but it's a similar spot to before Wamai existed. You used to see a Rook or a Doc play there with a Jaeger giving ADSs just to keep you safe from any kind of projectile or grenade spam that could go in in that direction. Doesn't really look like Dark Zero has much interest in Bakery, at least at the moment. They'll clear out the top floor first, as a team does. Make sure there are no roamers. Figure out where these players from SSG are inside of the site and then go about your job to ensure that you're cracking it open and forcing them far enough back, whether you want to do a freezer take and drop hatch or if you want to go from bakery into kitchen. All that said, it's been a minute and there's been no real action so far. Reloading. Nope. A classic top down with no roamers means a severe lack of action, but like Oregon Basement, which we saw twice earlier today, it comes down to the 5v5 slash 4v4 execute, which honestly I find quite exciting because it gets very chaotic out of nowhere. It does mean that for two and a half minutes, we just watch as these boogie drones, almost perfectly in sync, will tear apart the entire floor instead of mining. And then next up will be, of course, train and then dining. Break apart the entire floor, open up the hatch, Hammer's got a yellow ping. They know the player's stuck in a corner, but they have no way to really clear it out. AB Canadian with those O's could rotate over, but he's so far off. Well, actually, he's right here. Never mind. But no! Forrest just walks in. No nade needed. They just get a freebie. What happens when you tear open the floor? You make life quite miserable for those defenders. Forrest will not live long enough to tell his kids the tales of exactly what happened there. Polo <laughs> now will apply some... Pressure over on white stairs. And the one thing those boogie drones are actually quite good for is something that Gridlock was good for at the beginning as well, which is the ungodly amount of noise that they can make. <laughs> the track stingers from Gridlock are thrown out. It can conceal a plant. Polo was hoping to open up some of that wall into freezer. He won't get it done. Instead, Canadian will drop with those to shield in hand. Near sighted is now J90 looks for a kill from that deployable shield. Ashen and uh. Fultz getting on the board. DZ suffering for it. How does Iconic pull that off? He vaults into Freezer, shuts down Pambazoo. Another there to drop as Iconic is just ready and waiting for all of these engagements and gets all of them as SSG snipes the round away from DZ. They certainly snipe it away, but I gotta blame DZ for that one. They heavily misplayed the round by my standards at least because they had three players drop the freezer hatch or two drop the freezer hatch. One person was bought on white staircase. Nobody was on the vertical up above. Nobody was covering the plant. So Canadian on the O set drops first. He has the shield you know, in front of him. He walks deep, ready to plant. There is no C4s on defense. There is no toxic vapes. There's not even a single impact grenade. That is a done deal for Troy the moment that he arrives in the bomb site. All DC need is the most crucial step that cannot be missed. Someone's gotta stay on those holes you opened up, you know, 50 seconds early in that round. And there wasn't because they dropped three people on the backside. There was no one left up above essentially. 
So SHG just run through site. They pick up the kills. And again, they excel in that retake position. And they have to play together and just isolate members or put two versus twos to like leverage back the numbers, essentially. We're gonna have a quick tech pause, I guess. And while we can see Iconic with his, uh, his sheet going through the motions here saying, this is the breakdown of our upcoming rounds. Now... I'm not I'm not a, I'm not gonna narc here okay but what <laughs> if this is actually a technical pause mm -hmm. teams are not technically supposed to be able to talk to each other if it's a tactical timeout perfectly fine but if it is actually a tech pause neither team should be able to communicate in that tech pause and they certainly shouldn't be able to do stratting so Hopefully we can get some clarification here as to whether it's a tech pause or it's a timeout that's been called. Remember there were some, I don't think there were any fines that were given at the Six Invitational, but multiple teams received warnings from the admins about talking during tech pauses. Yep. Distinction here for those that are curious is that a tactical timeout can be called once per team per map. SSG called theirs after the second round concluded as DZ was up to nothing. It has seemingly paid off. Since that timeout, SSG has gone three and one. But a tech pause is something that is usually outside of a team's control. It can be something like server issues. It could be something like your headphones stop working or your team speak stops working or there's some kind of game issue. That's usually called by the admins. And that is a time when you are not allowed to, as far as we are aware, strategize. So we'll wait if there's any confirmation to come in. You can wait from here. I don't know if there was any server issues, but I will say that at one point, Iconic was on the bottom of the server. Now he's moved up above Fultz, so maybe there was a reconnect that needed to happen. I'm not entirely certain. Hmm, actually a good uh, observation, because it's true. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's important just to touch on your point that there are consistency in rules because it seems to kind of change back and forth. Sometimes players can talk, sometimes players cannot talk. It's also a bit confusing for, for viewers and even for us casters, you know, like what is the angle here for players because it's a mixed bag. But it's tied up 3-3. It is a 5v5. And, you know, now we got to figure out for SSG, do they know that same kind of attacking lingo that Dark Zero did? Because, yeah, we're thinking, okay, it's a close series. But getting three attack rounds on Cafe, and arguably Dark Shield could have gotten a 5 one half if they had fixed up so those like tiny mistakes. That's a very impressive uh, feat to achieve, essentially, or accomplish. The same kind of utility being played from both sides. Castle Barricades, Aruni Gates, nice ash charge there, hitting the floor to circumvent the Aruni Gate, but still blowing up the Castle Barricade. Small little tricks there, saving you ADS there, essentially, or in this case, Aruni Clear. Nate kill actually happening, hello? Doesn't happen all that often. The fire, of course, forced Bolo on the desk. The nade bounced, then finished him off. He was pretty low on HP, but he was not injured. It was a live grenade kill. I like how we have to create this distinction now. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's so different, right? I know, I know, I know. Big change up. Nave may be in a bit of trouble at top white right now as uh, there are smokes that go out, bees that go out as well. Bolo and Nave, the two newest additions to DZ are gone. Space Station are just crushing DZ through these last couple rounds. Dark Zero in a troubling spot. Iconic has been dropped, but other than that, SSG are fighting at levels well ahead of DZ. It's all up to Canadian and NJR. Canadian actually having relatively good game by his own standards. Hmm. He's the mastermind of this roster, but he's not a mechanical god. He's certainly not known for top fragging. The fact that he is keeping lockstep with the rest of DZ is usually a worrying sign. We'll have to pad these stats now as he's last alive. NJR killed. Canadian struggling with oh. Fultz who dances from above and SSG take the lead. It was actually very cheeky because it looked like he was going to drop down. So Canadian like tracks the drop as well, but he just sidestepped on the balcony instead. But yeah, SSG just proved to us they very well know how to attack. They did the steps very well. Step one, clear out those arena gates, clear out the castle barricades, weaken the setup that DC has built for themselves up above. 
And then we saw step two, utility. The fire paired with the grenade, paired with the bees from the Grim, perfectly cleared up the majority of top floor. Then they raffle in and it's just pure dominance in the server, also having those flanked locked down the entire time. And now we'll go for that tech break last round to a tactical timeout from the setup DC now because they recognized they got absolutely bamboozled in that first defensive round. What did you drop? Uh, my pen. I angrily put it on my mouse pad. But nothing was dropped in reality. Easy, obviously not liking that first look that they saw of this second half, but I don't think it's just that. I think that DZ's got some greater struggles here based on the results of the previous rounds. SSG since the timeout now up to an impressive four and one tally, continuing to add to the success round over round. Ashen has picked things up. Iconic had zero kills two rounds ago. He's up to four already, which meets or exceeds everybody on DZ whose name is not Bolo. Hmm. Yeah, one of the downsides of uh, individual performances is that, you know, you can win rounds and say, oh, you know, they're doing great. Don't worry about it. But if it is just one player popping off and nothing else really working out, in the bigger picture of things, those rounds are not working out greatly for you. Now, I will say, though, Bolo got a lot of his kills based off of teamwork on the attack inside. It was not just him walking into a door getting a kill. There were some flashbangs going. There are drones at his feet. Like, they had good reliable intel. And he just had to kind of clutch up. So, I'm not too worried for Dark Zero in terms of, like, the killing department. But more so, it seems like their communication is a bit off. Right? On the last couple attack rounds, small issues with massive consequences went the wrong way. On that first defense, they didn't know that they were proactively playing the round. They had a stop position. Then they died in that stop position, and then they had no way back in. It was very important on Cafe that you play proactively. You're kind of expecting or maybe, you know, calculatedly guessing what the enemy might be doing next. Because once you commit to being stuck in a corner, oh, you're going to be stuck in a corner for a while because of these repel angles from outside the building, etc. So it's very important that you have a good read on your opponent's next move as well as the current move. Bolo, the first pick so far in this round. These teams converting the round right after a tactical timeout in the right direction, at least so far for Dark Zero. One reason why Doc sees play at this level is that if there's any chip damage that's done, just these minor skirmishes where you lose 30 to 60% of your HP, the stim pistols from Doc can get you back to full HP and then give you the over buff right now that you see both Bolo and Canadian hanging on to. It doesn't last forever, it slowly wears away. There you have both Bolo and Canadian now back at full HP. Sledge is a rarity in the meta at this point. Unfortunately, we won't see much of it with Forrest being the one riding the sledge now gone from action. Oh, I mean, thing is not necessarily that important. Oh, C4, though, now, this is more important. Now Ram is down as well. No vertical play left over for the attack inside. And see they, oh, I was going to say Sedane, but rather uh, Iconic struggling there on the white staircase also getting shut down by DC. Ashen fishing from above. Just zooms out at the wrong time. Unlike. It's not exactly winnable for SSG if he gets that pick, but it at least becomes far more likely. Oh. Bolts clears it out. He'll start getting the diffuser down. He doesn't feel particularly good about it, and that's because the kill holes from above for good reason. Ashen coming to the rescue. Canadian to deal immense amount of damage as Ashen will now move elsewhere. You've got a Solus and a Pulse on the board. It doesn't even matter if it's a 5v5. This is a harrowing prospect to get that Diffuser planted. Ashen eliminates Nafe. The Intel Ops from DZ are still very much in play and they both have a read as to where this player from SSG is. Ambazoo gets the kill though. He and Canadian were both in the hunt. And the long look of frustration on Canadian's face mm. tells the story. This is a grueling match for both of these teams. Yeah. I was uh, I was talking, I was streaming earlier today and I was talking to chat about like the longevity of players and what the schedule looks like when you play in Pro League because you do have like 
eight to 12 hour days, which is like you're scrimming, you're doing theory, like you're boot camping before like a major, for example, like it's pretty hard to have that like work life balance that enables you to play for a long time. And then every time that's a topic, people go, what about Canadian? And it is a really good point, right? Now. What about this guy? He's been around for as long as you can remember. He's been in so many grand finals on both the losing side and the winning side. You know, roster changes, he knows them. He, they, you know, DC, they keep rebuilding, changing things, you know, building in, you know, young rookie players, for, trialing happily, you know, Gavin, Rise, NTR, Pambasu, be like, oh, guys, we'll teach you the game. That's all Canadian, time and time again. And he finds himself in yet another season. It seems like he can just, he's always here. It's like one of the few staples of Siege Pro League. Canadian is going to be in the season. He's going to make an international tournament pretty much every single time. He won't win it necessarily with DC, but they're always there fighting for it and getting closer and closer with time. I wish at one point in my career, back when I was a player, that I had the pleasure of, of you know, playing on a team with Canadian. Yeah, I was a content creator for DC, but we didn't work together like one-to-one. -one. I played on the Fabian. That was a legendary leader. But Troy is... Uh, Definitely in a, in a league of his own as well. It cannot be understated the value that it brings to a team in a roster. Obviously, I don't play, so I can't really speak to the experience that comes with playing with these players, but every single person who has teamed with Canadian has talked at length about his vision of the game, his understanding of the game, and the impact that he can have on teams. Another North American player that was talked about in a very similar sense, albeit quite differently was super yeah because there's no arguing super's mind for the game but obviously super's impact in the matches in the actual game was a far cry from what you saw from canadian it just got to a point where sonics had to move super or whether super wanted to move i'm not entirely sure the circumstances but the team needed another player with firepower to step in there will come a point in Rainbow Six where Canadian finds himself in that same position where he just can't hang, you know, he just can't hang anymore with players in terms of gun skill, but for the time being, he's got some issues, but still showing up when need be. Six and five, by the way, as he was being hunted down by Fultz's Deimos. Forrest dies again to start off the round, not exactly what SSG wants. Canadian was being tracked by Fultz, gets finished off by J90. These two have been involved in the fray, Nick, four times now by my count. Yeah. Through nine rounds is quite odd, but still very funny. No, it is. And again, it's the vertical players of Forest and General always falling early or struggling in these rounds. Very important positions because they got to break the floor. They got to do vertical destruction. Ashen, though, steps up, finds a kill. But look at that. Pambasu goes on droned, unpunished, and gets a kill. Now it's chaos in the server. But thankfully, Iconic is quickly there to trade it back. But look at this. It's just G. Two players on a single point of health against three toxic babes from Nave. That could definitely be one of the ways to go out here. It will kill J90 with a single huff of that gas. Iconic might survive one, but it'll be tough. The only player at full HP was Ashen. He gets out dueled by Nafe. There's Iconic dead to NJR, secured by the impact. Call that a Pokeball, as he has caught Iconic. Now it's J90 to ensure he doesn't get caught with Diffuser in hand, but Ram is not a particularly agile operator. Nearsighted on the red. As he drops, there's a shotgun from Nave waiting for him. That'll seal the deal on the round, and Dark Zero comes out ahead. Not a whole lot of celebration there. I mean, yeah, you're only up 5-4 and stuff, but it seems like it's like, okay, boys, we uh, we won the round, you know? Let's uh, let's go next round and win that too, if possible. I like it, though. You know, we see a lot of different approaches in the server where some teams and some players, they will almost over-celebrate all the small victories and try and ride that high, that momentum, that like really positive energy. But those same teams often, when things are not going well, they look so shattered, almost like their soul was taken. DC play it more, I almost say, not emotionless, but more of a cool, calm collective when it comes to like, their emotions. The job's not done. That was like one round of many. We gotta go for the next one. And it's fascinating to watch just the differences, especially on LAN. The loudness of some teams versus the quietness of others. All, of course, doing it with the intent of they thinking that their system is the better one. But at the very least, that system that they use worked better for that specific team. 
Some things changed and some things stayed the same. Utility operators, very similar to before. Got the dock with a gun for the healing capabilities, and then it's this pure utility game for Dark Zero. Mute, well, my Mira, Castle, all about sitting up, uh, up shop upstairs, holding cigar cocktail, having pressure in towards piano from bathroom as well. And that's also why we see SSG again counter picking very heavily. Ibana, Capital, Twitch, Grimash, the entire lineup is basically one big counter lineup where they can deal with Mirror Window. That's Ash and its Twitch. They can even fire those player positions. That's gonna be the Capital. If they need intel on those player positions, it's the Grim. So this is all about utility fighting utility. These openings are so important for both sides. And just GLC have done a great job of just making sure they have all the tools they need to have a good counterplay. Nave sees it though, shuts down the first switch run of Manny to come. And it's gonna stall out the attack for now. Is just G not Wait, getting what they want. Did you say the first Twitch drone of many to come? Yeah, there you go. There's there's many. There's one, two, three. Them. What do you she mean? Has, okay, many? She, has, she has four drones, there's okay? Only one more. She has two Twitch drones, so she's four drones. That's a lot of drones. Alright. Oh, I'll... The first or second Twitch drone, the first of many drones to come. I'm sorry. Oh wow. Watch yourself. Thank you. You're nice. I'll, be I'll be careful, okay? I know I'm slipping here, okay? It's late. It is 3 a.m. in Denmark. Well, Forrest involved in the first fight again. Third round in a row, but he comes out of the favorable side this time as Bolo is punished. Now utility being dumped towards the top of White Stairs, courtesy of Iconic. He will have some struggles to open up the castle barricade, keeping the defenders safe from bathroom into back bar. NJR and Nitro Cell find Forrest. Fultz trades back onto Pambazoo. Every single trade that happens benefits SSG up to this point. Nay will equalize onto Fultz. Basically, you get a kill from SSG and then you get killed immediately thereafter. But a kudos, honestly, to Dark Zero for keeping this close. The fact that SSG yeah. is getting a pick and then is being traded right back bodes well for DZ for the remainder of the round. So bright spots for both of these teams, but a bit of a dark spot as Dark Zero doesn't understand that the diffuser is gonna go down. J9O has it in hand, SSG holding from above, and DZ will now have to scramble. Nafe on the bottom floor, NJR on the middle floor, Canadian all the way on top. Every single floor being covered by DZ, but they need to coalesce around that middle floor where the diffuser is located. NJR will sit on it, gets the disable down, Shot through the door, traded back. Naif is last man standing as Iconic eliminates Canadian as well. The coverage from above, far too good. SSG equalized. None of these games are going to be blowouts today. Hmm. 10 rounds, five apiece so far in Cafe. That was a very classic, quote unquote, Astralis round, basically, from SSG. And if you know, you know, they have a lot of former Astralis members here in the, in, in the roster. It's when they go for an off pace play. Where, if you're Dark Seer in that round, you're thinking, ah, they're gonna destroy the floor, they're gonna put the flank cams, they're gonna be planting maybe 30 seconds from now. Because mind you, when the bomb went down, there's like 50-40 seconds left. But this is where the off timing comes. They just full spin the site, instantly starts planting. And it, they don't even have cover. It's technically speaking a really bad plan to go for, but it works so well because Dark Seer are not ready for it. It's not supposed to happen, if you will. So it catches them off completely off guard. And it's the same thing when we saw SSG. This is like seven rounds ago, back when they were on defense. Often when SSG are in like a 2v1 situation, they will do this very unique thing of stacking players together in the exact same spot. One person standing, one person crouched, holding the same like exact angle essentially, making it a 2v1. That's also a good old quote-unquote Astralis thing has been brought over to this current iteration of Space Station. And I love to see those small like characteristics and team traits kind of transferring because it shows like what kind of players are coaching staff in this case of Fallout, for example, where that kind of stems from. So back to a 5v5, it really is a back and forth here. And yeah, you're right. Last round, it was very impressed that DC kept up with the trades. It's very hard on Cafe as a defender to find those straight kills, because you often die to the window repels, etc., to utility, capital fire, nades, etc. But DC did do a good job at that. It just happened to be that diffuser went down out of nowhere, and then again, now those post plans are so difficult when you're playing defense. My favorite round? Yep. The penultimate Winner. round. Winner, I mean, it could be a penultimate round. It could yeah. go to overtime. An ultimate round of regulation. Yes. I'm willing, I'm willing to say that. 
another crack mm. at this middle floor bomb site for Dark Zero, who seemed to have worked things out through the mid round. Oh no. Then just ultimately losing the plot. Someone help. Just as Pambazoo is done. Jumping out of white, Ashen kills him and then hits him with the question mark, <laughs> which probably hurts more than any bullet that Pambazoo suffered. Damn. I mean, I don't hate the jump out like that, but I, I, I like seeing when teams do it like together. Let's say someone else jumped out, saved Pambasu, they made the play together, etc. So, okay, you're playing 2v1. Unless Ashen hits some ridiculous shots, surely he will die. Instead, Pambi probably saw with the scan that he was on cams or, you know, looking the wrong way or whatever, or he might have had info on him. He jumps out solo, it doesn't go the right way, now DCP 4v5. It's just not a great look, really. Especially from a team that is used to having such good coordination. We don't see that right now. It seems like the comms are not there for DC right now. Things worse. are obviously of concern for this team. Neither have access to their timeout any longer, so... Oh my! Oh. Olo is gonna try to keep Dark Zero in this one with a hero play upstairs in Cocktail. Both Fultz and Jainino were sent in to kill Bolo, and neither succeed. Utility now from SSG slowly running out, all of it in the hands of Capital at this point. No smokes in the pocket for Forest, no Twitch drones either. No bees for Ashen's Grim. So you've got to go for kills, and that's exactly what SSG is going to do. Removing everybody in the server except for Canadian that has a DZ at the end of their name, and now he's next at the hands of Iconic the King. SSG moves to match point. I mean, it looked like Bolo might have saved the round there for a brief moment, but the thing about Space is that whenever they kind of get knocked down a little bit and you think, ah, they got to reset the round, they got to fall back, they got to regroup. No, they just tend to re-aggress into it and continue on that same track they were before with like that small adaptation. Okay, they're in that top floor verticality. That's not going to stop them. They're still going to proceed going forward. And they're kind of stealing back these rounds that you think other teams probably would have lost. SST and 6-5 now, kind of clawing it back. If we go back to the very beginning here, DC won like the first three out of four rounds, so to speak. It was 2-0 for Dark Zero, then it became a 3-1 for Dark Zero. And then ever since that scoreline, it's just been SSG equalizing one round behind equalizing one round behind now they're in the lead on match point and they have the you know dc they gotta make the decisions here what bumps do they go to they gotta go kitchen and kitchen he's starting not a great side for the defending side but in this matchup for some reason it tends to work out pretty well for defense now space have blown up their roster they have gone through a couple of different iterations but they settle on this kind of do it all roster right you got double verticality on Forest and I know on Ram and Buck, which they need because one of them always dies early. So that's a great like safety net, essentially. They get Iconic on the IQ. They can find stuff like, let's say, if DC played an Echo or a Cheeky C4 somewhere, that's going to be taken care of. They have Roam Clear in the Deimos on Fultz. And they got Grim, which is just always great, you know, generally speaking. Heartbridge Gadget, Secondary Shotgun, Great Primary, and always useful Gadget, whether it's Roam Clearing or for Execute. This is probably one of the strongest opera lineups for whatever might happen to them. So it's a great kind of uh, taking all the boxes here from SSG. But it comes down to, again, the execute, the specifics. We, we know there are no roamers from Dark Zero. But they're just going to double check with demos, you know. We're going to scan Nath. He's in the downstairs and kitchen near the bomb site. They should know now that the coast is clear. It was a breakneck pace that was established early on, Nick, has fallen off. SSG have been very methodical with these attacks. Both of these teams have had issues with speed in the past. SSG with almost being too fast, DZ with being too slow. Reloading. Having an SSG team that is firing on all cylinders is a frightening thing. I mean, you've got a lot of really good tools here. I like the Astralis comparisons because a lot of people will look at this and this SSG team has the skeletons of the Astralis squad, you know? Yeah. What do you do? You take Fultz from the old SSG team, you add Ashen, who's a, who was at the time a rookie, and... Well, no shuttle, no DP fire, but 
Bones are there, and that Astralis team always had good bones. <laughs> Being able to push DZ to O2 is quite bad, frankly. But I will say, if, if you consider that Sonics and SSG might be top four teams in North America, it doesn't mean that this stage is doomed for Dark Zero, but DZ starting off 0-2 is especially bad for their Manchester chances. Obviously wanting to keep themselves in this, leadership comes from the leader himself, and Canadian will step up, rise to this occasion, eliminating Fultz. No Deimos, no ability, narrow down these remaining defenders. Forrest, getting the diffuser oh. down before he's met at the hands of Bolo with a Nitro Cell. J9 now inching his way out of Freezer to try and take up position as he eliminates NJR. Looking for more, can't find it. He's lost Ashen, so it's just him and Iconic. Iconic now swinging around over towards Whiskey. Bolo dies and Iconic gets baited in. He gets a kill, but he's traded out immediately and DZ is at their best when they are trading. They are keeping it close together. <laughs> that will 100% be taken out of context and I am here for it. Bolo allows DZ to go to overtime. There is still more work to be done as we are guaranteed at least two more rounds. It really feels like when DZ are down bad and struggling, there is just one person that keeps saving them. At SI, honestly speaking, it was Naif. It, like, so many rounds. Now, right now, domestically, it's Bolo. And yeah, whenever he tries to save the round, it doesn't always pan out into a victory, but he's the reason why it looks like they have a really good fighting chance. What we just witnessed was an actual save. If that bomb goes down, which was very close, I think less than a second or two, that might just be it. That might be a done deal. 7-5 victory for SSG. But it gets denied by the C4 out of nowhere from Bolo. Now we're in overtime. It's 6-6. EC will stay on the defense. SSG stays on attack. Things stay the same. As with the bomb side. Because straight back to kitchen and kitchen they will go. But if we look at the lineup. Now, very different, right? Fenrir, Solus, and Lesion. This speaks more to our roaming presence, trying to again really force the attackers to go low on time. Then the Echo comes into play. They plan with zero seconds. Yoka is done. Bam, boom, you win the round. The other one is you try and play for kills. You roam actively, maybe get a kill or two, and you hope that's enough to basically take like pick apart the attack and lineup, where either they will lose you know, their droning, they will lose their soft destruction, or they will lose some crucial intel that they have available to them, or utility rather that they have available to them. So, Dark Zero completely changing the win condition for this round compared to that of the last. This is not the penultimate round, by the way, because there's at least two more to go. This could be the penultimate round. If one of these teams wins overtime 2 nothing. I know the score says 6-6, six, six, but imagine it's 0-0 zero, zero and it's first to two. That's really all you got to do. Sure. Canadian gets pretty good value out of the Solus as Pambazoo looked for a kill, could not find it out on balcony. J90 was not far removed from where Canadian was looking. I mean, it's uh, another roam clear, but it's still not really speeding up here. They're kind of slowing down, and this often happens in overtime. Oh, as I say that, Canadian finds bolts. That's Jackal off the board, but a good trade there back onto Pambazoo. Equalizes again into a 4v4. But often teams know time will slow things down. Higher pressure, you know, if you lose, that consequence of that much bigger. But DC are stuck in these kind of tough positions. Bolo, very much stuck inside of train. Player on top floor as well, but it's just they might be hitting the side here, I'm not entirely sure. Suddenly, there are only six people remaining. As everybody is killing everybody oh, yeah. in and around the bomb site, the execute seems to be going completely underway. Bolo with one, he's killed. Ash in a miracle play. It's up to Canadian to save the day for his team against his opposing team, his former team. He does some damage, but it's Ashen to Roar from inside a kitchen, and SSG will move to match point. <laughs> what even happened that round? We're seeing players fighting in the roam, top floor and primary first floor, and then all of a sudden, they're on the bomb site. Three attackers, only two defenders, and the whole like strategical element of that round goes right out the window. DC... Wanted to stall for time, deny the roam clear. SSG, they kind of half commit to the roam, half commit to the side, but it's over at half the round left in terms of time, essentially. And the echo doesn't matter, the roam doesn't really matter, the retake isn't successful. SSG, they've made a pretty decent comeback here, I gotta say. But that's in the attacking side where they looked like they were very much in control. 
Now, because it's, it's, it's no time, you swap sides every single round. They either have to win here in defense and show us they can do it all, or they gotta go all the way to 7-7 and risk it on their final round, which will be on the attack if they go there. Tough one, though. And you're right, DC going 0-2 to start things off is not a great look. It's not over by any means, but it's certainly not what, what we expected from them either. It's been a battle of the beasts. Both of these teams obviously playing at SI, both having very high aspirations and thinking that they are absolutely capable of deep runs. North America did not have the greatest set of results in Brazil. And they had decent representation in the top six, but ultimately couldn't get past that very first set of matches. Brazilian fans loved it, though, getting to have Brazilian teams make it that deep oh, yeah. on in. I mean, it's always hard playing in front of a crowd like that, too. I think, I think oh, it's absolutely. hard to it's hard to explain, but there's something about 10,000 people rooting for your downfall in person that can be kind of hard to deal with as a player sometimes, you know? <laughs> it's certainly a factor. Something that goes often seldom unseen. That single drone can lead to a kill. And that single kill can lead to a huge, huge opportunity for the attackers and even a potential round win all off of one piece of information. And it'd be very challenging to see that at this level of play. Teams are constantly gaining information, whether it be on attack or on defense. And it is often a mystery to us unless we go back into the replay files as observing can only do so much there's just an abundance of things to be looking at at all times i've said this many many times but observing is genuinely an art and i don't i don't envy their job because it is significantly harder than ours <laughs> yeah. this this that map is... in particular has been absolutely chaotic i wouldn't even know where to start that was a good point. I mean, right now, what are we looking at? Like, what, what's happening? Who's going to be the player to make the first move? There are 10 players. Most are standing still. But one person will make a move at some point that will spiral things out of control in a snowballing-like effect. Right now, it's Dinano on the fire. Again. And it spreads, and he goes down. But that took two minutes of effort just to clear out that first player. Now, DC, they really got to speed up. We spoke about this earlier. DC tend to have a time problem. This is overtime, and right now, they are having a time problem. 40 seconds to go, it is 5v4 in their favor, but they're not gonna have time to clear everything out successfully. Oh, oh my! No! How does he get away with that? Ash in the run out onto Terrace, and he'll head for home! He might have just completely That's destroyed it. any hopes of a comeback from Dark Zero as SSG doubles up on numbers and continues their winning ways. All they need to do is find Bolo, who is looking to break 20 kills, but can't get the job done. SSG, wake up and dominate Dark Zero, winning it in overtime. And there's the king himself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a slow start, but oh my, the ending. Ashen also really finished on 19 kills himself. They're getting so many highly impactful kills round after round, and especially in overtime, on match point, that's how you ended. A run out, getting a double kill, catching the perfect timing on the repel animation. I mean, that is just a heartbreaking round for DC because they had the opening kill. They've all got the same pair of glasses on. <laughs> I, they, they are so corny. I love it though. I absolutely love how they just lean into that corny and dorkiness. I think it's excellent and it makes for great content. And when I say those words, I mean them endearingly. I'm not trying to belittle them. I genuinely think that kind of thing brings a lot of spice to our eSport and all eSports, and we would be better off if more teams did the type of thing that SSG does after the matches. But Nick, that's it for this particular match. There's one more to go. Both of these teams have been in action earlier today. I'm not gonna spoil who they are, because if you haven't been paying attention, we said it a couple times, you're gonna fail that part of the test. We got a break ready for you. We'll be back in a couple minutes.
The 29th chapter in the textbook of Dark Zero and Space Station just got written. Another best of one in the books, and now Space Station has officially tied Dark Zero in the amount of wins they have one another since 2019. An 8 6 cafe game now means that Space Station and DZ have won the same amount of games against one another over the past five years. And even if that game was a little slower than we thought and wasn't the rage in the cage that maybe we hyped it up to be, still very solid siege from both teams overall. Solid siege indeed. It was a very slow burn game. We actually saw a couple Capital fires, you know, burning people out. But when it came down to the slow back and forth, just really winding down the time, this game was all about utility, execute, and following through. And that's what we saw from both teams, and that's why it just went down to the wire round after round. And it came down to some hero plays as well. And, you know, we hyped it up. I said, Iconic, give me a little something. He did. We said, Ashen, he's got something in the tank. He delivered. And, of course, Bolo gave us a little bit of that show as well, right? We saw a little bit of that flash. Even NJR, he was positioned in one round under the freezer hatch. Yeah. Just sitting there waiting for someone to walk up to him. A ballsy play. It worked for him. Of course, SSG coming out overall in OT, though, after they just put together a little bit more a little bit more good siege consistently. It almost felt like every round that had Kitchen in it, at some point, it was all freezer hatch oriented. Every time, whether it's someone vaulting in, if it's someone dropping, if it's an execute, if we're hotboxing bunker or something, all of it relates back specifically to that one site. But there were other things played in this game. There's other stuff we can focus on. The most exciting part was definitely the start of the game when SSG was on defense, and obviously DC was going step by step at clearing out, and they were obviously picking up steam. And then you saw the wheels turning in SSG's head. They decided to stall out a little bit more and force DZ, instead of fighting them head on, force them to come to you, force them to execute. And that's when they were able to utilize their trades and utilize the utility. Because at first, it was all DZ the whole time with the crossfires that they were setting up. We talked about it in the pre-show. They wanted SSG to go for those fights. Wasn't going in their favor. So props to SSG for being able to realize that, forcing DZ to do that, and then just being one step ahead, going back and forth, trying to out-adapt Dark Zero. And when SSG moved on to the attacking side, I loved the innovation we saw from them as well. We saw a little bit more Deimos in the mix today, something yep. we've seen quite a good bit. We saw one round in particular where they used that Deimos, that death tracker, to find Canadian on the Solus track him down and take him out. Did that around the 90 second to one minute mark left, really allowing them a little bit more freedom come that execute phase, as you mentioned, Fox, because they did not have to worry about the Solar Scanner. Denying that diffuse really opened their options for them. They opened them, absolutely. If you are a big authentic Siege fan, this is a game that you love to watch because it was really just a methodical brain battle, team after team, just slowly dissecting the other. It really came down to those last of executes. The stats are just so close together in the way both teams were able to perform. And it just came down to when that pressure was on the backs of both teams, big players made big plays, Ashen jumped out the window, and they were able to clean it up in the last two rounds, just sweep it to 8-6. Speaking of Ashen, because it's Cafe and because it's such a massive map, he had free reign to do almost whatever he felt like on Cafe. 19 frags for the young man, and all of it felt like it came together here on round three, and he simply didn't stop from that point on. I mean, it was just, again, the word we use to describe Ashen is consistent. And crazy that we're saying that with someone who drops 19 kills. He's also crazy, to he's be fair. Crazy. He's crazy. He's crazy. He's consistent. He's reliable here. And it's not like he's dropping 19 kills every single game consistent, but he is a reliable per performer for this team. We see that time and time again. That's why we hyped him up coming into Damn. this game. And yet again, he did not disappoint. Six multi-kills. He didn't disappoint at all. I mean, when you're put in these positions, especially with the pressure on the line, some players crumble under that pressure, some players thrive. Obviously, Ashen is the latter. He plays a lot better when the backs are against him, when he has everything on his shoulders. Because he's in such a comfortable environment, he gets to just have that little bit of fun, a little bit of extra playroom, and he's the player that's going to go for those plays. And if he dies, he knows that he has everybody else to be able to play behind that utility. I also feel like he had a little bit of the vengeance stim running through his veins because he went against Dark Zero at SI and wasn't able to get the dub, and now he's able to do that here, even if it's just in a best of one. He's the top performer. Iconic went from bottom of the scoreboard last week to second place just behind him, and even though Bolo didn't win, he was still giving us highlight reel clips. We would have shown them earlier had DZ won. He came really close, but DZ just couldn't get it over the line. Great player. I mean, always has been, and it's a great addition to this team, or 
good that he's coming back to this team. And yeah, yeah he, he had a good performance. It's something he did last week, as you mentioned. If he can keep that up, right, and the rest of this DZ core can match that, I think they're, again, on to greener pastures. Today they had a tough opponent, and playing that slow, methodical style, they leaned into it. SSG leaned into it. Both teams can do it. And the better team just came out on top. Bolo shook the rust off, and obviously it looks disheartening if you're a DZ fan going down 0-2, yeah. but they played two very strong opponents, so I have no fear with the rest of Dark Zero, especially with them taking a little bit more time, getting a little bit more info on other teams. Dark Zero is a very strategy-based team, so more information means more strategy. Well, for right now, DZ is 0-2, but Space Station are 2-0. and Let's get Ashton in here to talk about how good that win must have felt. Brother, I remember watching that clip from SI, you getting right in Troy's face. This this game, you did the exact same thing, but now you actually have a dub. Tell me how good it feels, man. Yep, I told him, you know, he'd see me again, and that's exactly what, exactly what happened, you know. It was a uh, very hype game. You know, it felt, felt good to bring that one out, and, you know, just great team performance overall. You know, Dave, he's, he's fitting in really well, so I'm excited for the future. The future's looking bright. Even if you can't see it because you have shades on, but, you know. <laughs> but the future is a little biz away, and if we're talking about time, that game was a slow burn. And when yep. the pressure ends up building up, you get to that overtime round. I know we talk a lot about how pressure affects teams negatively, but how does it affect your team positively? Because you obviously popped off in overtime. So talk to me a little bit how the pressure affects you guys positively. You know, I find uh, pressure to be a privilege, you know, on this, on this caliber of... Uh, you know, just this playing field, just like in any sport, esport, anything doesn't matter. But um, with pressure, you know, we have a we, we have a pretty good performance protocol backed by our coach, you know, call out. So, you know, he gets us right, right on it. And, you know, we strive in the pressure. We've seen it so many times before, you know, NAL last year, you know, uh, Atlanta, SIs, doesn't matter. You know, we just strive in, we strive in the chaos. We love the pressure. I, can, I can't lie. You may have dropped the hardest quote of this new year. Inspirational. Just, yeah, I'm sitting no, here, I got bad. goosebumps right no, now. No, that is definitely, I mean, that goes to show just how confident you guys are as a team. And that leads me into yep. my next question is picking up Dave. You guys obviously are iconic for those of you in, that don't know him at home. Picking up a player like that who's able to add a whole new arsenal to your guys' roster. Do you guys play off of him a lot to call adaptations? Is it stuff that you guys practice beforehand? Or is it mostly just on the fly calls from your IGL? Yeah, so adding to what uh, Fultz said in the last interview is, you know, we switched like the calling system, you know, how uh, Dave now has like the final say and like on attack and defense. And so like, yeah, he, he's a big factor in the adapting, but we also do have Fultz and Forrest, you know, who are big heavy hitters and contrib or contributors to help Dave out. And so like, it's usually just them three kind of cooking it. Dave has the final say, and then, you know, we just, you know, uh, trust the team and, you know, today it worked out every single day, you trust your team, and then, you know, you're, you're gonna be in a pretty good spot, so. Well, Ashton, I want to I stay with that for a second because there was one round in particular where after it, you were hyped up as, as you always are, but I also saw Iconic. He brought out the notebook. He held it up and he just started <laughs> reading off of the strategy, right? You mentioned that adaptability, right? In those moments, you know, what is being communicated to your team about how to move forward and, and progress in the matchup? Yeah, um, you know, we going in these games, we have a really good game plan, you know, um, backed by a call out and it's just sticking to the game plan. It's just, you know, we always have a great game plan going into the game. It's just about executing at the end of the day. So, you know, he's reading out the notes, he's reading out what we need, you know, what we need to do. So, you know, if we just follow that and then we'll be on the, we'll be on the right track to, you know, succeed pretty well in the matches and just overall. So if you call back to 2023 stage where everybody was playing multiple best of ones a day on some days, it wasn't an, an everyday thing, but it did happen a lot. I think that's coming up for you guys at some point as well, because you're going to have to, there will be a day where you play two best of ones back to back. Everyone thought they were they were safe and didn't have to worry about it at this stage. We get some reshuffling. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. Is there anything different that you do on days where you know you have to play more than one matchup? And what are you going to look for when you actually, when you get to that point? Um, yeah, so a lot of these teams, you know, they think that they can handle like the mental like fortitude and just the overall, you know, like the the amount of like uh, energy they need for these games. But, you know, at the end of the day, they just ended up wasting the usually in their first game. And they're usually tired by the second um, for us. I mean, you know, we just we, we, we train a lot with like high intensity and stuff that, you know, harder situations in scrims that would be, you know, nowhere near to be on game day. So, you know, we're, we're always prepared and ready for anything, like any any duration of match, anything like that. So that's a big advantage that we have with other, other teams. You know, a lot of these other teams, they're, they're just soft. 
soft players. <laughs> soft. Wise words from the master himself. Ashen, thanks a lot, dude. We'll see you next week again. Congrats Shout on the strong out to start. Coleman. Shout out to Coleman. Shout sure. out to Coleman. <laughs> he said it, Ronnie. not me. There it is. The shades are coming out every time Space Station win. I think what Fultz had it in his interview, they just put them all on immediately. It's kind of hard to match an energy in the NAL with what Space Station has. The vibes are at an all-time high. Yeah, they're just all talking quotes. Like, I just feel like being inspirational, just tough times. Pressure is a privilege. Man. Dude, I Pressure. love that. that. Was I, I'm going to take that one and, like, use it in my work. That I sounds great. That entire interview, I mean, he was oozing this energy that, I don't know, if I was in the league, I'd be scared to go up against them. Right? Like, yeah. I, what's right. that like? Pressure makes diamonds. Pressure <laughs> makes diamonds. Oh, my God. Ho homie's <laughs> out here quoting the art of war or something. Everything <laughs> like, I hear from this team just sounds the gosh. same. It's the call-out Bible. No, uh, seriously, it might be. It really is. I mean, that's the mentality. That Ego is the enemy. What other books does he have those guys read on the rig? <laughs> they, say the, they say they view every player, every team as a gray face. Like when you're playing like a video game and you haven't unlocked the next level. Oh, yeah, okay. Like they don't worry about it. They just focus one game at a time. Well, at one point, they're going to have more than one game they have to worry about playing on some days. But today, one and done. They're all set. But the next two teams we have on deck for our final matchup of today played earlier and now we have to see if what ashen said is true if they're soft or if they're ready to play for the second time in 24 hours after the break
We're about to throw another wrinkle into the NAL schedule with our final matchup of the day. Coming into this stage, every team expected they'd only have to play one best of one per day, but now we're making things just a little bit harder to test the mental of the teams that we have in the league because we got to send some teams to Manchester and we have to make sure they're the ones that actually have the most mental grit. Otherwise, there might not be a chance that we walk away with that one. So we're starting this trend off with Beast Coast and Oxygen, a game that we were supposed to see in play day one it's gotten moved up to today both of them played had varying results earlier and uh, earlier on in play day three and now they got to end the day with just one more game two sides to different coins obviously obviously the statistics look very one-sided when you look at this but i think both teams have showed a lot of promise throughout the day and beast coast just ha that hasn't had as much repetition as oxygen's had so far at the start of the show i mentioned that i was happy we were going to see beast coast twice and i stand by that because there's only so much you can glean we gotta get more of them on yeah, a some single point. map played one time get to see another map we get a little bit more of a sample size so we go into next week we have a better understanding or tomorrow and we have a better understanding of exactly what they're capable of i also can't wait to just watch oxygen's third straight oregon game guys we just get to <laughs> we get to sit back and just do this even more obviously a dream in his interview was like we're hoping that we can see something a bit different and we'll get to the map bands very shortly but let's talk beast coast again very first game that they played didn't happen until a couple hours ago because they did not play last week it was a loss to El LG on club, not the best way you want to open, but again, one map does not a season make, Fox. Not, not the best situation at all, but obviously when you look at the team, they have a lot of pieces of the puzzle. They have good leadership with Hot and Colton Spirits. They have great entries with Gavini and Gunner, and those four players have proven themselves time and time again. They've obviously gone to a couple majors here and there, you know, Hot and Colton, 13 majors total. But when it comes to a player like Diffuser, obviously he had a great day today. Despite them losing, he did put up, you know, a fair fight for himself. So at the end of the day, even though they struggled against a very strong and adaptive LG, and there wasn't too much to highlight on, there were some promising key details to their attack specifically. Yeah, and we want there to be not necessarily more creativity, but we want there to be more fun moments to root for a Beast Coast team that we've never seen before. And it looked like on attack, there were some pretty interesting things that they started to do, they just couldn't win off it. Exactly. We highlighted this earlier, but they had a fun moment with Deimos, and of course, new operator always got to highlight th these plays. It was Spirits using that Deathmark tracker to identify the location of the Solus. Not necessarily to hunt Kixrow down and kill him, but to assist with the execute as they're pushing in up above. You know the Solus is going to be a threat down below, and if they track her, identify her position, not a lot they're going to be able to do. Yeah, she can't do anything about it. I mean, at that point, plan denied. Plan denied, job done. You did your job, and I think you're right. I think if there's a team that's going to bring this level of unique abilities, unique just operators that they're going to try different things with, it'll probably be the team coached by Fett. So what you're saying is, Fett, please reach into the bag of tricks and do more things like oh, that. Oh, yeah, give me more. I mean, I want to see, I mean, every play, I want to be worthy of a Carter Casting Links Hannafeld TikTok <laughs> breakdown. That's what I would like. I want to see every one of those things. Deep dive, tell me exactly why or why it didn't work. Especially for a team like Beast Coast that has no expectations on their shoulders, no weight, they can kind of go in and do whatever. If they do whatever, we get more entertainment. Carter has more things he can put on TikTok later. Everybody wins. So if Beast Coast does that, it makes Jonah very happy. From the other side, it's the team that current, one of the teams that is still undefeated after they've played two games so far. OXG are now looking to make sure they become the first 3-0 team in this stage of the NAL. And they are so, so close. They just have to play a map that's not Oregon and get tested on something different. Yeah, hopefully, right? 2-0, and oh, it's a great start. And we mentioned this different system that they're trying to work their way into. And so far, so good. It's two wins under their belt, two fairly comfortable victories. And yes, they haven't been perfect, but the job's getting done. Not perfect, could be better. Everything usually could be. Fox, what's one way that they could improve? I think a big part is the opening kills and opening deaths when you look at these both teams in similar, specifically OXG, because we talk about how aggressive they've been playing, how adaptable they've been playing, and they've been looking very strong on that adaptation. But when you look at the numbers, it doesn't seem that shocking. Both teams are negative by three opening deaths to their opening kills. Both teams don't look anything crazy when it comes to the statistics of opening kills, opening deaths. But in the regards of what makes OXG 2-0 is the trade factor. The trade potential that they're bringing in the team play is just on another level right now. Every single play that they do, they have two players in the same moment taking on a fight two-on-one. They're not yeah. isolating just 1v1s to 1v1s. They're actually going 
one step further, every single roamer that they find, they're hunting them down two people at a time. Every play that they make, two people at a time. And that's what I like to see out of OXG. Obviously not being there to call it myself. I'm happy that they're able to do it for them. <laughs> but on the other side of things, we're not seeing that at a Beast Coast right now. We're seeing a lot of 1v1s, unique operators. You know, Deimos giving them that information, but we're not seeing the team play coming out from, from them. Again, one game, so not we don't want to draw all of our assumptions yeah. on just one. But maybe you're right about the early game point not being the strongest. OXG very clearly are still winning off the back of that. So as we see what map comes in, what do we get? Border. Ooh. Ooh. I seem okay. to remember one specific team being really good at this map. Yeah. That's it. That's that's or uh, that's not Oregon. That's Border. <laughs> that, that's an oxygen, that's oxygen map. Oxygen. Yeah, we were, we were good at both. We were we really think. good at that map. We seven O W seven M. And obviously, you know, they're a pretty good team. They're a pretty hard team. So I don't I've, know. I've, I've heard of them somewhere. I can't put my finger. Uh, who are those guys again? I'm not sure. What region are they? I'll, I'll die on that hill. I mean, a seven O against the best team in the world currently for the last year. I mean, that's definitely very confident. And they're still going to find success, in my opinion, on that map with or without me. So if you're Beast Coast, you've got to be sweating a little bit to let this map come up. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think your point also translates well to border, like the trade game and their inability to play quite as together as a unit. Because you look at a map like border, feels like it's most important that you're playing together. This is going to devolve into a frag fest. Take, you know, CCTV, when you're trying to push in and clear that huge portion of the map, you've got to play the trade. You're going to lose somebody. Someone's going to go down, and that's fine as long as, like OXG, Beast Coast can make sure that mid-round stays strong. I love that you bring up FragFest because we were highlighting Beast Coast earlier today not being able to find their own identity. They played like SSG to try against Luminosity. Ooh, yeah. They didn't actually play like themselves, and now there's no information. They're playing a very aggressive, very adaptable OXG. We're going to see a lot of aggression and a lot of FragFest ability, and that's why I hope we get to see <laughs> like Beast Coast just make their, make their statement, really position themselves. But... Is that enough to sway anybody to pick them in this game? Or is it just, we're going with the team we already know that's 2-0, Beast Coast have more to show, OXG look really good. Is that enough? Jesse's already like, you know what? I've seen enough. I'm, I'm picking OXG in this game. What do you think? You know what, Jacob? I'm going with Oxygen. Ah, I saw mean, that I coming like, from a mile Still away. the company, yeah, there's man. No, there's no way. Big I mean, shocker. Beast Coast still has to prove themselves to me. Oxygen, obviously, have been looking very strong, so I'm... Clearly, clear as day going to go with OXG. Pick representative for Laxing. What did Laxing say? Yeah, the Twitter DMs say OXG as well. <sighs> so Are Laxing's you sure he gonna... didn't? You sure he didn't pick Beast Coast? Uh, double check. Nah, I'm pretty uh, sure he didn't pick Beast Coast. It's good it's try a, though. It's one of the teams with a circular logo that's kind of green, except this one's full green. Yeah, he sent me their logo. He didn't type OXG out. He would never have done that. <laughs> he just sent you the image for one. <laughs> sent me the image. Oh, took took the color out, just like maybe ambiguous. Couldn't tell. Gotcha. Is what it is. Well. Last game of the day, both teams have already played. Which one of them has the mental toughness to stick until the end and grab another dub? It's going to be Parker. And who is it again? Again? <laughs> because Twice? Of He's going back to the same well, dude, and there's apparently enough water in it for him to need a second visit. Both of these teams have already played today. And what was it? A bit of a different story. Beast Coast had some very obvious struggles. OXG. Well, they were OXG, Nick. Looking pretty good. And I mean, Foxy does a great job of kind of breaking down, you know, talking about what happened back when he was in the roster and then what he sees now. And he says they're an ad adaptable, aggressive team. And yes, they showed that earlier today. I kind of fear for Beast Coast, the prediction, the social vote here, 70% in favor of OXG. They feel the same way. All a bit of fear here on the side of BC. I don't know if Boto's gonna be a great map for them. Uh, I'm with the desk on this one on the couch. I think Beast Coast is gonna struggle in that mid game. They're gonna struggle with the trading. And unless they have found their identity from when they played just a couple of hours ago, I just feel it's gonna be a quick OHG dub here. Yeah, I mean, I think things are definitely stacked up in that direction. Certainly. Operator bands coming in are certainly different. Let's talk about those before we transition over to talking about the actual matchup. Deimos banned for the very oh. first time here in North America. A Capitao ban will follow. Funny enough, neither of these operators have been banned here in North America. Obviously, we are still very early into this stage. So it is possible we see further bands down the line. Joining them are Valkyrie and Fenrir. Both operators have been banned before. Fenrir was tied as one of the most banned defenders. Valkyrie not too far off. 
Both of them have now been banned four times. Hmm. Tying Azami, by the way. So Fenrir, Valkyrie, and Azami, most banned defenders in the North America League at the moment. Ying Capitao still stands alone at the top. Not going to change much as Capitao and Deimos are banned out. Now, Deimos is an operator that we've seen picked a number of times today. That one clip on Clubhouse in this matchup has been shown. Do you think OXG just removed Deimos because of what we saw from that very first game of Beast Coast LG? I think I think it might be a, a two-factor thing here. One, yes. The other is if you're on, you know, playing a specific matchup and you don't really have a an attacker that you desperately want to remove from play, because border is usually pretty open and up in the lineup, right? If you see this, okay, maybe oh she could bend the Ying, for example, because we know that someone like Hot and Cold likes to play it, and like East Coast they, they play like it's just so you know they also play it. But you might just say, okay, we don't know what we want to ban, but we don't want to play demos ourselves right now, so we'll just remove it from action. That's very possible. Either way, I love seeing the respect here being, uh, being paid to the operator, saying, hey, we know this operator is playable, and he's also ban-worthy, because he can find a lot of value. And Boros is a very open map, a lot of self-destruction. I could totally see demos being played from below, or just granting tremendous amounts of intel. But intel is not the name of the game for this round. It might just be speed. Ying... Amaru, Monty, all hovering towards archives. This round could be over in 20 seconds time. We'll see. Right now, it's about Intel down below, checking for that vertical C4. If it is clear, it could be Amaru flying in that sandwich window right in front of him right now to uh, you know, distract and create chaos. Monty plants archives door. Ying flashes everything. That's the go-to strat. They've already smoked it off. We're not even a minute in. Spirits look like he might want get that diffuser down but you got to do the other job first right hot and cold strikes first down goes yaga he's already in we're a minute into action and beast coast has the diffuser down not yet there we go gomez coming to life two kills before he's silenced by gunner gunner picking up another ash acog by the way runs out of the sight monty is still up this is the big hurdle down goes gunner Fuser is the only non-shield player on Beast Coast still fighting. He's sitting outside, and it's Diaz to get the call, but Diffuser is just too good. Dream has too many players to look at. Knocked over by the Monty, finished off by Spirits. As Diffuser screaming into his monitor, a successful first round from Beast Coast. Yeah, I mean, that it was. It was, like, it was a, as standard as you could get. They had all the right uh, boxes checked there. They have Monty for the plant, and they were very smart. They didn't stress the situation. Amro flew in the window, hot and cold, got the opening pick. When that happened, they stalled. Monty was extended, walking around, waiting for that first C4 to be thrown out as a response. And once the C4 was dealt with, or, you know, popped essentially, that's when they smoked a second time, and then the plant got established down. While that happened, we also had two players going from Amory Valkyrie in towards Amory and took full bombsite control. So Beast Ghost, they could easily rush that and maybe lost the round literally to a C4. They played it cool and calm. It was a much better look than earlier today, that's for sure. OHD, I wouldn't say they got caught off guard. It's more so that they wanted to hold security. They wanted to like extend around the map as you should on border. But what you can do if you have the confidence is you can rush pretty much every single bombsite. The Blitz, the Glass, the Capital, the Amaru, all very strong staple operators on this particular map. Not every team tends to play it, but it is a possibility if you see those openings, if you see those gaps on the defense. This extension from Fountain over to security was something that we've been seeing now for a couple months, but it's been solidified with the way that Border is played out. Not uncommon to see a lesion as well posted up over by break room. Not exactly sure where Yaga is going to be playing at the moment. Tackling top of East will be the main focus for Beast Coast as Gunner sees bullets whiz by his head. Spies the Kiba barrier for just a second. And I think it's the right call to not directly engage that until somebody else is there to help you. Oh yeah. Oh, it's uh. All about numbers here again on border. Uh, the desk also broke that down. It's about trading. Yeah, there are a lot of difficult areas to take on the map, and you will lose members trying to get it. For example, security sometimes. Armor your archives and the room clear. And it's okay to lose members as long as you trade back and gain that map control. 
So one of the worst things that can happen on border, you get spawn peak. Because then you do not have the manpower to then trade bodies or map control. Yon finds an early pick. Gavin off the board on the ash. Entry denied here on the attack inside. Beast Coast spread very thin right now. Trying to attack from multiple angles, but not necessarily hitting the same mark together. They're very spread out. Gavin 0 and 2 to start off with, usually playing on those first entry rolls. Entry stats were referenced by the desk before we got in here with OXG looking just a bit sharper when it came to who could get kill number one. Kill number two will come from OXG as well. Gomez eliminating spirits. And Gomez has had a pretty good day so far. Attack, All while this is happening, Beast Coast managed to get the diffuser down, lose Gunner in the process, and now we'll also lose Hot and Cold. Diffuser to vault in. They get the diffuser down and then the final player to go down as diffuser as OXG will sit on the case and win the round flawlessly. They took their <laughs> lumps, but they still win. And a win's a win. I mean, they planted, it, but at what cost, right? <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it looks good statistically. Beast Coast, two rounds, two plans. But two rounds, only round or one uh, round victory rather in that scenario. And yeah, I think it was more of a desperate play there. They're saying, guys, maybe we plant, maybe like, I don't know, the chaos, we can play out like post plant, get some kills, etc. It didn't happen, right? It was two versus five. Hot and cold or whoever was planting died the second it went down. Last guy's outside the building on the window, not in a position to even see the diffuser. So things fall apart before anything can really happen in that regard. And that's order. One round, super dominant from one team. Second round, complete reverse. These bombs that play out very differently because of where you want to, you know, take the map control. When you attack tellers, most teams will attack the entire map. You go armory, all the way south side, all the way to archives, office, and then work your way down. When you attack ventilation, you often want to take top floor as well, armory archives, but you don't care about office necessarily. So every single bomb site is going to give you a slightly different approach to which exact rooms you do want to clear out as an attacker. And again, you always have the option to go for a direct attack when you have those kind of power operators, like the Ying, for example. The Beast Coast, they have plenty of options. They have many ways to approach these rounds, but they got to do it again as a team, playing on the same page, on the same strategy. Because round number one was five people executing one singular plan. Round number two was five individuals trying to execute their own individual plan. There's a very big difference there in the outcome of the round because of it. Oh, good luck from Beast Coast in that very first round. That's just one here on border. Yeah. And... I mean, OXG, when we saw them earlier today, they had a slow start on Argon, but then they fired it up. So if that was OXG being slow, they're only gonna get better from here on out. Well, Gunner just walks in and decides to remove Dream's head from his body. <laughs> Heard the Candelas go off as well. The funny thing is, is that when Gunner ran in and got the kill, the bomb site was wide open for the taking. If that was hot and cold, he could have planted that diffuser a second time. Well, third time, actually. Yeah, typically, yeah. But it would have been hot and planting a second time was the point. I realized that was kind of clunky. Oh, OXG, great. you're going to sit for now. Beast Co is still very close to the bomb site, but just as we've seen on other maps, you need to take control above the site before you can start the opportunity or start to find the opportunity to get that diffuser down. East Coast have not cleared out the top floor in the slightest. Oh, nope. it's, it's a well, it's a well read though, right? They get the kill on site, they hold to create some chaos, force a movement, then realize, hey, the soul is above. We cannot plant. They will just kill us vertically. So now they're rotating around a bit awkwardly here, opening up armory, trying to go for ventilation plant, and this might actually work. One person of Gavin can flash all of armory. You go in ventilation, you plant below, and you hope for the best here. And there go the candelas, but if there's an operator well suited no. to deal with this, it's the warden of Gomez. He dispatches two members of Beast Coast, OXG, holding tight for the time being. Hot and in spirits, the last two remaining. Gomez still from above, putting in the work necessary. Every single player from OXG will have to do their part. There's one less player on the board for Oxygen. Got that top floor control, Nick. 30 seconds to go. They do. Bit of an awkward read there because there's one already you cannot blind. It is the Warden, so a good strat in theory 
But in reality, the wrong orbit of playing inside of Armory. Spirits, no one can help him. And Hot and Cold last alive at 1 HP. I don't think they got this one. Terrific round by Gomez. A 4K for him. He was the hero in the previous match. And now is the hero yet again. I believe that's eight kills, by the way, for him. I'll have to see the scoreboard when we get back into it. But all the same, genuinely quite impressive stuff on his side and on side of OXG. First round was tough, but you bring a Monty in. Spirits, of course, on the Monty. He's a very formidable shield player. You know him well. We are going to look at Gomez for a long time. <laughs> 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 this was the play from above by the way yeah and i mean again strategically a very wise play you flash armor you play ventilation the cover is good the enemy doesn't know what's happening but it's a warden it's the one guy you cannot blind or smoke off on those kind of positions and i think it's a simple like lack of joining from beast Coast. i don't think they knew what operator exactly it was playing inside of armory but they knew there was someone there Bit of a tough one. Now we go upstairs again, where things started off, and immediately spirits will show us the Monty at least for now. So this might just be a you know what? When they attack top floor, they like to bring the shield. Anywhere else, they don't really care for it. But it's not gonna be a full commitment. So this could be a bait strat. This could be Monty shows Arkhav side, and they hit Armory really, really like really fast. For example, a bit, a bit of a bait and switch. It's possible, not necessary though. But playing just the Monty without those other chaotic operators, like the Ying, for example, like a Lion, is not all that common. Monty in and of itself right now, with the shield rework changes, is honestly, in my opinion, a little bit weaker. You don't have as much pressure as the Monty player. There's no hip fire. Your melee doesn't one shit anymore. Just like knocks them over like an Orc Stash or an Air Jab or Nomad. Um, and your feet are always exposed and you're not fully extended. So while Monty is great as a drone to get into the building, to establish a plant, Killing people and applying that kind of kill pressure isn't quite as strong as it was before. So, a bit of a surprise to see the lack of other operators to support that system. Not often that we see the visuals of Barrow's Zoto canister slow you down. A very powerful operator at the moment. Has a lot of applications and of course the AR that he can run that used to be shackled to Maverick, but has now been unleashed. It really does, it really does hit like a truck. So not just an offensive threat, but also great utility. And yeah, it's eight kills for Gomez, by the way. The rest of his team combined for five. That's wild. Seven on the side of Beast Coast. So Gomez not just having more than the rest of his team, but also more than all of Beast Coast combined. OXG could go up 3-0 on the standings. Three victories would be quite nice as they look and try to go to Manchester. The representatives from North America are far from certain, especially with Dark Zero starting off 0-2. and two. Long considered one of the best teams in the region. Their early struggles have now created an opening for other teams to capitalize off of that. One minute left in round number four. It's a very slow one. Still need to see the initial push here. I'm not sure. Like, it looks like an office tech now with all the rotates coming over. Five members stacked instead of office archives. But again, no Ying, no Lion. They got evil camps on Maestro. They missed the EMP. They hit the second one, though. They got a small opening. In fact, the Maestro camp is not EMP, actually. They have full insulin on the setup. He is tossing out a Nitro cell as he gets droned. That's enough information for spirits to get out of there. Hot and cold will back up in tow. Gunner dies. Gomez. The superstar so far through this matchup will be removed by Diffuser. Both teams into a 4v4 at this current point with only 15 seconds left. Beast Coast gotta go and they gotta go quickly. Spirits will tuck himself into the corner. Shield will go up as he goes for the plant. Beast Coast with two. Dream with one. Hot and cold looking for another. He'll collect it. Diffuser will now have to go on to the Diffuser again as Diaz pulls out his pistol. East Coast, much better on this site with the Monty leading the way in. And they take the round. I mean, if my math checks out, East Coast can win the next two attacker rounds guaranteed. All they gotta do is play Monty. 
Monty equals victory, no Monty equals loss. It's very similar mathematics. Although it was a very chaotic, messy round. They attacked with very little time left. They missed those secondary MPs. They were spotted the entire time. But OHG, they didn't really have the tools to deal with it either. A lack of vertical C4s. Evil eyes, of course, were great for intel. But they weren't in a position to deny the planter. There were two seconds left. The second attempt begins. And it's good. The cover is there. Spirits. Oh boy. We're showing the Twitch. Now showing the Monty. He might have realized... But we too see. Uh, oh, speaking of chaos, there it is. Ying, combined with Glass, combined with Monty, on a Taylor's Archives defense. This is a classic into the window. Plant, Glass covers the smoke. There are four roamers top floor. If these roamers they stick around and they don't get back to side quickly, there's five actually off the side right now. This round could be over again extremely fast this is why whenever you like dry run when you like do your strategies on defense with the setup you time it in prep phase so that you can be in your start position before the prep phase ends because if you're a little bit late now for the setup and you're like reinforcing right now like the ss amy might be planting while you're literally reinforcing a wall that's because you're late to the setup essentially so you uh, you can deliver the bathroom drone hole if they're gonna go for it you can dial a bathroom, uh, uh, bathroom journal here for Gunner. You smoke off the window for sight. Monty goes in either as a planter or for the chaos effect of going to bathroom. And then you just go, go, go. Let's see if they go for it. They're still figuring it out. Come on. Come on. They're gonna send Buck inside of insulation again for like that split pressure. Ah, oh, they're gonna ram drone above for bait as well for noise. There it is. In they go. And the upside down repel from the glass of spirits nice. amidst the smoke will have diffuser at the halfway point. Nope. Now successful. Everybody's still alive in the server for the record. Spirits taking matters into his own hands. Pistol comes out, a kill for him. Not before Gomez can get on the board. Newers as well. OXG will have to deal with that window play of hot and cold that will be the big issue and hot cold is just biding his time he's joined upside down with gunners they will shoot away at the kiba barriers newer's dying that's a big change that's a diffusing just gonna mag dump what? on in but oxg sticks the plan and wins the round what like how long so everything went really well there I mean, they got a 5v5 plant down. They got the post plant outside the window. They had split pressure across the map, attacking from multiple angles. And then just defuse. Just like that. And it's over. Seven second plant, seven second defuse timer. And somehow, unseen of in my eyes before at least, defenders win the 5v5 retake without the attackers actually dying in that round. Astonishing stuff, and it's not like an upside down repel Ying or Glass from that position is particularly earth shattering. I think it was that old rogue slash Koi slash Fanatic roster. What? Oh, <laughs> whatever they call okay. themselves these days. It's Fanatic now, right? But yes, it is Fanatic it was now. Rogue, and then it was Koi, and then it was Rogue. Yeah, and then it was Koi, and then it was the Fanatic. And then... <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, I believe that one of the first times we saw it was when they did the same thing an upside down repel back when they were known as Rogue on to that position and involved Deepak and Spoit and Leon Gids. And I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was surprising because we'd seen it before, but the effectiveness yeah. was very strong. Now, East Coast try to do the same thing. They're ultimately, they, they cost, it cost them the round because the OXG was able to get on that diffuser. And oh, there was just so many bodies that East Coast focus was on who was playing by the window and not necessarily the chaos that was occurring around the actual case that had been planted. Yep. Deeper into the bomb site, maybe, than they had wanted. Oh boy. Well, Spears will stick it out, though. I was like, you know what? Monty's like a good pick for him, and he picks Monty the following two rounds. And I do like this. It's clearly working. East Coast as a full man team, like all five players, they play around this element that is the Monty. The only thing I want to see differently this time around, because they're not going for a rush strat, we need to see spirits getting actively inside the server, making proactive decisions here. Because when you're a Monty, you're basically a bulletproof drone. You will walk around, you will clear the corners, you will give yellow ping information, 
And if you're a vocal player, which Spirit, Spirit is, you will also kind of like semi-leap the team here, saying, guys, open up this wall. I'm going to go here. Call my left. I'm going to clear the right, etc. And half the round has been burned, and all they've done so far is walk into East stairs. So the pacing, a little bit slow. But we've seen Beast Ghost. They fire up in those last 20 seconds, and they tend to be successful at establishing down that diffuser. And as long as they do that here again, they should be fine. Not a surprise to see this Monty come out as frequently as we have, and if it's working, you might as well continue to use it to your advantage. After that very first matchup that we saw today, Beast Coast could use the help in securing some of these rounds. It was a rough game against Luminosity for Beast Coast, and ignoring which side they're currently on, OXG did not lose this first half. So three rounds means Beast Coast obviously at this deficit. OXG will almost certainly be good enough to pick up rounds on the other side of the equation. Nades go in. They don't do as much uh, as they no. used to, but... Oh, no! Oh, oh. They can't shake Gomez out of this position. He finds two kills. East Coast now hit, and they hit hard. Two of their own. 3v3. It's near as far enough back, but... Easy enough to control that recoil. Another player will walk into the site. It's Gunner. He'll be aided by that adrenal surge as he hunts down Newers. Gunner's last alive. Newers to win the engagement. Your overheal isn't quite so strong if you die to a headshot. Huge play by Gomez to break open that round, and OXG walks away from the first half up 4 2. I mean, OXG, they find the gap and they get the kills and whatnot. But I gotta say, I believe Beast Coast literally had a player on the office window on drones. And instead, it's Munty who will unextend and go for the ADS attempt and then die. You see it right there. So for some reason, it's Munty going for the aggressive play instead of applying that pressure and, you know, giving the intel. When they have a gun on the window right behind the Munty, it's small things like that where it kind of falls apart for Beast Coast. It's in the details. It's easily fixable, but it looks really ugly when those weaknesses are exposed. When you're up against OXG, who are not missing their mark, they are really hitting their shots. <laughs> Especially Gomez, who's 11 and 4, by the way. You gotta just be accurate on those teeny tiny details. Now, 4 2 half starting defense and border? Hey, that's pretty good. Unlike most maps, we tend to say, hey, this map is like defender favorite, it's easy to defend this bomb side, yada yada yada. Border is kind of like old old coastline back when I was in pro play. It's a frag fest. It comes down to not so much strategical and statistics, more like can you play together the team? Can you seek out those engagements? Do you have a good read on your opponent, etc.? Like maybe like a cheesy like little C4 below or something like that to like get a kill in the round. That matters so much more. So getting defensive victories typically is pretty difficult. Especially now where, you know, every single attacker has a zoom scope again on the ACOG and it's a very playable scope. There's these long lines of sight and not every defender has a zoom scope these days because the 1.5 is gone. So, I would not be surprised if OXT will get more than two attacking rounds on their half. This is what I was talking about about the lesion setup, by the way, playing over by break room. No, aided by a castle barricade. I don't think that's something that we see all the time. Instead, we'll be able to vault over those half panels on either side, but as you know, you are incredibly vulnerable when you go for that vault. Yeah. The job of spirits will be to guard top east, guard the balcony that overlooks waiting room, and then also ensure that any movement in that area is slowed down due to those goo mines. Use some investment to reinforce off some of that wall, but as you can see, there's an opening that Newers is surveying that leads all the way over to security. Those are long sight lines for the attackers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely yeah, a bit of a uh, creative setup there. Shuts down the Easter's balcony, makes things difficult, but another grenade kill today as well. Yogg onto Hot and Cold and the Bandit. I've been trying to trigger while well, Muntan to show where Hot and Cold was playing. But Spirit's doing a great job, just locking things down. Not overexposing themselves too much here. He knows that staying alive and maintaining control over break room is the priority. Not so much getting a couple of kills in that particular position. But when you lose Hot and Cold early, when you're playing that 4v5, you also start getting a little bit itchy to get into a gunfight, and you might just lose that one as well. Down goes Gavin, but a trade is there. It's not over yet for Beast Coast in this round. They can still win it out. Oh my, what a shot from Spirits. 
Still in this powerful position now with the two reinforcements right next to him. Dream's on a collision course here. Only one kill so far for Dream through these six rounds. Dream isn't known for topping the charts in terms of kills, but typically want to get more than one. Spirits is on fire from this position. Another relatively easy kill, but he doesn't expect Yaga striking from behind. 2v2, Gunner on half HP. No. He's removed by Diaz. Now it's all up to Diffuser. Got a read over towards Fountain Office. Diffuser will be playing this half wall in Armory. Not the half wall, but one of the many half walls located inside of the site. Diffuser will fall back now and watch over top of the bomb chassis. 15 seconds Only 15 seconds to go. Perfect time for Bees to go in. Diaz has one more that he can throw out. Diffuser will run outside. He will be revealed what? and play keep away. Hello? Because he's vacated the site, Diaz should be able to get this down unless Yaga falls. Diffuser now walking through Fountain. He's made a perfect rotation, but Yaga seals the deal, preventing Beast Coast from getting back into the site. Diffuser stood no chance. And of course, we get the highly coveted fiery Yaga reaction. <laughs> I mean, that's a genius rotate from Diffuser. And I think if he had sprinted all the way straight through Fountain because they had a ripping on the planter, he might have even won that round, actually. He was maybe one second off getting the guy who's planting, you know, before the Diffuser goes down. Doesn't have to go for the second swing. It looked like it was the weirdest play possible, running outside the bomb site. But in reality, it really was probably the best play he could have made. He was spotted by the beast regardless. So going outside doesn't really make a difference in that scenario. But that's a heartbreaking round. Spirits gets three kills playing in break room. Hitting some disgusting shots. No one's really helping him. Finally, they shut down the raid boss that he was in that round. And then it's over. It really was a one-man army. And that was it. These goes they need again. That teamwork. That playing together. They're losing body after body in these rounds. With no punishments happening. OXG are getting kills for free when they should be traded back, they should be losing something in turn, but no. It is a very one-sided situation in that regard. No OXG, yep, they got things solved in the defense, and they also looked like they got things mostly sorted out in attacks. Besides the issue that was Spirits, who's now playing Boss G A Cog, by the way. What? What is this? Now, I mean, I guess, you gotta, you, I guess you gotta have some fun with it, no? Oh! Oh my. That's disgusting. They, they, that was and a clean a one tap. I mean, that was a good night. That was like, a, he shut the ground, just flicked the door, one tap looked away. Severe oh. lack of confidence from PC. Oh, and it's newers as well. The guy who normally styles some people. Talk your ish, newers. Yep. Get in there. Well, I mean, a heck of a start for Beast Coast, and yeah, Spirit's going on to the Boss GA Cog is certainly something to watch. I, I'm Boss just curious is, if it's intentional, you know? I don't know. I mean, these are their online accounts, right? These are not. Yep. So I'm not Len. Yeah, he. It's, you can't use the excuse, oh, he didn't have it set up, unless he was maybe playing a game earlier and forgot to change it. But I mean, that definitely seems like something that you would be mindful of. Diffuser, by the way, after hitting that GN. He's the first to die for Beast Coast. Happens about halfway through the round. Dream walks in, gets the kill, and then rushes right out. And it's again, Beast Coast get early pick. They played it well. They type good night in chat. They talk their smack, and then they die again for free. There's no punishment. There's no trade like mentioned earlier. And now it's a 4v4. Things are now equal. And then all of a sudden, Gunner falls. All of a sudden, that early lead is lost for Beast Coast. And again, they keep giving up things for absolutely free. And we see the silhouettes right now. Most of Beast Coast and defense right now are just sitting in corners. Hot and Cold's playing top east. Spirit's playing office right now. Gavin playing archives. That's it. That's their three positions. And they're not really moving around. And Dream is planning. Do they even have cover? They do. Gomez is there. Ready to move OXG to match point. It's all up to Gavin. Most recently, a member of Dark Zero. Gavin trying to find new life on a new squad after he was removed shortly before the six invitational and well, 
Going to take some time for this Beast Coast roster to gel. Two matches in one day, one match to start the day and then the other to end it. That's a solid six hours between your matches, by the way. OXG goes on to win the round. They're on match point. East Coast I mean, involved in our first uh, match of the day against LG. That match started six hours and 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Just in case anybody's keeping track. That match ended about five and a half hours ago. So quite a wealth of time between the start of that one or the finish of that one and then the start of this one. East Coast have called a timeout. They looked very strong in round number one, and they tried to set an unrelenting tempo, but then since then, OXG has had the upper hand through most of these rounds. East Coast are a, an experienced team in terms of the players who play on the team, but as an actual unit are not that experienced. It's gonna take some time for them to gel. OXG adding two players from M80. It's a lot easier for them to come into this system, though I will say losing Fox means that OXG has to find a new identity. OXG is about to be up 3-0. Fox, there was the problem. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, did you just hear that? I didn't hear wait, that. Wait, wait. Was... Yeah, I think somebody played like an audio clip of you saying something. That was weird. I was... It was like somebody joined the channel okay. and said that and then just laughed. It's so strange. That's messed up, man. I, I don't thought know who would say that, channel. man. Who would? Who would say that? I really admire tactical timeout when you're down two and six and it looks like it is so over for you it's just like it's like it's almost like the plan right now is just to piss off oxg waste their evening you know call for tactical timeout maybe win a round here and there but inevitably these girls will lose that's what the plot seems like right now i just i just don't see a world in which right now or is they lose this match they're up four rounds it looked like in full control and again, as long as Beast Coast refuse to... Oh, not refuse, that's a, that's a bit mean. But anyway, like, as long as they don't play together, it's not going to go better for them. Because that is just border 101. You need to have that kind of trade mindset where you're not going to be too far off a teammate. There is help to be had or a punish somewhere else. And that just, it's not happening. Until it does, I'm not going to be leaving them. I will say, I did not expect this to be the scoreline that we saw. Yeah, I would have definitely given OXG the nod. In fact, I did. I predicted that they would win, but I also predicted DZ would win. <laughs> Such oh is the duality of this eSport. Yep. I know I'm using that turn of phrase incorrectly, but it is late. Spirit starting things off by killing Yaga. Beast Coast desperately need a good start to this round because OXG are, they're a sticky team. They stick to you. You cannot get past them. There have been multiple rounds where it looks like Beast Coast are able to pull it off and OXG just simply outmaneuver and outmuscle them. A couple early picks. That's some breathing room for Beast Coast if they can get it. Yeah, they got a good setup. They got those mirror windows. They got utility they can play behind, which I think is a great change up for them. But I'm just waiting here. In the next 30 seconds, something might just be going wrong. Somebody overswings. Oh, this time it's Gunner who gets the pick, actually. Typically, it's been the other way around. So this might just be it. They have two mirror windows. They're holding top floor above the bomb side. And OXG, they're not really anywhere. Dream is playing Passport. They had Gomez upstairs on triple with Diaz, who also gets picked off. Gunner with the perfect timing right now, punishing OXG. Good stuff. This round at this point is effectively over. Gomez with 12 kills has looked unstoppable through a number of rounds on this map, but I mean, you've got a lot of targets to find. Plenty of bullets, by the way. As Gomez starts with one, we'll have to undergo a lengthy reload when that LMG runs out. And there we go. Gomez will take the time to do just that. Dream looking for an opportunity. He'll die with Diffuser in hand. Gomez will need to clutch out this round and also ace in the process as he'll drop. Impact grenade taking away some of his cover. East Coast licking their chops, wanting this kill. Spirit's got the first kill of the round. Always nice when they also get the last kill of the round. East Coast, stay alive. I don't know how Gunner plays in the dark like that. It like nukes your eyes. Like if I do that for just like an hour, 
I can no longer see. It hurts to even have my eyes open. I guess that's like the, the difference between a boomer that is I and a younger that like he is, you know? The classic lights off Ron debate. Are you a lights on off guy kind of guy, Parker? Uh, I'm a lights on guy, um, mostly because if you are sitting in the dark and you just have a bright light in front of you, it causes an incredible amount of eye strain. When we are casting, I have my regular lights on when we're on camera. I turn most of the lights off when we're off camera, but I keep one on. That's enough, I think. Enough. But, I mean, when I was younger, I was a degenerate. I would absolutely play <laughs> in the dark. Sitting in your bedroom, you're 16, 17, 18 years old. You got a hoodie on, it's kind of cold. Oh, you got boy. all the lights turned off. You keep getting headaches and you wonder why. <laughs> why am I getting all these headaches? I say as I sit in the pitch blackness of my room with a bright monitor in front of my eyes burning into my skull. It's a, it's a mystery. Yeah. It's a mystery. Maybe right I didn't now. drink enough water, I don't know. Oh boy. I sure did. I don't know about you. There's like. People warn you, they're like, suddenly you just like birds. It's like you'll just, you'll get older and you won't care about birds, and then suddenly you'll see a bird and you'll be like, wow, that bird's really pretty. And then next thing you know, you know all these things about birds. I feel like the same thing kind of happens with like house, household stuff, because I have become yeah. like. Now I'm like, wow, that's a really nice light. Like it really ties the room together. <laughs> and I realize that it's almost time for me to retire. Like. Uh. Yeah, you buy a new vacuum cleaner, you get all excited. Oh my god, I'm finally getting an upgraded vacuum cleaner. This is gonna be great to vacuum the floor with. Uh, I bought a bunch of really nice, like, Japanese cooking knives. Oh yeah. And I bought, like, I bought a locker set, and I'm just like, man, I'm so excited about this stuff. And I didn't ever think I would be. But I guess, I guess that's what growing up is, right? You know? It's what being a boomer is like, yeah. Okay, I'm far removed from that. <laughs> One minute off the clock, and not an awful lot has happened in this round. There was... An interesting decision of Diffuser to impact nade his own Kiba barrier, top east. Which, along with the Swiss cheese holes that we see in the wall directly ahead of Dream. I don't know if they are fully practiced or not. <laughs> What's happening? What is that? Are they waiting for a... Yuck, what, what's the angle here, my friend? He's just looking Shoot at it. it. Shoot it. <laughs> he can't really use Why eyes. It's like, what, it, what is this? It's still there! He wants to nade him. Hey! He's timing it, nading, bouncing. There it is. Oh my god. Not again! So this, is actually, this is actually a really good nade. So by bouncing it, it activates right away, right? And then it yep. drops. And because of that, you don't you can't cook nades anymore, but you have very limited time to react to that nade by bouncing it the way that they do. And it secures the kill on the hunt and cold. Oh, it's genius. Except the magnet was in a spot where IQ could literally shoot it from the roof, so it falls apart entirely. Hunting Cold dives that same nade like a couple of rounds ago as well, so it's two for two. He'll be able to heal himself back up now as Gavin will hold court over by security. ACOG on the dock will allow a longer line of sight as he jiggle peeks his way. Knows one! A nice shot by Gavin! Almost a second lined up, but Gomez will stop him. Gomez has been such a threat. Only two remain for Beast Coast. They're fighting for their lives in this matchup. 15 seconds remaining. It's a long time to wait between losses. So for Beast Coast, they gotta stay in it. They won't though. Yaga and Gomez uniting for the final two kills. And just like that, OXG triumphs. They're up three nothing in the North America League. Yeah, I mean, a wise man once said, Foxy was the problem. Maybe he was, I don't know, but a great start for OXG, and I gotta say, Beast Coast taking them to border? That was a very bold move, but it did not pay off. It absolutely was, and I do like that teams are taking chances oh, yeah. and getting messy, but I will also say that Beast Coast have some work to do. OXG, Formidable, and they sit alone atop the North America League standings. Beast Coast might be an experienced team of individuals, but as a group, there's still work to be done. The good news is that the issues are relatively obvious. So whether they're looking at their Luminosity game or whether they're looking at their OXG game, 
They've got their work cut out for them. What's the cat's name? Sly. S L Y. That's a very comfortable position, I'm sure. Our matches are done, but the show is not over just yet. Before we break down that final matchup, we got a break ready for you. Sit tight, we'll be right back. Very different story for two teams that played two games today. One of them won both of them. The other one lost twice. Not the sort of story you want to be on if you're Beast Coast. If you're Oxygen, you're sitting pretty. You're at the top of the league. You're feeling fantastic. But for Beast Coast, we not only got to see them play for the first time today, we saw them in two separate maps with a different set of mistakes overall. So not the debut that you want, but hopefully you can still pick yourself up for future play days. You absolutely can. There was a little bit of unique attacks that we saw out of Beast Coast. They were getting in there, they were getting the first pick, but then they didn't do anything with it. They had the advantage some rounds, they had the position, and they just stalled out. They didn't really have a game plan on where to go, and they didn't really do anything with that advantage. The thing is, we this is the first time we actually saw some concrete mistakes from Beast Coast. It wasn't just, you know, the fair fight that it was against LG. They, you know, had a good match one team just edged out the other right here it was beast coast 
couple of moments where they clearly missed something or clearly just didn't quite match the OXG team on the other side. One example, their failure to clear out half wall on the attacking side. They had the Ying, yet they didn't clear out Armory successfully. Something that's fairly straightforward to do. Yeah, they got the walls open, which I'd argue is the hard part when it comes to the border attacks. It's just getting the objective walls open, getting these ankles open. Oh, uh, this play was great, just throwing body after body just to make sure they get that diffuse. <laughs> But the hard part on border is getting the objective, getting the, the positioning, because it is such a small map, and getting inside the map, getting what you need is the hardest part. But once they had it, they didn't clear OXG out of any of the angles. The half wall, they didn't clear Gomez out of the half wall. They didn't clear new crew out of top armory for events, uh, for bathroom. I love how you call them new crew and not newers every time you reference them. <laughs> <I mean, laughs> I'm just used to saying it. I mean, I know these guys very comfortably, so it just comes out naturally. But the point still stands. Beast Coast was not clearing out any of OXG's positions on the defense. OXG was able to develop their confidence. They knew that, hey, we just had to sit down, play our gun skill, focus on ourselves. And when it came to their attack, OXG just did their strategy. Step by step, force these executes, force these plants, make Beast Coast move, and Beast Coast moved right into their crosshairs. On the attacking side, OXG dominated. We just saw there the final replay, a beautiful nade that Yaga cooked up and delivered right into the site setup that completely broke it apart. But one thing they also did was take advantage of those smaller gaps. That round we also saw where they were throwing bodies just to get that to counter defuse and try to sneak one off there, right? They had a full minute left on the clock. They easily could have sat back a little longer but border is border. Those gaps will emerge, and when OXG saw that there was an opportunity there, they didn't sit back and wait. They jumped on it, and they made it move. And the gaps were specifically exposed because of the map. The Beast Coast that we saw in this game did not look like the Beast Coast that we saw at the start of the day. Whether it was emotions getting the best of them, we won't know for sure until, you know, Beast Coast starts turning up. Maybe they have an interview. But when it came to the second half of the game, we saw Beast Coast, they were bringing a Boss G going for spawn peaks and break room door. Yeah. And it looked like they cool. lost the confidence. And then I loved a little bit of banter when he one-tapped new, when Diffuser one-tapped new and said <laughs> goodnight. And even though they were down 2-5, I mean, you like to see the fun. But I think Beast Coast may have just been playing exactly with just that, just fun in mind. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Even though you have two games to play, even though it might be tiring, you still have to give your all otherwise you're not gonna get the points you need to maybe qualify for a major for oxygen though where beast coast were making mistakes one guy felt like he was usually in the driver's seat and that was gomez he had himself a field day in this one finishing out with 15 frags consistency again i mean all day both he both newers and diaz have been so capable fragging i mean we saw this last week as well three games in now it's not like we're saying, we're not guessing anymore for OXG. No. These three guys are delivering. They've done it three best of ones in a row. They really are. And we saw the walls open right there, just like the points we were making. Beast Coast had the hard job done. And Gomez was still playing in these exposed positions, just getting kill after kill, not being stopped. The trade game wasn't there for Beast Coast, but on the side of OXG, the trade game was there all day. Every single play or every single trade that they made was either to get the trade back or for positioning, for positioning for that execute. And it just showed the confidence starting out on their side. They were able to run it all the way through the rest of the game. Well, Oxygen are now the first team to acquire nine points in the NAL, whether it was because they were undefeated or not, but the cherry on top is now they stick at the top of the standings above everybody else. And we went from two straight games on Oregon of Diaz and Newers being the ones to lead the scoreboard to now Gomez having his own highlight day. Everyone on OXG seems like they're doing good. For Beast Coast, what do you do after two losses on one day? You gotta go back to the drawing board. I mean, we see a lot of promise out of them. They just have to find more consistency in the way that they play. It can't just be all gimmicks. It can't just be all one player walking into the site. We need to see more cohesiveness. And we say they have the pieces to the puzzle. They just got to put them in the right place. They yep. did show us a little bit of that innovation that I asked for. It obviously didn't come You got your form. wish. It just wasn't very good. It didn't <laughs> come in the form that I wanted, right? Deimos was banned. We didn't even get a chance to see him. They had one round where they were attacking archives, where they brought the Monty in pretty typical rush strat on the surface level. Yep. Instead of going for that doorway plant, getting that smokes down, maybe a glass in the back line, they went deep, planting all the way in that corner. And this was probably a mistake you could say that OXG made. They had the intel, they knew it was happening, and they couldn't find a way to deny it. So good innovation from Beast Coast. Could it have been shut down? Yes. But that's the kind of thing that 
again, this roster that's clearly still trying to feel it out needs to do well. But clearly, even if you make a couple big roster changes, you could have some success. OXG has been doing that. Let's talk to one of the guys who's now technically considered an OG on this team in Newers. Dude, it's been a hot minute since we had the chance to talk to you. How you feeling after getting two dubs today? I'm feeling good, man. How are you? Yeah, uh, good. I mean, we're we're sitting here 1130 Eastern right now, just chilling. You guys looked really yep. comfortable over both of those games. Did you feel any pressure on you at all? Or are you just balling out or however you feel? No, my my days are like my days in Pro League have gotten so long now that I feel like an OG. So getting nervous. <laughs> is, getting, Fox, getting, is that true? Is, thing. Is, he, is he actually yeah. an OG now? Yeah, he looks like Unk. Look at the beard growing <laughs> out. <laughs> it's scrappy, but it's coming. He's rocking the same glasses that you and Laxing are rocking. I'm going to say, they no look like oh, yeah, identical we glasses. Yeah, yeah. Kinda do. we're twins. We went shopping together. Hey, hey, hey good stuff. New, new. New. More, more, more important question. On to the game. I mean, how much has changed when you go from a 7 0 world championship on border team to then going to a team that, like, kind of struggled on border against Beast Coast? What, what's, like, the change on maps like that? Is this comedy night, bro? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean honestly, like, the game's just different. And people just people just nerd nerd out in that map now, and it's just like uh, you got to learn a bunch of different things. And we started scrimming again, and to be honest, people have definitely re renovated that map, so it's honestly harder to become like the best at that map. So we just had to adapt after a invite when we picked up Gummas and Diaz. Well, you guys are really good at it. Obviously, today showed, and there were a lot of new adaptations that I haven't seen you guys do when I was on the team. So it's nice to see that. One specifically is you guys banned Deimos. Is there a reason for that? Was that because you saw Beast Coast played in their first game? Is it just an operator that you know is devastating on that map that us viewers may not know about? Talk me through the ban phase a little bit. I mean, real like the only reason we banned Deimos is because Yag was like, "Yo, I think Spirits likes Deimos," and we just like, "Yep, all right." Man, <laughs> and that's literally, that, that's what, he was like, I got tech, I got tech, and that's all we thought about it. We're like, well, we'll just ban Deimos. Like, all right, cool. Cool, so off I one mean, game, tech. one round, that was all you needed to be like, nah, I'm not dealing with this right now, dude. No way. He's got no, tech. They were using that club, too. So, got it. Good. Well, listen, it's been Beast Coast, Los, Tick Down Wild Card as well. Arguably the weaker half of the league right now. You've got tougher competition next you guys going undefeated all the way i mean is this going to continue i mean let's let's not act like they didn't call beast coast a super team but i'll let that slide did anybody and call beast coast a super team did somebody caliber say jacobs that a super, caliber jim caliber jacobs a super team fanatic so. <laughs> oh i <laughs> love say. super team <laughs> no dude not about beast coast you kidding me i i said that about m80 because i was like oh man if we call them that does that just like curse their chances into the ground i was curious about them so you're biased Basically, it's not working. Yeah, yeah of course. Because it's, not, it's not working. <laughs> but I mean, is your team a super team? It looks like it's going really well through three games. But like Jonah mentioned, you do have tougher competition down the road. So is, is this a realistic expectation for the rest of the season? I mean, yeah, 3 0 was pretty expected. Like, I mean, we thought Beast Coast would put up a fight, but. I mean, you saw that one, so. Here, Fox has one I more mean, question for you. Yeah, put, putting up a fight, I got I got to just ask the question. When Diffuser good knighted you, like, how'd you feel? And that you're up 2v5 <laughs> and he hit you with a good Listen, night. Listen, listen, you know what? People rush every round. They have no confidence in what they're doing. So we already knew they were severely lacking confidence that whole game. So I just like, when he typed good night, I was just like, come on, dude, let's be serious. Well, it was pretty ironic that he typed good night and then he was the next one to get traded in that round. Yep, I said, <laughs> I said, Mitch is right here. Get him, get him. And, and just say, I saw that, <laughs> dude. Man, thanks for the interview. Congratulations on starting undefeated, but we will see you again later on. Have a good night, dude. Bye, guys. Everything for Oxygen is exactly according to plan for now. There's nothing to suggest it's going to stay exactly the same. Plan ahead. Mostly because I think if they were to go undefeated, I think you'd be kind of pissed that the one stage that you decide, oh, you know what, I'm going to leave the team, I'm done, my career is over, they suddenly go undefeated without you, would you would you find that to be like, oh, man, why, why did I stop? Like, I mean, I don't think so. When it came to statistics, I didn't think it was that the issue. I think we just had different styles of where we wanted to play. And it's perfectly fair. It's clearly working. And obviously, Gomez and Diaz have been playing phenomenal the whole season. I love the guys on the team. Uh, and obviously, my greatest achievement with them is we got third in invite. So, yes, sir. so maybe if they get there, then I'd be upset. Like if they get top two, <laughs> if they, they make grand win, final, you know, yeah. if they get top two, then maybe I'll be like a little upset. But for sure. now, I mean, you know, I love the guys and I always have a good time talking. Let, let, let's be real, though. We're a long way off from entertaining the undefeated conversation. I do it's think true. they've had the easy schedule so far. Not to absolutely belittle the teams they've already faced, but they do have M80. They've got Sonics. They've got DZ. Yep. They've got SSG. 
those are tougher teams. I will say we should give credit where credit's due. They definitely have looked like a phenomenal team with the big restructure that they've done. We look at teams that have made complete team restructures and we go, wow, these teams, obviously they need more time, but OXG made a full team restructure, in my opinion, with the way that they play the game and they picked up two new players. That is a huge task to get past, when, especially when you get rid of your long-lasting IGL. Yeah. That is a huge thing to overcome. And so far, they've already made themselves a clear step above the bottom side of the bracket. Now they have the top side to deal with, but I still think there's so much flair and so much flavor that they've showed us so far. We just got a taste, you yep. know? Yep. So I'm excited to... <laughs> Excited to see much more. <laughs> <laughs> we've been running this one a little long, so that is all for the games that we've got for today. We're not entirely done, though, because we'll run through the last standings. We'll talk about the games that we have up going up tomorrow. And if you are a subscriber on the Twitch channel, be sure to leave a couple questions in chat because the first iteration of the North American League post show comes up in a very chill format right after the break. So make sure you leave your questions. Well, today was the first day where we had five best of ones as properly scheduled on a North American League play day. And what that means is because today is a normal day, 
we decided to just kick back, let loose, and just kind of talk about how everything today went. There really isn't a schedule for this. Hi, welcome to the NAL Post Show. I'm Jacob, he's Jonah, he's Davide, and we don't really have uh, a plan for any of this. We're just chilling. We're just, yeah, I mean, I think uh, after a, a good long day on broadcast, getting the chance to just decompress for a hot second is always a good idea. But we were literally told, like behind the scenes, like just turn analyst and host mode off for a bit and just like just do whatever like but like within reason do whatever, i don't know right? yeah, yeah like i don't talking know. like you're on stream you like know? I, I didn't just know like, if that meant yeah you know, take all your clothes off or if that meant stay <laughs> clothed <laughs> start showering start yeah, yeah. I, they probably don't want us to do anything crazy but i mean knows? yeah who knows you know you, what, what do you got in store for us nowadays you know with the meta i mean the meta of what? Oh, wait, what? The Twitch meta? Yeah, the meta, you know oh, what I'm saying? Very, you, never, you, you get away with it on Twitch. We need to get, need to get an inflatable hot tub. We need to put it in the middle. And then, like, whoever loses oh. a prediction needs to, like, like get in the pool. That would actually be kind of crazy. I can't lie. I've been working out. I would love to do it. I yeah? can't lie. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, you have anything to show for it yet? Or are you just like, I mean, well, you've been in the gym for the past couple months, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah like three yeah. months. It's getting there. The SSG guys were like, damn, man, your shoulders are getting bigger. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. good it stuff. It was pretty good. I'm not going to, like, show nobody now. I'm going to say, I mean, like, you no, this is the week to do it because laxing is is not here so no, you would yeah. be the fittest <laughs> i mean i look i look tiny compared to that guy like <laughs> i mean but no that's the thing you're you're the the resident gym bro now and now that laxing is gone right oh well, i mean I, I fill a seat i have to be that's true i mean <laughs> he's all right <laughs> i mean well but meet me after the show he's all right <laughs> meet me after the show all right well here's the schedule just as a reminder of everything that happened over the course of today it was the first time we had a couple teams play more than one game uh oxg won both luminosity won the first game of the day m80 and ssg both won games in overtime ultimately uh what was my favorite game i think mine was probably uh pro honestly that that, that m80 sonics game was a lot of fun if I, if I had to pick one on the day it'd probably be that one what would you guys take uh, hot take i'm picking lg beast coast uh, i think that was you probably like that, that was entertaining to watch just because LG brought a whole new element that I wasn't expecting, especially their attacks. Very fast, very aggressive. Yeah, sure. Just whole game plan all the way through, and I just don't think Beast Coast necessarily had much to show for it. The rest of the games were still great, but that, that one was entertaining for me. Uh, yeah, it was decent stuff across the board. I, I love some of the hero plays we saw in that, in that DZ SSG game. It was exciting those few moments. Left a little bit to be desired, though. You know, yeah. we hyped up this matchup of these two big guys, you know, with so much storied history, as you pointed out. And it's like, give us something. And we saw we saw Cafe kind of being Cafe, Siege being Siege, and that very, like, yeah. so slow. Slow. So paced. slow. Uh, you really so. didn't like how slow This that guy was game falling was. asleep. Like, no, I mean, like, <laughs> I obviously, when you look at the technical part of that game, obviously it was a lot of back and forth. It was a lot of round after round. And the, fundamentally, it would be a great game to break down exactly what round specifically went wrong. But when it comes to entertainment side of things, it was a really slow burn game. It's a lot to take in. That was classic yeah. old classic time. Classic for the Siege nerds, yeah, right? If you like to just dive siege. into a round. Classic and go, for the people who don't exactly. like when Siege turns into TDM all the time. Right. So I'm, I'm sure I'm sure Macy would Macy J. Down. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that was my game perfect for you. for you. Yeah. That game's for you. Hot take. I think a lot of Macy J's takes are actually pretty right, pretty correct in my opinion. A lot of them are, yeah, he just attracts a lot of ire. That's kind of the problem. Here's standings after everyone has played, uh, with the exception of Los, everyone has played at least two games now at this point. Los didn't play any today, so they will play two tomorrow, and then they will be either further up the standings or maybe maybe they lose <laughs> their next ones. They, they still don't have any points. I'm still surprised that DZ only has one. I mean, yeah, it's That'll only been change. two games. They, went, they went to overtime once, but it's like, really? You're starting your season there? No, oh, like she's winning without me? <laughs> Guys. Are you crying yet? It's a joke, please. Uh, I nah. mean, DZ... DZ, DZ, DZ is a surprising one to see them that low, but they've played two hard games, so... It's kind of, you know, like you guys were saying, OXG maybe have had the easier half of teams. DZ has had the harder half of teams. And you never really know with these seasons. OXG, as far as I've been on the last two seasons, we actually started out very hot. And then it's always the last couple of games where they oh, kind of just yeah, string yeah. out along. So hopefully they can change the tides this time. A little more consistent. Only uphill from here, I think we all know. So. We, we, we all know what they can do. I don't know, man. We've kind of said everything there is to say about teams, at least at least for right now. I mean, I'm, I'm over here like, on, I've said, I've said, I've said all of the buzzwords more. about every team today already. Like, I'm just... 
like you're, you're just you're, you're just done. You're gonna sip your. I'll, sip, I'll, I'll sip, sip the the undisclosed contents of you're my. Just, it, it, it's the undisclosed. You're not Fanta, a real the seed. Fanta in <laughs> Dog, the Dog exposed. I drink soda. That's crazy. You're not a real siege grinder. I could talk about siege teams for days. You could. True. I could. But you could also fall asleep trying to do it. Here's here's a uh, here's tomorrow's schedule. I, I'm being told. Throw the schedule up there. And the schedule is ready. So this is what tomorrow brings us. Uh, Los's two games are okay. Wow. So they have games three and five. Wow. Which is not so. Beast Coast had games one and five, but Los doesn't have nearly as much turnaround between both games. Is that is that what bad? a day? What a day for them. They have Los and Los, Sonics. Los has some hard games. <laughs> That's I can't so lie. unfair. You know what? Man, they wait, the they might off, start out zero and three. And they do it in, like, in an hour and a half. Oh, no, I'm Whoa. not. No, just straight Caliber schedule. Jacob Hayden live on stream. I ain't said nothing. We're the desk. We need to be unbiased. Dude, Let's get it, Los. I was literally told turn off host mode, dude. I'm chilling. Vamos Los. Yeah, turn I'm off with you. Bias mode. I'm with y'all. So. Okay, uh, M80 LG. I don't know. I think because of that earlier game from LG, I actually am kind of more intrigued by that, even if I don't know if M80 are going to let off the gas. So I, that's a good opening game. But yeah, game two, I think, is the one everyone's looking forward to the most. I mean, yeah. we got we got two different M80s. I think we got a hotter, fiery M80 today than we did last week. I think if the one today comes in tomorrow, that could be open and shut. Yeah. I'm really excited to see how DZ pans out because I'd say this is probably where they should feel a lot more comfortable going up against Lowe's. Yeah. They're and if they don't, that'll look really rough. If that'll they be don't, really rough if to they struggle three. tomorrow, we then we need to settle down yeah. and have a conversation about that. Yeah. Need to need to get the coaches in the studio and be like, yo, what are y'all doing? I'm, I'm so confused right now. Barry's face in mug to hide his shame. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, we are in Twitch sub mode. So if there are any questions that, uh, I mean, people have already been leaving them, so I'm curious what we did. So first question, Foxy, what did you do in your downtime after you, uh, SI was done? That's a great question. Um, yeah, like like three weeks, like, or like a little less than three weeks of downtime for you, right? I'm trying to think about it. I don't think I really did much. No, I no went big home. vacations. After SI? What does a retired gamer do? I think I went retired. home. You just game? And I want to say I want to say I streamed a lot, but to be fair, I don't think I did. I I feel like the time really blew by very quickly. I only really no, it was only like I only had like two weeks. It wasn't that long. Yeah, it wasn't that long. I, I mean, it takes people don't understand how difficult it is the flights and and traveling very often. Obviously, like you know, I'm not gonna sit here and be like ah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> All right. But it's it's definitely a lot to deal with, especially when you're playing. You're in these events and it's very high stress situations, and then you fly back home. I mean, I didn't play it, but it was still. A lot to handle and when i got back home i kind of just relaxed took care of things that i had to do around the house like real life stuff yeah and uh you know you try to do you try to do your own type of thing when you can't stream you know stuff like that you have a you have a cat right i do have a cat did so. you have to drop drop cat off someplace else or did someone like come like apartment sit for you i i fortunately i have a friend in my building so he was just able to go into my apartment just, just make sure make, make sure, make sure she's good yeah yeah, yeah that's good well, what's her name zoe name? Zoe, yeah. Zoe, nice. Two what years color? old. Two years old. She's like a brownish, brownish gray tabby. Kind nice, of. yeah. Tabby, yeah. Super good apartment cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's perfect. She kind of just sits around, just relaxes all day. Really calm cat. Nice. Thoughts on NA and international staying? Um, hmm. Oh, oh so, so like like us being like like third region? No, no, you mean the best of everybody else? If oh, you, so sorry, you mean you mean best region? Yeah, my bad. You can't. Hey, we're on Jonah, the NA stream. You need jo no, Jonah's on brand. That's fair. If I got to stay it. on brand here, Jake. If, you guys, if you guys want a real answer, yeah. I'm not a player anymore, so I could really get into it. Like, yeah, you can. yeah, go nuts. I mean, I think the big reason why North America struggles when it comes to international play is because a lot of teams are so used to playing against just the NA teams, scrimming them every day. So yeah. a lot of it is just counter strats. I'm sorry to be that bearer of bad news, but a lot of these teams that you idolize at home. A lot of it is just regurgitated counter strats that they're like, oh, I know what they're going to do from scrim, so I'm going to play it. And when it comes to an actual international event and they play against teams that have different play styles or different ways, yeah, different play styles and they don't have the footage, it's harder to adapt. So it's like teams sure. in NA will qualify for majors, not adapting and not learning how to be better, just learning how to counter, be better on paper in a way. And so that's why we see such disappointing results when it comes to... NA and the teams that always do better are the teams that actually do adapt. That's why you, you see teams like Sonics. You know, a lot of people would refer to them as maybe the third or fourth plus team in NA. But at the last mate, at the last invite, they were top. They two. got top six. Yeah, they were great. No matter what, like jumping across regions 
it's proven to be difficult. I mean, you got a team like Los coming over that's not not off no, the not quite. Heart. I mean, yeah, it's because they're brand new. It's also like a whole other wrinkle. Right, but like right? in 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 Latin, which I'm casting right now, and we saw that this week in the first kind of week of matches, we have kind of a couple of like teams that are you know the odd teams out. We have a bunch of teams from Brazil now exclusively coming in. Yeah, we also have Revan, and Revan which is, still is a kind thing. of like the famous team for being the intruders in the region. They're like they're like the most notorious, <laughs> like team in any region for fans of that region exactly like, there you got you have two brits an american i'm trying to think a spaniard a spaniard and uh a frenchie oh i've got it written down i'm gonna I, I think i think he's french i'm pretty sure i'll trust you on that I, i've got a couple pages back in my notes but the yeah. point is you've got like this weird like just weird combination of a bunch of different regions. Everyone's used to a different kind of play style. Yeah. They had a good first game in Latam and not so good second game, but like, that's hard. Combining everyone who's kind of used to different play styles, you get someone like like Noodle into the mix who's jumping all over oh, the place yeah. regions wise. Like, that is not easy to uh, do. Well, that's why teams in Brazil are so strong right now for the last year is just because they've been able to adapt a style of Siege where it's very aggressive. Everybody's moving together at the exact same time in the same focus, and it's very fast. And it's, so good, it's, against, it's good against everyone. Exactly, like, because yeah. as soon as you see something that stands out, everyone goes, all right, this is what we're doing. This is what we're hitting. Yeah. It's very proactive, and that's what adapting is, and I don't think that's made it to every other region just yet. Speaking yeah. of internationals, what's the international matchup in 2024 you're excited for? I mean, if I had to pick, uh, the things I'm seeing from new BDS, the crossover of France mm. and the UK right now seems really exciting. Um, not to say that I want to see them play Furia, just because, I mean, any game uh, that includes the current world champs is, is just kind of going to have that flair. But if that were to come up in like an elimination context at like yeah. the next major. Like if that was if that was like a lower bracket, loser goes to goes home, winner goes to grand final type of stake. So it's not win and you win the whole tournament stake, but lose and you're gone type thing. That would be really intriguing to me, I think. You you're right by the way, draw is French. So the draw is French, yeah, there we go. Sweet. I think that's a great matchup. I think BDS is obviously a team to keep an eye on since the recent changes. Furia. A uh, team I'm excited to actually watch is PSG Town since they've gotten Fabian. Are they? They're undefeated right now. Yeah, they, they're they're three and zero. Seven zero, seven one, seven one. I believe was since getting Fabian as a coach. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, yeah. It's a scary guy to have behind your team going like. Is that all it took? It well, was it just getting <laughs> guys? Come on, it's easy. All it took for you to win in Korea was just getting a world championship winning <laughs> player as your coach, and then you start. It's easy, guys. So someone, someone go find Goga and have him coach in there. Is, is that just how easy it is? It might be. It might be that simple. I mean, clearly it's working for them. Yeah. Yeah. So far. Favorite match of all time? Ooh, jeez, we're just getting the hard-hitting questions. Coming. I mean, I mean, hey, first, first time we're doing this, so I guess, I guess it makes sense. That's an easy one for me. What is it? I would definitely have to say Reciprocity versus Evil Geniuses. Uh, SI 2019. SI 2019. Ah, uh, because you beat them for top four, yeah. Because mm -hmm. we beat them, yeah. That was like the pivotal moment where like EG was being like dethroned as like the NA team that just always does the best in NA by my team, which was like, we were like really sh fighting to become like a, you know, like a top two team. Yeah. And that was a changing moment. It didn't matter. We played G2 and we got absolutely, we got the brakes beat off us, but <laughs> it was a great time to be able to beat uh, EG. And then also funny enough, uh, I'm pretty sure a player on my, on my team at the time only got six kills in Ooh. three maps and we still beat them. So that's pretty crazy. Not to name names. We go, I mean, it's, it's old history, so it doesn't matter, but it's like, you know. It was Mark. It was Mark the Shark. <laughs> were yeah, there, you said it not were me. Were there any it's okay. Penta Continuum or Penta EG clashes back, like way back in the pre-G2 oh boy. days? I, I think to, that I, was when I was like Canadian, Pengu, NVK, yeah. Kanto, Goga, give it to me. No, no, <laughs> there, there, there should have been at least EG Penta SI 2018, the one I analysted for, their finals where EG was up, I think, two maps to one and they were the white stairs canadian white stairs yeah canadian white stairs canadian white stairs canadian white stairs was milan finals empire versus eg yeah no, 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 that was empire yeah that was empire wasn't that was empire oops well <laughs> si, <laughs> yeah, si 2018 we was definitely Which, where eg was up i think two maps to one and then penta ended up doing like a reverse sweep and then winning three maps to two yeah I okay believe. that makes sense yeah what player do you think is in his prime mm, who is really really good right now is fox in his prime right now 
Is this your prime? <laughs> I think so. You know, they usually say athletes hit their prime when they get to like, closer to the 30s. So I'm only 24. You're Dude, there. you're younger than me by like a few months. Like, don't make me feel old by talking well, about saying, how close you, to 30 you, to you old, are. I'm not, I wasn't saying for myself. I'm saying some <sighs> athletes, you know, feel like they're in their prime once they hit their, their early 30s. And I'm just saying, I haven't hit there yet. Well, I guess like, I don't know, is early 30s, I know this doesn't answer the question, but you know how esports time and real time aren't like the same sort of delineation, right? Like, athlete time is already really tight, but then eSports e like way that more. That is yeah. even stronger. Because yeah. we, you got guys in eSports retiring at 25. That's great. In yeah. some cases. I mean, you did, you did it before then, right? Yep. So Wait, so like, are, are you I'm hinting 24. at you coming back when you're 30? Or are you saying that you hit your maturity timeline in eSports like a year ago and that was like your peak? No, I, I was just I was just trying to be funny and say that my like I haven't hit my prime yet. You know, the human, <laughs> the human brain doesn't develop until you're 25 fully. True. Back. So... That being said, who's in their prime? In their I'm gonna prime? go with I'm gonna go with uh, honestly Gomez from Oxygen. I know it Ooh, sounds pretty good. biased, but I feel like he's definitely hitting full strides. A cold take, that's fully really true. <laughs> Most improved player of this of the last year, so I think he's in his prime right now. Favorite jersey of 2024? Mm. I haven't seen all of them yet. Would it just well, be, I would mean, it just be funny if I just said the OXG jersey. I mean, I mean hang on, that. what do we what do we got? We got some. We don't have an M80 jersey, but we have an M80 shirt. But like, the the new wild card one is cool. The space station one is like classic for the most part. Yeah, like cla that like that kind of design hasn't really changed very much. Yeah. I feel like that's even we got more the dude than usual. Oh yeah, the DZ one has like pleated sleeves. Like it's got like ridges on it or it something. Like give it a rest. Give what a rest. Give it a rest. You don't like the sleeves, or you do like the sleeves? You don't, what? You, you don't like fashion? I want to see. I want to see more out of Dark Zero. I feel like they have such a cool logo, such a cool colorway, but it always seems a little too similar for what they could do. Like they got that galaxy thing going on. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, they rocked that. Like, remember the jerseys they won Charlotte in was like like what the, nope. like, like the starry pattern or something on the front of it. You remember that? Like, I got nothing for you. I think stars. I think space station. I mean, I, I think stars. I think Astralis, but that's a totally different reason. True. I will like, say, I will say, Wildcard definitely huge, huge improvement on the jersey. Yeah, no, they still have I their think, game. I up. think their newest one is pretty, I mean, pretty far. Look, you want to <laughs> talk about overall jersey improvements? Remember what the old OXG ones looked like way back when? I can't, uh, can't talk about that. <laughs> so on the You've signed an NDA. <laughs> can't talk about that one. Oh, Love the man. OXG jerseys. Look, look nice. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Favorite player personality. Ah. It's hard not to like instantly think Ashen, but to be fair, that makes the most sense because we speak English. If there was um, right, English speaking favorite player. Let's it, well, yeah, that. yeah, but like, uh, I, man, I still can't get over how beloved that old Norarengo team was, and how everybody was all that level of exuberant all the time. Even if they lost, they're just like, yeah, you know what, no big deal, and then they would like do the hand motion thing. That, oh, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, that like that that brings back a very a very before time memory, I think, for me. I just I I, I loved how, how that Nora Rengo team just had just oozed charisma all the time. Give me Ambi top of that list as well. I mean, come on. You're gonna guys. dude, you're gonna put Am wait, are you putting Ambi like next to Nora Rengo? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just saying in, in this conversation of top yeah, personalities okay. right now, Ambi's electric. I mean the interview, uh every time he pops up on the screen, he's got something hilarious to say. Uh I would go with Doki. Like I feel like Doki just has a really Doki's always been good personality. Yeah. But if I'm just sticking to NA, I mean, there's so many good ones. Ashen's really good. Ambi's really good. Newers. Wow. That's, That's a hard good. question. Newers is really good. I was trying to stay away from OXG because I've just been saying, been a dude, dude, with saying talk about like anything I've been a little else, bit of man. bias. So yeah. I was really trying to think. Uh, I really, I mean, I know the players more personally. I really feel like players like Fultz and Jr. Dr Dream have really good personalities, mm -hmm. uh, and I would love it if they get more opportunities to showcase that personality. Because I know them behind closed doors. I know they're very great guys. Yeah. yeah. So I would probably say one of those guys. There's also a bunch of players who, if you ever get the chance to talk to them in person, very different from what their personas are on stream or on Twitter. But usually, for the most part, pretty good people. If you oh, have a to Kino. 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 Who? I love uh, Kino. Who? Kino. This guy. Oh, I'm kidding. You know you're a host for the NAL, right? Who's that? No, I was told to turn off. Oh, never mind. Who deserves next elites kit? Well, I mean, whoever doesn't currently have one, I mean, because the Nook one is coming out. Uh, it's like, at, at this point, every elite skin is the second elite skin for most people. So it's like, yeah. who do we have left? Do like, do ba ba ooh, I 
love grid and don't have a good gridlock skin, I would love a gridlock elite. Yubi, if you're watching, 100% a grid skin, you will make me very happy. You haven't won. I mean, That's pretty good. Please. That's a pretty good one. Is there? I think gridlock's a really good one. It's like Moz has already no. got one, but it's, it's, literally at some point, it will get to a, a stage where we just don't have any elites left to give to operators. Yeah. And it's like, oh, hey, the new op came out. Also, the elite skin is available same day as soon as it comes out. Like Some of the elite skins that, I mean, I don't think there's any non-elite skin that I'm like, give me that. But like, there are some that like, oh, you can tweak it up. Maybe, maybe spruce it up sure, a little yeah. bit, you know, May maybe like base it around like a certain piece of, like a certain headgear they already have that you already love, you know? Like, yeah, that'd be like, cool. Like Pulse, when he has like the complete bandana across his eyes, that's yeah. sick. You could yeah. that one is pretty really cool. kind of form the skin around that model, that idea. I don't know, Castle with his football helmet, make him a football player. I, I also want like, I mean, cause we've gotten like Resident Evil and Street Fighter and uh, Halo. Halo. Um, but we need a Dune. Rick and Morty. Sand Rick and Morty, skin. yeah. Give, give me a Dune skin. Oh, just a worm. Ooh. <laughs> just a just worm. A worm. No, no, no. Make the drone a worm. Okay. I mean, they uh, already, that'd be dope. They already make, make the boogie drone a worm. Yeah. They already made Thermite into the bug from Rick and Morty, which, by the way, like, <laughs> player, players love running that skin in, in scrims. It's absolutely ridiculous. Do they? Well, no. Is that is that real? Like, people yeah. actually really love playing that? Yeah, yeah. The Dream, Dream runs it all the time. <laughs> that, guy perma that guy permanently runs the bug skin. Uh, the one I will say before we get out of here. If we ever do some sort of Star Wars crossover, Deimos would make a pretty excellent Mandalorian. I'm just saying. I agree. Whole mask if that ever ready. came up. And on that note, make sure you guys check out the Elites. <laughs> buy all the Elites from the Ubisoft yes, store itself. do it. Please uh, do. You know, buy them all. Buy the Pro League skins, too. Mm-hmm. Yep. Which, do all that. No, but no, seriously, it, it, it supports all the teams out there. Like, that is a huge part of why they invest in this esports. The pro teams, to be clear, the, not the, the elite. The pro teams, but yeah. The not the elite teams. skins, but the pro teams. You buy the pro team skins, keeps this esport alive. Yeah. So, Just spend money on us. Let's do give it. Give us money, please. We'll Let's do it. Some. My DMs Steam are money. open. <laughs> please. Sounds fantastic. Anyway, that your was... Venmo is. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, can't quite go to that length. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for day three of the NAL. We will come back with post shows after every day of broadcast. So that does it all for us here in Philadelphia. We will be back tomorrow, same time, same place, exact same structure. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you for day four tomorrow.